Star Wars Survivor's Quest by Timothy Zahn Chapter 1 The Imperial Star Destroyer moved silently through the blackness of space, its lights dimmed, its huge sublight engines blazing with the urgency of its mission. The man standing on the command walkway could feel the rumble of those engines through his boots as he listened to the muttered conversation from the crew pits below him. The conversation sounded worried, too, as worried as he himself felt. Though for entirely different reasons. For him, this was a personal matter, the frustration of a professional dealing with fallible beings and the capriciousness of a universe that refused to always live up to one's preconceived notions as to what was fitting and proper. An error had been made, possibly a very serious error. And as with all errors, there would likely be unpleasant consequences riding in its wake. From the starboard crew pit came a muffled curse, and he stifled a grimace. None of that mattered to the Star Destroyer's crew. Their worries stemmed solely from their performance, and whether they would be facing a pat on the back or a boot in the rear at journey's end. Or possibly they were merely worried about the sublight engines blowing up. On this ship, one never knew. He shifted his attention downward, his gaze leaving the grandeur of the star's cape and coming to rest on the bow of the star destroyer stretching out more than a kilometer in front of him. He could remember the days when the mere sight of one of these ships would send shivers up the spines of the bravest of fighters and the most arrogant of smugglers. But those days were gone, hopefully forever. The Empire had been rehabilitated, though of course many within the New Republic still refused to believe that. Under Supreme Commander Pelian's firm guidance, the Empire had signed a treaty with the New Republic, and was no longer any more threatening than the Bahans or the corporate sector or anyone else. Almost unwillingly, he smiled as he gazed along the Star Destroyer's long prow. Of course, even in the old days of the Empire, this particular ship would probably have inspired more bewilderment than fear. It was, after all, hard to take a bright red star destroyer very seriously. From behind him, audible even over the rumble of the engines, came the sound of clumping boots. Okay, cart, Booster Turk grunted as he came to a halt at his side. The comms finally fixed. You can transmit whenever you want. Thank you, Talon Card said, turning back toward the crew pits and trying hard not to blame Booster for the state his equipment was in. An Imperial Star Destroyer was a huge amount of ship to take care of, and Booster never had nearly enough personnel to do the job right. Sishi? He called. Go. Yes, Chieftain, the Tagorian called back from the comm board, her fur fluffing slightly as her clawed fingers touched the keys. Transmission complete. Shall I begin alerting the rest of the network now? Yes. Card said. Thank you. Sishi nodded and returned her attention to the board. With that, Card knew he'd done all he could for the moment. Turning again to face the stars, he folded his arms across his chest and tried hard to cultivate his patience. It'll be all right, Booster murmured from beside him. We'll be around this star in half an hour and be able to jump to light speed. We can be in the Dombrin system in two standard days, tops. Assuming the hyperdrive doesn't break down again. Card waved a hand. Sorry. I'm just, you understand. Sure, Booster said. But relax, all right? This is Luke and Mara we're talking about, not some fresh-hatched Nymoidian grubs. Whatever's going on. They're not going to be caught flat-footed. Maybe, Card said. Though even Jedi can be surprised. He shook his head. But that's not the point, is it? The point is that I messed up. I don't like it when that happens. Booster shrugged his massive shoulders. Like any of the rest of us do? He asked pointedly. You have to face the facts, Card 
And fact number one is that you simply can't know everyone who works for you anymore. Card glared out at the mockingly cheerful red ship stretched out in front of him. But Booster was right. This whole thing had gotten completely out of hand. He'd started out modestly enough, merely offering to provide timely information to the leaders of the new republic and empire so that both sides could be assured that the other wasn't plotting against them. And for the first couple of years everything had gone just fine. The trouble had come when the various planetary and sector governments within the New Republic had woken up to the benefits of this handy service and decided they wanted a board, too. After the near-civil war that had broken out over the commas document, Card hadn't really felt like turning them down, and with permission from his clients on Coruscant and Bastion he'd gone ahead and expanded his operations. Which naturally meant expanding his personnel as well. In retrospect, he supposed, it had only been a matter of time before something like this happened. He just wished it hadn't happened to Luke and Mara. Maybe not, he told Booster. But even if I can't handle everything personally, it's still my responsibility. Ah, Booster said knowingly. So it's your pride that's hurt, is it? Card eyed his old friend. Tell me, Booster. Has anyone ever told you you're truly irritating when you try to be sympathetic? Yeah, the subjects come up once or twice, Booster said, grinning. He slapped cards back. Come on. Let's go down to the Transis Corridor and I'll buy you a drink. Assuming the drink dispensers are working today, Card murmured as they headed back along the command walkway. Well, yeah. Booster conceded. Always assuming that. A.S. Cantinas went. Mara Jade Skywalker thought A.S. she sipped her drink. This was definitely one of the strangest she'd ever been in. Part of that might simply have been due to the locale. Here in the Outer Rim, culture and style weren't exactly up to the standards of Coruscant and the rest of the Core Worlds. That might explain the gaudy wall hangings juxtaposed with ancient plumbing woven around modern drink dispensers, all of it set against a background decor consisting mainly of polished droid parts dating back to before the Clone Wars. As for the unbreakable mugs and the heavy, stone-topped tables she was seated at, the smoothed-over blaster scars in the walls and ceiling were more than enough explanation. When the patrons dived under the tables in the middle of a firefight, they would want those tables to afford them some protection. And they wouldn't want to find themselves sitting on bits of broken crockery either. There was no rationale at all, of course, for the very loud, very off-key music. A brush of air touched her shoulder, and a heavy-set man appeared from behind her, pushing his way through the milling crowd. Sorry, he huffed as he circled the table and landed his bulk back in the seat across from her. Business, business, business. Never lets up for a minute. I suppose not, Mara agreed. He didn't fool her for a second. Even without force sensitivity, she would have spotted the furtiveness hidden behind the noise and bustle. Jerf Huxley, master smuggler and minor terror of the Outer Rim, was up to something unpleasant. The only question was how unpleasant he was planning for that something to be. Yeah, it's crazy out here, Huxley went on, taking a noisy swallow of the drink he'd left behind when he hurried off on the mysterious errand that had taken him away from their table. Course, you know all that. Or at least you used to. He eyed her over the rim of his mug. What's so funny? Oh, nothing, Mara said, not bothering to erase the smile that had caught the other's attention. I was just thinking about what a trusting person you are. What do you mean? He asked, frowning. Your drink, Mara said, gesturing to his mug. You go away and leave it alone with me, and then you just come back and toss it down without even wondering if I've put something in it. Huxley's lips puckered, and through the force Mara caught a hint of his chagrin. He hadn't worried about his drink, of course because he'd had her under close surveillance the whole time he was gone. 
He also hadn't intended for her to know that. All right, fine, he said, banging the mug back onto the table. Enough with the games. Let's hear it. Why are you here? With a man like this, Mara knew there was no point in glaze coating it. I'm here on behalf of Talon Card, she said. He wanted me to thank you for your assistance and that of your organization over the past ten years, and to inform you that your services will no longer be required. Huxley's face didn't even twitch. Clearly, he'd already suspected this was coming. Starting when? He asked. Starting now, Mara said. Thanks for the drink, and I'll be on my way. Not so fast, Huxley said, lifting a hand. Mara froze halfway to her feet. Behind Huxley, blasters had abruptly appeared in the hands of three of the men who had hitherto been minding their own business at the bar. Blasters that were, not surprisingly, pointed at her. Sit down, he ordered. Carefully, Mara eased back into her chair. Was there something else? She asked mildly. Huxley gestured again, more emphatically this time, and the off-key background music shut off. As did all conversation. So that's it, is it? Huxley demanded quietly. In the sudden silence, even a soft voice seemed to ring against the battered walls. Card's going to toss us aside, just like that. I presume you read the news, Mara said, keeping her voice calm. All around her, she could sense the single-minded animosity of the crowd. Huxley had apparently stopped the place with his friends and associates. Cards getting out of the smuggling business has been for the past three years. He doesn't need your services anymore. Yeah, he doesn't need, Huxley said with a sniff. What about what we need? I don't know, Mara said. What do you need? Maybe you don't remember what it's like in the outer rim, Jade, Huxley said, leaning over the table toward her. But out here, you don't split things three ways against the ends. You work for one group, period, or you don't work at all. We burned our scarches behind us years ago when we started working for Card. If he pulls out, what are we supposed to do? I expect you'll have to make new arrangements, Mara said. Look, you had to have known this was coming. Card's made no secret of the direction he's been taking. Yeah, right, Huxley said contemptuously. Like anyone believed he'd really go straight. He drew himself up. So you want to know what we need? Fine. What we need is something to tide us over until we can get back in the business with someone else. So there it was, a simple and straightforward pocket shake. Nothing subtle from this bunch. How much? She asked. Five hundred thousand. His lip twisted slightly. In cash credits. Mara kept her face expressionless. She'd come here prepared for something like this, but that number was way beyond reason. And where exactly do you expect me to get this little tide me over? She asked. I don't carry that much spending money on me. Don't get cute, Huxley growled. You know as well as I do that card's got a sector clearing house over on Gonmore. They'll have all the credits there we need. He dug into a pocket and produced a holdout blaster. You're going to call and tell them to bring it to us, he said, leveling the weapon at her face across the table. Half a million. Now. Really. Casually, keeping her hands visible, Mara turned her head to look behind her. Most of the cantina's non-smuggler patrons had already made a quiet exit, she noted, or else had gathered into groups on either side of the confrontation, staying well out of the potential lines of fire. 
Of more immediate concern was the group of about twenty humans and aliens who had spread themselves out in a semicircle directly behind her, all of them with weapons trained on her back. All of them also showing varying degrees of wariness, she noted with a certain malicious amusement. Her reputation had apparently preceded her. You throw an interesting party, Huxley, she said, turning back to face the smuggler chief. But you don't really think you're equipped to deal with a Jedi, do you? Huxley smiled. A very evil smile. A surprisingly evil smile, actually, given the circumstances. Matter of fact, yeah, I do. He raised his voice. Bats? There was a brief pause. Mara reached out with the force, but all she could sense was a sudden heightened anticipation from the crowd. Then, from across the room ahead and to her right came the creak of machinery. A section of floor in a poorly lit area at the far end of the bar began to rise ponderously toward the ceiling, revealing an open-sided keg lift coming up from the storage cellar below. As it rose, something metallic came into view, its shine muted by the patina of age. Mara frowned, trying to pierce the gloom. The thing was tall and slender, with a pair of arms jutting out from the sides that gave it a not-quite-humanoid silhouette for all its obvious mechanical origins. The design looked vaguely familiar, but for those first few seconds she couldn't place it. The lift continued to rise, revealing hip-bone-like protrusions at the base of the object's long torso and a trio of curved legs extending outward beneath them. And then, suddenly, it clicked. The thing was a pre-Clone Wars droidica, one of the destroyer droids that had once been the pride of the Trade Federation Army. She looked back at Huxley, to find that his smile had widened into a grin. That's right, Jade, he gloated. My very own combat droidica, guaranteed to blast the stuffing out of even a Jedi. Bet you never expected to see one of those here. Not really, no. Mara conceded, running a practiced eye over the droidica as the lift reached the top and wheezed to a halt. It had arrived fully open in combat stance, she noted, instead of rolled into the more compact wheel form used to move into position. That could mean it wasn't able to maneuver anymore. Did that mean its guns wouldn't track either? Experimentally, she leaned back in her seat. For a moment nothing happened. Then the droidica's left arm twitched, its twin blasters shifting angle to match her movement. So the weapons could indeed track, though they appeared to be under someone's manual control instead of a central computer's or anything on board the droidica itself. In the dim lighting, she couldn't tell whether or not its built-in deflector shield was functioning, but it almost didn't matter. The thing was armed, armored, and pointed straight at her. Huxley was right. Even the Jedi of that era had gone out of their way to avoid fighting these things. But of course I should have, she continued, turning to face Huxley again. This place is littered with old droid parts. Stands to reason someone would have scraped together enough pieces to make a reasonable copy of a droidica to scare people with. Huxley's eyes hardened. You try something cute and you'll see how good a copy it is. He looked over at the group of casual observers to his right, and his eyes locked on someone in the crowd. You sinker! A kid maybe sixteen years old stepped out from a knot of older men. Yes, sir? Huxley gestured toward Mara. Get her lightsaber. The kid goggled at Mara. Get a... You deaf? Huxley bit out. What are you afraid of? Sinker made as if to speak, looked furtively at Mara, swallowed visibly, then stepped hesitantly forward. Mara kept her face expressionless as she watched him approach, his nervousness increasing with each step, until he was visibly shaking as he stopped beside her. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, ma'am, but... Just take it. Huxley bellowed. 
In a single desperate motion Sinker ducked down, unhooked her lightsaber from her belt, and scampered backward with it. There, Huxley said sarcastically. That wasn't so hard now, was it? Wasn't so useful either, Mara said. You think that's all it takes to stop a Jedi? Taking her lightsaber? It's a start, Huxley said. Mara shook her head. It's not even that. Looking over at Sinker, she reached out with the force. Abruptly, the lightsaber ignited in his hand. Sinker's startled squeak was mostly lost in the snap hiss as the brilliant blue blade blazed into existence. Rather to her surprise, he didn't drop the weapon and run, but held gamely onto it. Sinker, what the frost are you doing? Huxley snapped. That's not a toy. I'm not doing it, Sinker protested, his voice running about an octave higher than it had been before. He's right, Mara confirmed as Huxley drew in another bellows worth of air. He's not doing this, either. She reached out to the lightsaber again, making it weave back and forth in Sinker's grip. The kid wove back and forth with it, hanging on with the grim air of someone who's found himself astride an angry acclay with no idea how to get off. The rest of the crowd was probably feeling much the same way. For those first few seconds there had been a mad scramble by everyone near Sinker to get out of range of the weapon bobbing in his hands like a drunken crewer. They had mostly stopped moving now, though a few of the smarter ones had decided it was time to get out entirely and were making tracks for the exits. The rest were watching Sinker warily, ready to move again if necessary. Knock it off, Jade, Huxley snarled. He wasn't smiling anymore. You hear me? Knock it off. And what do you plan to do if I don't? Mara countered, continuing to swing the lightsaber even as she kept an eye on Huxley's blaster. The others wouldn't shoot her without orders or an immediate threat, she knew, but Huxley himself might forget what his goals and priorities were here. It was a risk worth taking. With every eye in the cantina on Sinker and his disobedient lightsaber, no one was paying the slightest attention to the droidica standing stolid guard across the room. Not the droidica, and certainly not the barely visible tip of brilliant green light stealthily slicing a circle through the lift floor around its curved tripod feet. I'll blast you into a million soggy pieces, that's what I'll do, Huxley shot back. Now let him go, or I'll... He never finished the threat. Across the room, with a sudden creaking of stressed metal, the lift floor collapsed dropping the droidica with a crash back into the cellar. Huxley spun around, screeching something vicious. The screech died in mid-curse. From the direction the droidica had disappeared, a black-clad figure now appeared, leaping up from the cellar to land on the edge of the newly carved hole. He lifted the short cylinder in his hand to salute position, and with another snap hiss, a green lightsaber blade blazed. Huxley reacted instantly, and in exactly the way Mara would have expected. Get him! He shouted, stabbing a finger back toward the newcomer. He didn't have to give the order twice. From the semicircle of gunners behind Mara erupted a blistering staccato of blaster fire. And you! Huxley added over the noise. He lifted his blaster toward Mara, his finger tightening on the firing stud. Mara was already in motion. Rising halfway out of her chair, she grabbed the edge of the stone-top table and heaved it upward. A fraction of a second later Huxley's shot ricocheted off the tabletop now angled toward him, passing harmlessly over Mara's head to gouge yet another hole in the ceiling behind her. Mara heaved the table a little higher, and Huxley's eyes abruptly widened as he realized she intended to drop its full weight squarely into his lap pinning him helplessly into his chair and then crushing him to the floor. He was wrong. Even as he scrambled madly to get out of his chair and away from the falling table before it was too late, Mara kicked her own chair back out of her way. 
Using her grip on the table edge as a pivot point, she lifted her feet and swung herself forward and downward. With a lighter table, the trick wouldn't have worked, and she would have simply landed on her rear in front of her chair with the table in her lap. But this one was so massive, with so much inertia, that she was able to swing under the edge now falling backward toward her, land on the floor beneath where it had been standing, and get her hands clear before the edge crashed into the floor behind her. This put the heavy tabletop neatly between her and the twenty-odd blasters that had been trained on her back. Huxley, still completely off stride, had time for a single yelp before Mara lung forward, slapped his gun hand aside with her left hand, and then grabbed a fistful of his shirt and hauled him down into cover with her. Her right hand snaked up her left sleeve, snatched her small sleeve gun from its arm holster, and jammed the muzzle up under his chin. You know the drill, she said. Let's hear it. Huxley, his eyes on the edge of terror, filled his lungs. Huxlings! Cease fire. Cease fire. Then, around the room, the blasters fell quiet. Very good, Mara said. What's part two? Huxley's lip twisted. Drop your weapons, he growled, opening his hand and letting his own blaster fall to the floor. You hear me? Drop him. There was another brief pause, then a dull clatter as the others followed suit. Mara stretched out with the force, but she could sense no duplicity. Huxley had caved completely, and his gang knew better than to try to second-guess his decisions. Keeping her blaster pressed under his chin, she got to her feet, hauling Huxley up with her. She gave each of the half-sullen, half-terrified gang members a quick look, just to make it clear what rash heroics would cost, then turned to the man in black as he walked up to her. So didn't you see that droidica before Huxley lifted it up here? She asked. Oh, I saw it. Luke Skywalker acknowledged, closing down his lightsaber but keeping it ready in his hand. And? Luke shrugged. I was curious to see whether it still worked. Did it? We didn't get a complete field test, Mara said. It didn't look very mobile and I'd guess its tracking is on manual instead of automatic. But it probably fires just fine. Fired, Luke corrected. It's going to need a little reworking. That's okay, Mara assured him, sliding her sleeve gun back into its concealed holster. Huxley's people will have some time on their hands. She gave Huxley a push away from her, letting go of his shirt. He staggered slightly but managed to maintain his balance. Here's the deal. Before I leave, I'll credit 20000 to your account. Not because Card owes you anything at all, but simply as a thanks for your years of service to his organization. Card's a little soft-hearted that way, Luke added. Yes, he is, Mara agreed. I, on the other hand, am not. You'll take it, you'll be happy with it, and you will never even think about making trouble for any of us again. Clear? Huxley had the look of a man chewing droid parts, but he nodded. Clear, he muttered. Good. Mara turned to Sinker and held out her hand. My lightsaber, please. Bracing himself, Sinker walked toward her, the lightsaber still humming in his grasp. He offered it to her at arm's length. Taking it, she closed down the blade and hung it back on her belt. Thank you, she said. Across the room, the door slid open, and a young man darted in. He got two steps before everything seemed to register, and he faltered to a confused halt. Uh, Chief? He called, looking at Huxley. This better be important, Fisk. 
Huxley warned. Ah, uh, Fisk looked around uncertainly. It's, I just got a signal in for someone named Mara. It was from. It was from Talon Card. Luke cut in. He wants Mara to contact him aboard the Aaron Venture as soon as possible at. He narrowed his eyes as he gazed across the room at the boy. In the Dombrin system. Fisk's mouth was hanging slightly open. Ah, uh, yeah? He breathed. That's right. Yes, Luke said, almost offhandedly. Oh, and it came in under the Passpro 5 encrypt. That's the one that starts out as Herfenth. Well, you know the rest. The kid's jaw was hanging even lower now. Blinking once, he nodded. We'd better get going then, Mara said. She started to step around the table, then paused. Oh, and by the way, she added, looking back at Huxley. It's not Jade anymore. It's Jade Skywalker. This is my husband, Luke Skywalker. The Jedi Master. He's even better at this stuff than I am. Yeah, Huxley muttered, eyeing Luke. Yeah, I got the message. Good, Mara said. Goodbye, Huxley. She and Luke headed toward the door through a wide path that magically opened up for them through the crowd. A moment later, they were out in the cool evening air. Very impressive, she commented as they headed down the street toward the spaceport and the waiting Jade Saber. When did you start being able to pull details like that out of other people's minds? It's easy enough when you know how, Luke said with a straight face. Uh huh. Mara said. Let me guess. Card sent you the same message? Luke nodded. I got it in relay from the ship while I was poking around the storage cellar. That's what I thought, Mara said. And so when the opportunity presented itself, you couldn't resist playing the omniscient Jedi trick. Luke shrugged. It never hurts for these fringe types to have a little healthy fear of Jedi. I suppose not, Mara agreed hesitantly. Luke looked sideways at her. You don't agree? I don't know, she said. Something about it bothers me. Maybe because Palpatine always ruled through fear. I see your point, Luke admitted. But this isn't quite the same. It's more like putting the fear of justice into them. And of course, I would never pull anything like this with regular people. I know, Mara said. And it should help keep Huxley in line. I suppose that's what counts. She waved an impatient hand. Never mind. I'm just feeling the weight of my past, I guess. So what exactly was this message from Card? Basically just what I said in there, Luke told her. We're to meet him and boost her at Dom Grin as quickly as we can get there. And he sent it to the Saber and Huxley's people both? Apparently so, Luke shook his head. He must really be anxious to talk to us if he's doubling up messages this way. I was just thinking that, Mara said. And that's not like him. Unless. She added thoughtfully, there's some crisis brewing. Isn't there always? Luke asked dryly. Come on, let's get these funds of yours transferred and get out of here. Chapter 2 The bright red star destroyer was waiting silently eye in the distance as Luke brought the jade saber out of hyperspace. There it is, he said, nodding at the curved forward canopy. What do you think? I'm picking up some mining and transport ships in the area, Mara said, peering at the long-range scanner. We'd better get a little closer if we don't want eavesdroppers. You want to take us in, or shall I? I'll do it, Mara said. Taking a quick look at the monitors, she got a grip on the control stick and pushed it forward. Luke leaned back in his seat, 
hunching his shoulders once to stretch tired muscles, and watched his wife work. Wife. For a moment he listened to the word as it bounced around his brain, marveling at the sound of it. Even after nearly three years of marriage there was something that felt strange and awesome about the whole concept. Of course, it had hardly been three years the way normal couples counted time. Even Han and Leia, who dealt with crisis after crisis early in their marriage, had at least been fighting those battles at each other's side. In Luke and Mara's case, his responsibilities at the Jedi Academy and her need to disengage herself in an orderly fashion from the intricate workings of Talon Card's organization had kept them apart almost as much as they'd been before their wedding. Their moments together had been few and precious, and they'd had only a handful of the longer periods of togetherness that Han had once privately referred to as the breaking-in period. That was in fact one of the reasons Luke had suggested he accompany Mara on this particular trip. She would still be working, of course, meeting with groups of Card's current and former associates. But between meetings he'd hoped they would be able to spend some decent stretches of time together. It had actually worked pretty well. Up until now. I trust you've already noticed how strange this is, Mara said into his musings. Even if we push the saber for all she's worth, we're at least a week away from Coruscant. Whatever this new crisis is, we're too far away to be of any use to anyone. Especially since I made it clear to Leia at the start that we weren't supposed to be disturbed unless it was a flat-out invasion, Luke agreed. Of course, if this isn't Leia, it only leaves one possibility. Two, actually, Mara corrected. And I'd certainly hope Card knows better by now than to flag us for anything trivial. Leia and Card make two, Luke said. Who's this third option? She threw him a sideways look. We're meeting Card aboard the Errant Venture, remember? Luke made a face. Booster. Right, Mara said. And Booster might not know better. If he doesn't, shall we make a pact right now to make sure he does before we leave this system? Deal. She threw him a slightly evil smile and returned to her piloting. Luke turned back to the canopy, smiling out at the stars. Despite all the time they'd spent apart, he and Mara had a distinct advantage. They were both Jedi. And because of that, they shared a mental and emotional bond that was far deeper than most couples were able to forge in an entire lifetime together. Deeper and stronger even than anything Luke had experienced in his doomed relationships with Gary O'Captison or the long-departed Callista. He still remembered vividly the moment that Bond had first appeared, hammered into existence as the two of them fought those combat droids deep under the fortress their old adversary Grand Admiral Thrawn had set up on the planet Nerwin. At the time Luke had thought it was nothing more than a temporary melding of their minds created by the heat and pressure of a life and death situation. It was only afterward, when the battle was over but the bond remained, that he'd realized it had become a permanent part of their lives. Even then, he hadn't completely understood it. He'd assumed that it had sprung forth complete, that in those few hours it had brought the two of them into as deep an understanding of each other as it was possible to have. But in the three years since then, he'd come to realize that he had just barely scratched the surface. Mara was far more complex a human being than he'd ever suspected. As, in fact, he himself was. Which meant that, Jedi or not, Force Bond or not, there was going to be more for them to learn about each other for a long time to come. In all likelihood, a lifetime's worth of time. He was very much looking forward to the journey. And yet, at the same time, he couldn't help but feel a small twinge of uncertainty. His marriage to Mara felt right to him, in every respect, but hovering in the background behind all their happiness and success was the distant echo of Yoda's stories of the old Jedi Order during Luke's training on Dagobah. 
specifically the part about Jedi keeping themselves out of precisely this kind of love relationship. He hadn't given those teachings much weight at the time. The Empire was in control of the known galaxy. Darth Vader was breathing down the Rebel Alliance's collective neck, and all his thoughts were focused on his own survival and the survival of his friends. When Han and Leia had gotten married, Leia having four skills hadn't seemed like a big deal. She was certainly strong in the Force, but she hadn't progressed nearly far enough in her training to call herself a Jedi. But it was different with Luke. He had been a Jedi when he'd asked Mara to marry him. True, their chances of survival at the time had been somewhat uncertain, but that hadn't affected the sincerity of his proposal or the depth of his feelings toward her. And despite these occasional twinges, he'd certainly found peace in his decision and in their subsequent marriage. Could Yoda have been wrong about how Jedi relationships were supposed to work? That was the easiest answer. But that would mean the entire Jedi Order had been wrong about it. That didn't seem likely, unless on some level all of them had lost the ability to hear the Force clearly. Could that particular dictum have ended with the fall of that particular group, then? Yoda had also said something about the Force having been brought back into balance, though he'd been somewhat vague about the details. Could this have rendered that part of the Jedi Code no longer applicable? He didn't have the answers. He wondered if he ever would. Okay, they're on us, Mara announced, leaning back in her seat. Got an antenna swiveling for a tight beam. I've been wondering how far away a Star Destroyer's sensors could pick us up. Luke forced his thoughts back to the situation at hand. Though with the errant venture you always have to allow for malfunctions, he reminded her. True, she agreed. Sometimes I think of that ship as one massive red warning light. It's certainly bright enough. Luke shook his head. I am never, ever, going to get used to that color. I kind of like it, Mara said. Especially given where it came from. You mean Booster strong-arming General Bell Iblis to refit and repaint? I was thinking of the paint itself, Mara said. Did you know the New Republic bought all of it from Card? Luke blinked. You're kidding. Did Belliblis know? Don't be silly, Mara said with a lopsided smile. You know Belliblis. He'd have had a fit on general principles if he'd known Card had made any money on this deal. No, Card played it all very cool and threw at least three intermediaries and a dummy corporation. I don't think even Booster knows. Trust me, he doesn't. Luke said. Corin once told me that one of Booster's great joys in life these days is telling people how he managed this whole thing without any help or interference from the great Talon card. I wonder what he'd say if he knew that was card's paint on his hull. I know what card would say, Mara warned. Both before and after he nailed my hide to the hull. One of his great joys is watching Booster strut around blissfully unaware of the ways he's dipped in and out of the old pirate's life over the years. Luke shook his head. They're a matched pair. You know that? Don't tell them that either, Mara said. There was a beep from the board. Okay, here we go. Encrypt Paspro 9. She touched a few keys. There was a second beep, and suddenly the calm display lit up with Card's familiar face. He wasn't smiling. Mara, Luke! He greeted them, his voice as grim as he looked. Thank you for coming so promptly. I'm sorry I had to drag you out here like this, away from your schedule. Especially you, Luke. I know how much you went through to free up time for this. Don't worry about it. Mara said for both of them. The trip was getting a little routine anyway. What's up? What's up is that I've lost a message, Card said bluntly. 
Four days ago, my sector relay post that Kamra picked up a transmission, marked urgent, and addressed to you, Luke. Luke frowned. Me? So the chief of the station says, Card replied. But that was about all he got. Before he or anyone else could pass it on down the line, it vanished. You think it was stolen? Luke asked. Card's lips compressed briefly. I know it was stolen, he said. We even know the name of the man who stole it, because when the message disappeared from the station, so did he. Have you ever heard of anyone by the name of Dean Jinsler? Doesn't sound familiar, Luke said, searching his memory. Mara? No, Mara said. Who is he? Card shook his head. Unfortunately, I don't know either. Wait a second, Mara said. This is one of your people, and you don't know everything there is to know about him. The corner of Card's lip twitched. I didn't know everything about you when I hired you either, he pointed out. Sure, but I was a special case, Mara countered. I thought you knew better with everyone else. Do we have any idea where the message originated or who sent it? Actually, we have both, Card said, his voice going even darker. The planet of origin was Nerowin. He paused. The sender was an Admiral Voss Park. Luke felt his forehead creasing, a strange sensation trickling through him. Nerowin, Thrawn's private base, full of Imperials and warriors of Thrawn's own people, the Chiss. The fortress he and Mara had escaped from by the skin of their teeth three years before. And Admiral Vaz Park, the one-time Imperial captain whom Thrawn had left in command of that base before his death. They'd had a brief run-in with Park during their time on Nerowin, too, right after the Admiral had tried to recruit Mara to their side. I see that name is familiar to both of you, Card said. I've always had the feeling I didn't get the complete story of your little visit out that way. Luke could sense Mara's sudden discomfort. That was my doing, he said. I insisted we keep most of the details from everyone except the highest-ranking New Republic officials. I quite understand, Card said calmly. Actually, with Park's name I think I can probably recreate most of the missing pieces myself. He was a close associate of Grand Admiral Thrawn's, wasn't he? Actually, he was the Victory-class Star Destroyer captain who found Thrawn at the edge of the Unknown Regions after he'd been exiled by the rest of his people forty-odd years ago, Mara said. He was so impressed with Thrawn's tactical skill that he took a chance and brought him to Palpatine. When Palpatine himself later exiled Thrawn back to the Unknown Regions, Park was one of the officers who was sent out there with him. Exiled, Card murmured. Yes. And I take it whatever Thrawn's true mission was, Park stayed behind to complete it? Basically, Luke conceded. So much for the clever little cover story Palpatine had created to explain Thrawn's departure from the Empire. But then, Card had always been good at reading between the lines. I wish I could be more specific. That's all right, Card smiled. I suppose the New Republic has to have some secrets. Not that they have very many from you anymore, Mara said. So what's the story on this Dean Jinsler? Card shrugged. He's a middle-aged man, somewhere in his sixties. Quite intelligent though he's apparently never made much of a name for himself in any profession or system. He traveled around quite a bit during the Clone Wars, though the details of his activities are sketchy. He joined the organization about a year ago with certificates in ComTech, Droid Maintenance, and Hyperdrive Tech. Impressive credentials, Mara commented. Doesn't sound like the sort of person you'd stick in an Outer Rim Dead Zone station. Well, that's where it gets interesting, Card said heavily. When I pulled up his file, 
I discovered that about eight weeks ago he himself asked for a transfer to that particular post. Luke and Mara exchanged looks. Now, that is interesting, Mara said. Eight weeks, you say? Yes, Card said. I don't know if it means anything, but that was just about the time my researchers finished pulling together the material I'd asked for on Nirwin, Thrawn, and associated topics. Sounds like our boy Jinsler may have a certificate in creative eavesdropping too, Mara said. I presume we have someone digging up everything we can on him? We do, Card said. Unfortunately, it's going to take time. In the meantime, Admiral Park has apparently sent you a message important enough for Jinsler to consider worth stealing. The question is what exactly we do about it. I don't see that we have any choice, Luke said. Until we know what the message says, we can't even begin to guess what Jinsler might want with it. He shrugged. So I guess we're off to Nirwin. Beside him, Mara stirred in her chair, and he sensed her sudden tension. But she remained silent. I was afraid you'd say that, Card said heavily. Given all I don't know about your last trip there, I do know that you were chased out of the system. True? Not exactly chased out, Luke said. On the other hand, I'll admit I've never felt we'd be especially welcome if we went back. But the situation's changed. If Park has a message for us, I assume he'll at least wait until he's delivered it before he tries to shoot us out of the sky. Not funny. Mara muttered. Sorry, Luke apologized. I'm open to other suggestions. Why can't you just signal him from here? Card asked. Between the venture and the hollow net, we should be able to boost the signal that far. Luke shook his head. No. He sent the signal through your station, not the regular hollow net. And he addressed it to me not the Senate or anyone else on Coruscant. That implies it's something he doesn't want leaking out. A little late for that, Card murmured. Even so, we can't risk running any of this through regular communications channels, Luke said. And under the circumstances, we'd better not trust your network with it either. Jinsler may have left friends behind in case of follow-up messages. I suppose that makes sense, Card said reluctantly. Mara? Thoughts or comments? Only that if we're going, we better do it, she said, her voice under careful control. Thanks for the heads up. Under the circumstances, it seemed the least I could do, Card said. It also occurred to me that if you went, you might prefer to use that alien ship you brought back from there. I've sent Shada and Wildcard to go pick it up. A nice thought, Luke said. But I don't think we've got time to wait for it. Definitely not, Mara agreed. Thanks anyway. How many people have you told about that ship, by the way? Just Shada, Card said. No one else. Good, Mara said. I'd like to keep it a secret a little longer, if we can. No problem, Card assured her. If and when we dig out information on Jinsler, shall I send a courier to Nirwin to meet you? Don't bother, Luke said. Chances are we'll be heading straight back to Coruscant within a couple of days anyway. And never mind Jinsler's history, Mara added. You just concentrate on tracking down the man himself. The last time secret information slipped through our fingers, we nearly ended up with a civil war. Card winced. Yes, the commas document, he said. Don't worry, we'll find him. Good, Luke said. We'll talk to you when we get back to civilization. Right, Card said. Good luck. And happy hunting to you, Luke said. He touched the comm switch, 
and Card's face vanished. Well, like you said, the trip was starting to get routine, he commented. Mara didn't answer. I take it you're not happy about all this. Luke suggested as he punched for the NAV computer. You mean about going to Nerwin? Mara asked, her voice thick with sarcasm. Nerwin, where I single-handedly destroyed their whole docking bay deck for them? I'm sure Park's just dying to see me again. Oh, come on, Luke soothed. I'm sure he's gotten over that by now. Anyway, it's really Baron Fell you should be worried about. He was probably the one in charge of the fighters you wrecked. She turned a high-voltage glare on him. You're just dripping with cheer and good humor today, aren't you? Somebody has to be, Luke said, giving her a totally innocent look. Mara held the glare another moment. Then her face softened. You're as worried as I am, aren't you? She asked quietly. Luke sighed. I can think of only one reason Park would suddenly want to talk to us, he admitted. Probably the same reason that's already occurred to you. Mara nodded. The unidentified enemy he told me was coming this direction, she said. The one that had both him and fell seriously concerned. Unless they were lying about that, Luke suggested. They were trying to talk you into joining them, remember? Mara turned to look out at the canopy. No, she said. No, they were convinced. They might have been wrong, but they were sincerely wrong. You're probably right, Luke agreed. I wish now we'd brought Arta with us. He came in pretty handy the last time we were there. We're not going down to the planet itself, Mara said firmly. Besides, I know Leia is a lot more comfortable having him aboard during this stage of Jaina's flight training. Behind Luke, the computer beeped completion of its task. Here we go, he said, feeding the course setting into the helm. It's almost funny, you know, Mara commented thoughtfully. You actually called it, not fifteen minutes ago. Remember? Luke grimaced. Especially since I made it clear to Leia at the start that we weren't supposed to be disturbed unless it was a flat-out invasion. The force is strong in my family, he murmured. So I've heard, Mara said. Let's just hope that was you talking and not the force. Come on, let's get this over with. Two days later, they reached the Nerowind system. Looks quiet enough. Luke said as they flew through space toward the battle-scarred planet itself. No fighter patrols or anything else I can pick up. Mara was silent a moment, and Luke could sense her reaching out with the force. I'm not getting anything either, she said. I get the bad feeling Park wasn't expecting us. Luke frowned at her. I thought you didn't want him waiting for us. I didn't want his fighters waiting for us, Mara corrected. But the complete lack of a welcoming committee implies that the message he sent was complete in and of itself. He may be annoyed to find he has visitors. Well, there's one way to find out, Luke said, adjusting the comm for one of the frequencies the Imperials and Chiss had been using the last time they were here. Let's knock and see if anyone's home. He tapped the key. This is Luke Skywalker, Jedi Master of the New Republic, to Admiral Voss Park. Repeat, this is Luke Skywalker calling Admiral Park. Please respond. He leaned back in his seat. Now, I guess we wait until... Abruptly, the calm display came on, revealing the blue face and glowing red eyes of a chiss. Hello, Skywalker, the alien said. His eyes seemed to burn into Luke's face. And Jade is here too, I see, he added, his face turning slightly to gaze at Mara. This is Creston Tarthi, commander of Mithra Nurodo's household phalanx for the Empire of the Hand. This is certainly a surprise. 
I don't know why it should be, Luke said evenly. Or didn't you know Anmaro Park had sent me a message? Yes, I knew, Crest and Tarthy said. The Admiral will be here in a moment. In the meantime, would you care to land and join us? His face seemed to tighten slightly. Don't worry, the docking bay has been completely repaired since your last visit. Thanks for your hospitality, Mara said before Luke could answer. I think we'll stay here. The Chiss inclined his head. As you wish. The display blanked. You know him? Luke asked. Yes, though I'd only heard his core name, Stent, Mara said. He was one of the Chiss on guard duty when Park and Fell were talking to me. I think he took it personally when you came charging to the rescue. Luke shook his head. We have friends all over this planet, don't we? We have friends all over this whole region of space, Mara retorted. Don't forget, the rest of Thrawn's people are out there somewhere. Whole star systems full of Chiss, whom I notice haven't exactly been eager to make their presence known to the New Republic. Maybe they've got enough troubles of their own, and figure they don't need to share ours, Luke offered. Maybe, Mara said. Interesting term stent used. Did you notice? Empire of the Hand, Luke said, nodding. Probably relates to the Hand of Thrawn. Obviously, Mara said. I was wondering more about the Empire part. You and your rebel friends certainly had plenty of trouble with Palpatine's empire. You suppose the Chiss might be having similar problems with Thrawn's? Could be, Luke said doubtfully. Grand Admiral Thrawn, Mithran Erodo, to give his full Chiss name, had been arguably the greatest military genius the galaxy had ever known, certainly the greatest the empire had ever had in its ranks. Palpatine had sent him and a task force out into the unknown regions before the Rebel Alliance had been formed, ostensibly in punishment for a breach of palace politics, but in reality with the secret mission of exploring and conquering new systems for future imperial expansion. On their last visit to Nirwin, Luke and Mara had learned just how well he had succeeded at that task. In just those few short years he had opened up huge expanses of territory putting them under the control of his imperial forces and the handful of Chiss such as Stent who had remained loyal to him. The original secrecy of the project had also been maintained, with the leaders of the imperial remnant on Bastion having never even heard of the project up to that point. Now, three years later, Supreme Commander Pelian and a handful of trusted advisors had had some limited contact with Park and the Nirwan offshoot of their former regime. Leia and some of the other top people in the New Republic also knew of its existence, though Luke suspected neither government had any idea how extensive the new territory actually was. Only he and Mara knew that, and for the moment they had decided to keep it private. The designation Empire of the Hand for the region, however, was a new one on them. I can't see Thrawn becoming that kind of tyrant though. He went on thinking back over the New Republic's own struggles against the Grand Admiral. He never struck me as the sort to rule by terror or suppression. Doesn't mean he couldn't have learned, Mara pointed out. Palpatine was an excellent teacher. Or if not Thrawn himself, maybe those who succeeded him went in that direction. Happens all the time. I suppose, Luke conceded. Still. He broke off as the calm display came on again, this time revealing a gray-haired human with a lined face and quick, shrewd eyes. Hello, Mara, he said. Master Skywalker. This is a surprise, I must say. I assumed you'd be well on your way to Krusty by now. Luke frowned. Krusty? The rendezvous point, Park said, his forehead furrowing as he frowned in turn. Didn't you get my message? Unfortunately, it took a wrong turn, Mara told him. 
Someone named Dean Ginsler made off with it before anyone else could see the contents. Really? Park murmured, looking back and forth between them. You know this man? Never heard of him before, Mara said. I take it this message was worth stealing? In the proper hands, it could very well be, Park said, his lips compressing briefly. This is not good at all. Yes, that's basically the conclusion we came to, Mara agreed. You want to fill us in? Of course, Park said, his thoughts clearly still on the wayward message. Though if the chiss... He seemed to shake himself. Well, what's done is done, he said briskly. Reality must always be dealt with, whether we like it or not. Tell me, Skywalker, have you ever heard of something called outbound flight? Yes, I think so, Luke said slowly, thinking hard. I came across a reference to it when I was searching for information on Joris Kbeath, back when his clone was working with, was trying to kidnap Leia's twins. He corrected himself quickly. Kbeath's former connection with Thrawn, and especially his connection with Thrawn's death, might not be a wise subject to bring up. Wasn't it some grand effort a few years before the Clone Wars to send an expedition to another galaxy? Very good, Park said. Yes, that was basically it. The project consisted of six brand new dreadnoughts, clustered together in a hexagonal pattern around a central storage core. The personnel consisted of six Jedi Masters and a dozen Jedi Knights, including Kbeath himself, plus some 50,000 others, crewers and their families. Luke blinked. And their families? Traveling to another galaxy would take time, Park reminded him. Especially at the low speeds dreadnoughts were capable of making. In addition, since they would be passing through the unknown regions on the way, there was some suggestion of planting a few colonies as they went. Ah, Luke said, nodding. Hence the design. Correct, Park said. If a colony was indeed formed, one of the dreadnoughts could be easily detached from the cluster to provide the colonists with protection and mobility. Yes, Luke said. Aside from that, about all I know is that the expedition never returned. Did they make it to another galaxy? Beside him, Mara stirred. They didn't even make it out of ours, she said quietly. Thrawn intercepted the mission at the edge of Chiss space and destroyed it. Yes, Park said. The rest of the Chiss were not pleased, to say the least. Thrawn was nearly exiled on the spot, though he apparently was able to talk his way out of it somehow. Yes, I remember the history lesson from the last time I was here, Mara said. The Chiss are fanatics on the topic of preemptive strikes. So what does a 50-year-old tragedy have to do with us? Just this. Park's eyes bored into hers. The Chiss have found the remains of outbound flight. And they want to give it back. For a long moment, Mara just stared at the screen, a hundred different thoughts and emotions twisting themselves through her mind. No she said, the word popping out without conscious effort. That's impossible. It has to be a trick. Park shrugged. I agree it sounds odd. But Aristocra Formby seemed sincere when he contacted me. It's impossible, Mara insisted again. You told me Thrawn destroyed outbound flight. When Thrawn destroys something, he does a very thorough job of it. Which I would know far better than you, Park returned pointedly. The fact remains that the Chiss say they found outbound flight. The description formed by gave certainly fits the design, and there's no other reason I can think of why even a single dreadnought should be out this far. He lifted an eyebrow. The hows and whys are questions none of us can answer right now. The only question you have to deal with is what you're going to do about it. What we're going to do? Luke asked. 
It seems to me this is something for the entire New Republic leadership, not a couple of Jedi. Perhaps, Park said. But perhaps not. Outbound Flight was a brainchild of the Jedi, after all, not the Old Republic Senate, or even Palpatine. That's why Formby asked that you be contacted and invited to join the official expedition to the site of the remains. He asked for Luke? Mara asked? Specifically, Park confirmed, turning to look toward a screen to his right. Here's the entire message, to Luke Skywalker, Jedi Master, Jedi Academy, Yavin IV, from Chafor Embintrano, Aristocra of the Fifth Ruling Family, Sarvchi. A patrol from the Chiss Expansionary Defense Fleet has located what appears to be the remnants of the expeditionary mission known to you as outbound flight deep inside Chiss territory. As a token of respect, and with deep regret for Chiss involvement in its destruction, we offer you the opportunity to join the official examination of the vessel. I will await you at the World Crusty. Here he gave the coordinates. For the next 15 days, at which time we will travel together to outbound flight's location. I urge you to attend, so that through you we may discuss arrangements for the return of the remains to your people. End of message. And this all came from this Chafuaram whatever? Mara asked. The address and everything? Chafuaram Bintrano, Park supplied. Call him form by. Obviously. I supplied the location of the Jedi Academy for him. The Chiss know virtually nothing about the New Republic, and certainly nothing about its worlds. Yet he knew Luke's name? Well, no, not exactly, Park said. Formby asked for the name of the New Republic's most prominent Jedi. That would of course be Master Skywalker. So you and Formby are on good speaking terms? Mara pressed. I wouldn't say we're on good speaking terms, Park hedged. Official Chiss policy is still that Thrawn was a renegade who brought nothing but dishonor on the rest of his people. Tell that to Stent, Luke murmured. Park shrugged. I didn't say all the Chiss agreed. I simply said that was the official line. But Formby and I have spoken on occasion and the conversations have been reasonably civil. He glanced somewhere off-screen. I've run the numbers on travel to the Krusty system. Assuming you can make at least point three in that ship, you should have just enough time to get there before Formby's fifteen days are up. Thank you, Luke said. If you don't mind, we'll discuss it and get back to you. As you wish, Park said. I hope to speak with you again soon. He was still sitting there, gazing at them, when Luke switched off the calm. Mara kept her eyes on the planet, feeling Luke's unspoken question hanging in the air between them. What do you think? She asked instead. It's an intriguing offer, Luke said. As far as I could tell, the whole outbound flight project was wrapped in secrecy. There was hardly anything even in the Coruscan archives that I could find. There's a lot we don't know anymore about that whole era, Mara said. The Clone Wars and Palpatine's purge saw to that. That's my point, Luke said. If even a part of outbound flight survived, there's a chance that some of its records survived with it. This could be the kind of glimpse into the past that we've always wanted. That we've always wanted. Mara countered, looking at him. Or that you've always wanted? All right, fine, Luke said, clearly puzzled by her reaction. I admit it, I'd like to know more about the Jedi of that time. Wouldn't you? That's also when Palpatine came to power, she reminded him darkly, turning back to the canopy. Personally, there's a lot about that era that I don't want to know. I understand. Luke said gently. But on the other hand, we can't ignore the potential of this offer. What potential? Mara scoffed. 
The chance for the Chiss to assuage their guilt over letting Thrawn run wild as long as they did? I'm sure that's part of it, Luke said. The Chiss claimed to be an honorable people. Even Thrawn made a point of not killing or destroying more than he thought was necessary. But I have a strong feeling that there's more to this than just a simple act of atonement. Such as? Luke shrugged. I don't know. It may be that the Chiss are looking to open diplomatic relations with the New Republic, and finding outbound flight has given them the opening they needed to do so. Really? Mara said. Well, in that case, my dear, they're going about it in an awfully strange way. I've been running some numbers, too, and even if that message had been delivered when it was supposed to be, we barely have had time to alert Coruscant before we flash-tailed it out to the unknown regions. And they wouldn't have had time to even organize a diplomatic mission, let alone get it in space and time. Face it, Luke, Formby doesn't want the New Republic involved at least not on any official level. I can't argue with that, Luke conceded. Still, if the Chiss consider outbound flight to have been a Jedi project, it makes sense for them to ask for me instead of someone from the Senate. If Park's telling the truth, Mara said, it also could be that he's lying through his teeth. There's one way to find out, Luke pointed out. I doubt he could hide that massive a deception from both of us in person. We're not going down there, Mara said flatly. The last time I sat in the same room with him he first tried to recruit me, then almost had me shot with those wonderful little Charik fire guns the Chiss carry. Thanks, but I can hear him just fine from up here. Okay, don't get excited, Luke said. I'm not in any rush to go down there again either. Just bear in mind that in that case all we've got to go on is what he says. I know, Mara muttered. I just don't like it. Luke shrugged. It's a gamble, he said. But I think it's worth taking. He cocked his head to the side, and again Mara could feel his mind pressing at hers. Unless you have something more solid to go on, one way or the other? You mean am I getting something from the Force? Mara grimaced. I wish I was. But all I've got is my own natural suspicion. No, it's not just that, Luke corrected her thoughtfully. There's something else there, something deeper than just caution or suspicion. It feels a little like the way I felt when Yoda told me I would have to face my father before I would truly be a Jedi. But I've already been through that, Mara protested. You told me that that transition had to do with sacrifice. I made mine. She jabbed a finger toward the planet in front of them. Right down there. I know, Luke said, and Mara felt a new warmth flow into his concern. That sacrifice, after all, was what had finally made this whole relationship possible. But it wasn't the sacrifice aspect I was thinking of. It was more the, I don't know. Call it the need to face the past. Mara snorted. I've never even been to Chiss space. How can going out there possibly have anything to do with my past? I don't know, Luke said. I just said that was what it felt like, that's all. Mara sighed. You want to go, don't you? Luke reached over and took her hand. I think we have to, he said. If Park was right about an enemy moving in toward us, we're going to need all the allies we can get. If there's even a chance of getting the Chiss on our side, we need to take it. Yes, Mara said, a shiver running up her back. Unless Park was lying about that, too. Well, if we're going to go, we'd better go. Squeezing Luke's hand once, she let go and reached for the comm switch. Let's contact Park and get those coordinates. Chapter 3 The Jade Saber was capable of somewhat better than 0.3 past light speed, 
and they made it to Crusti with nearly a day to spare. Here, unlike the apparently more casual situation they'd found at Nirwin, there was a welcoming committee waiting. There were five of them, in fact, alien fighters, midway in size between an X-wing and a Skipre blast boat, moving up behind the saber as Luke brought the ship out of hyperspace. Identify yourself. A hard voice snapped from the calm and passable basic. Jedi Master Luke Skywalker and Jedi Knight Mara Jade Skywalker. Luke replied, glancing at the tactical plot Mara had pulled up. The fighters had moved neatly into flanking positions around the Jade Saber, a move that could easily be justified as an innocent escort formation, but which would serve equally well for attack if necessary. We're here at the request of Aristocra Chafor Embentrano of the Fifth Ruling Family. Welcome, Master Skywalker, the voice said. We will escort you to the Aristocra's diplomatic courier vessel. You will dock there and go aboard. Thank you, Luke said. One of the fighters broke formation and moved out in front of the group, angling off to the left toward the edge of the planet directly ahead. Taking the cue, Luke shifted course to follow. What do you think? He asked. If they've borrowed any of our technology, it sure doesn't show, Mara said, leaning over the sensor skin she'd done of the fighters. Most of the weapons are registering as unknowns, but they seem to be mainly energy and projectile types, with a couple of small missiles racked together on the underside. Proton torpedoes? Luke suggested, studying the schematic the sensors had drawn for them. Seem a bit big for that, but I can't tell for sure, Mara said. I definitely wouldn't want to go up against one of these things in combat, though, let alone five of them. We'll do our best to avoid that, Luke agreed. Seems odd that they haven't used any of our stuff, though, considering Thrawn's relationship with the Empire. You heard Park, Mara reminded him. They don't think much of Thrawn out here. Yes, but you'd think they'd at least swallow their pride where useful technology is concerned, Luke said. Most people's principles don't extend that far. Mara shrugged. Maybe we finally found a society of people where they do. The courier ship the fighter pilot had mentioned, like the fighters themselves, turned out to be something of a surprise. It was bigger than Luke had expected, for one thing, nearly half again as big as the Corellian corvettes that the New Republic routinely used for such tasks. In addition, Instead of the corvette's smooth lines, the Chiss ship seemed to be all planes and corners and sharply defined angles, rather like a Mon Calamari star cruiser roughly carved out of stone before the sculptor began smoothing the surface into the proper curves. Interesting design, Mara commented as they flew toward it. It would be great for hiding in asteroid fields. It would blend in pretty well, wouldn't it? Luke said, nodding. I was just thinking that it wouldn't be easily mistaken for anything else. That's something else you want in a diplomatic ship. Maybe, Mara said. Or maybe the Chiss just like lumpy ships. Does make me wonder what the docking bay is going to be like, though. Luke winced. Back when he'd first presented the Jade Saber to Mara, after she'd thanked him for it, she made it casually clear what would happen to anyone who so much as scratched the paint. This could be trouble. Fortunately, it wasn't. The starboard side docking bay they were escorted to, more of a half port, really, than a full size bay, was smooth walled, without any decorative angles or corners intruding on the approach. It also had maneuvering room to spare, and Mara got the sabers nose into position and locked into the clamps on her first try. We're in, she announced. Now what? Looks like they're moving a transfer tunnel toward the portside hatch, Luke said, craning his neck to peer out the side of the canopy. Let's go meet our host. It took a few minutes for them to shut the ship down to standby and then make their way back to the hatchway. Someone was already waiting there 
tapping politely and discreetly on the metal. Here we go, Luke murmured and touched the release. The hatchway slid up to reveal a young chis female dressed in an exotically cut jumpsuit composed of shades of yellow. Welcome to the diplomatic vessel Chaff Anvi, she said. Her basic was far better than the fighter pilots had been, with only a trace of an exotic accent flavoring the words. I am Chaffi Asakleo, A to Aristocra Chaffor Rembintrano. I would be honored if you would call me by my core name, Fisa. Thank you, Luke said. I'm Luke Skywalker. Call me Luke. This is Mara Jade Skywalker, Mara, my wife and fellow Jedi. Luke, Mara. Fisa repeated the names, bowing low from her waist. We are honored by your presence. Please come this way. She turned and headed down the tunnel. You speak our language very well. Luke commented as he and Mara fell into step behind her. Is it common among your people? Not at all, Fisa said. It was introduced many years ago by the visitors, but only a few have felt the desire to learn it. The visitors? Mara asked. You mean the people aboard outbound flight? No, the visitors, Fisa said. The ones who came before. Before outbound flight? Mara asked, frowning. Who would have come out here before that? I do not know their names. Fisa half turned to regard Mara over her shoulder. But it is not my place to speak of such things, she added. You must not ask me anything more. Our apologies, Luke said, sending a warning thought at Mara and sensing in return a flicker of frustration at his tacit suspension of her investigation. Probing for information was one of Mara's specialties. Ahead, the tunnel came to an end at a wide hatchway opening up into a large room beyond. Fisa stepped through into the room and moved to the side of the hatchway, making room for the other two to enter. Luke stepped through. His only warning was a flicker in the force, a brief and unfocused sense of danger. But it was enough. Reflexively, he threw himself forward into a low dive as something whipped through the space he'd just vacated. Fisa gasped something as Luke hit the deck and rolled onto his back, kicking off the flooring with his heels. The momentum of his kick pushed him backward away from the point of danger, simultaneously shoving him back up off the cold metal. Half a second later he was back on his feet, poised in combat stance with his lightsaber blazing ready in front of him. His first concern was Mara. To his relief, he saw she was still in the tunnel, just inside the protection of the hatchway, her lightsaber ignited and ready. For a moment their eyes met, exchanging assurances that each was unhurt. Fisa, he noted peripherally, was sprawled on the deck. Apparently Mara had used the force to shove her down where she'd hopefully be out of danger. Mentally warning Mara to stay where she was, he shifted his attention to search for the source of the attack. It wasn't hard to find. A thick, heavy-looking cable anchored to the high ceiling was swinging ponderously alongside the wall, apparently having come loose just as Luke was stepping through the hatchway. Grimacing with a mixture of relief and annoyance, he closed down his lightsaber. It's all right. He called to Mara, measuring the swing of the cable with his eyes. Another five seconds and it would cut back across the hatchway, but until then it would be safe to cross. Come on through. Mara came through, all right, but in typical Mara fashion. She waited four of the five seconds, then suddenly leapt out and up, spinning 180 degrees around in midair. As the cable swung past, she slashed upward with her lightsaber. He'd expected her to cut the end completely off as a mark of her displeasure at what had just happened but the blue blade merely slashed past the flying cable without any apparent effect at all. She landed back on the deck, the cable clattering noisily along the wall as it swung past her. You all right? 
She asked Luke, closing down her lightsaber and returning it to her belt. I'm fine, Luke assured her. I was feeling like a little exercise anyway. A movement to his right caught his eye, and he turned to see a pair of Chiss males enter the room through a high archway, both considerably older than Fisa, both wearing elaborate outfits that were almost certainly robes of state. The shorter Chiss, his blue-black hair liberally sprinkled with white, wore a long, flowing robe in subdued shades of yellow with gray trim. The taller Chissa's outfit was shorter, more like a long tunic than an actual robe, and was predominantly black, though with small swatches of dusky red at various places on the sleeves and upper shoulders. Greetings to you, Jedi of, the black-clad Chiss began. He broke off abruptly, his eyes narrowing, as the last echo of his words bounced briefly between the high walls. What is this? He demanded. There was an accident, noble sir, Fisa said, jumping quickly to her feet. The cable broke and nearly struck Master Skywalker. I see, the Chiss said, the threatening tone fading from his voice. My apologies, Master Skywalker. Are you injured? No, Luke assured him as he and Mara crossed to meet the newcomers. Aristaka Chafor Embintrano, I presume? The Chiss shook his head. I am General Prodrasclione of the Chiss Defense Fleet, he said stiffly. Military commander of this expedition. He half turned to the Chiss in yellow. This, he said, is Aristaka Chafor Embintrano. Luke shifted his attention to the other Chiss. Alien ages were always hard to judge, but there was something about Chafor Embintrano that marked him as being much older than the general. A presence, perhaps, or something in his face or stance. My apologies, Aristaka Chafor Embintrano, he said. Hardly necessary, the other said easily. No one would expect you to know one Chiss from another. I trust you had an uneventful journey? Quite uneventful, thank you, Luke said. Chafor Remontrano's accent was somewhat thicker than Fisa's, but his ease in speaking indicated he knew the language better even than she did. Aside from this last bit, Mara interjected, nodding toward the cable still swinging along the wall. You speak our language well, Aristocra Chafor Remontrano. Did you also learn it from the visitors? From the visitors and others, the Chiss said. Since the arrival of your people at Nirwin, it has by necessity become a small but growing field of study. All personnel aboard this mission are familiar with it, in fact, and I have instructed them to use it whenever possible as a courtesy to you. Thank you, Aristocra Chafor Embintrano, Luke said, nodding his head. That's an unexpected but welcome kindness. You're welcome, Chafor Embintrano said. Following that same pattern of courtesy, I would also request that you address me by my core name, Formby. I believe that will make our conversations easier. It will indeed, Luke assured him, feeling a definite relief at Formby's thoughtfulness. He'd never been nearly as good with alien languages and pronunciations as Leia or even Han, and C-3PO was a long way away at the moment. Again, I thank you. It's only a reasonable courtesy, Formby continued, as if feeling he had to somehow justify the decision. After all, full names are mainly reserved for formal occasions, for strangers, and for those who are our social inferiors. As representatives of the New Republic, all of you must surely be considered to be on a level with the very highest of the orders. Luke glanced at Mara, caught the flicker that showed she'd spotted it, too. All of you? Shouldn't he have said both of you? That's certainly one way to look at it, he agreed. Good, Formby said. You may likewise address General Prodrasclione as General Drask. Luke looked at the general, 
caught the brief hardness about the other's mouth before he carefully smoothed it away. Apparently, Drask wasn't nearly as happy with upsetting the normal social order as Formby was. Or else he just didn't like humans. But come, Formby added, gesturing back toward the archway he and Drask had entered by. Let me show you the public areas of the vessel before Fisa takes you to your personal quarters. He turned and led the way back across the room toward the archway. Pretty big room for an entry area, Mara commented as they passed under the archway and into a curving hallway. Unlike the ship's outer hull, the interior surfaces were all smooth and even. Our ships usually can't afford to waste that much space. Do you view courtesy and formality as a waste, then? Drass growled. Perhaps politeness is unnecessary, too, or positions or social levels. General. Formby spoke the title quietly, but there was something in his voice that instantly silenced the other. Our guests don't do things as we do. Obviously, they don't understand. He looked back at Mara. This is a diplomatic vessel of the fifth ruling family, and we often welcome high-positioned officials aboard. Each social and professional position requires its own proper expanse, decor, and pattern. In each of those situations the reception area can be automatically reconfigured and decorated before the guest's arrival. He shrugged. As it is, the room is barely large enough to properly welcome a brother or sister of one of the nine families. Fortunately, most of them travel but little, and then mainly in vessels of their own. I see, Mara said. Formed by frowned at her, and Luke caught a sudden ripple of uncertainty. Did you expect some ceremony of that sort? He asked. Admiral Park told me that Jedi either required nor wished such recognition. Was he incorrect? No, not at all, Luke hastened to assure him. Officials of our position don't require any formal rituals or treatment. Especially not on a mission like this one, Mara added. If we're ever in a situation where ceremony is required, we'll inform you then, and instruct you in the proper patterns as we of course will expect you to do for us if the situation is reverse, Luke said. Until then, consider us to be merely fellow travelers come to see the remains of an ancient Republic ship. Formed by nodded, the uncertainty smoothing away. Then we shall do that, he declared. Now that all have arrived. He broke off as a trilling group of tones cut through the air. Incoming vessel, a gentle voice announced from somewhere above them. Pascla class, unknown configuration. Drask muttered something under his breath. Combat preparations, he called toward the ceiling as he took off at a run down the corridor. Come, Formby said, gesturing them forward as Drask disappeared from view around a curve. We were going to the public areas anyway. We might as well begin with the command center. He led them through a dozen twists and turns to a small balcony overlooking a room that was, as near as Luke could judge, very nearly dead center in the core of the ship. It was about the same size as the reception area had been, but with a much lower ceiling. Unlike the reception room, it was crammed full of consoles, displays, wall monitors, and chis. Most of the aliens were dressed in the same black as General Drask, though their outfits were tighter fitting, less elaborate, and clearly more functional. Luke spotted Drask himself on a circular podium in the center of the room, conferring with a chis wearing an outfit similar to his but with green patches where the general's uniform showed red. This is the command center, formed by said, as calm as if he was leading a tour through an interesting display of painted shellfish. The officer wearing green patches is Captain Brastal Shibarku, the line commander of this vessel. You may address him as Captain Talship. And that, he added, pointing across to the largest of the wall displays, is apparently our incoming vessel. Luke focused on the image. 
The alien ship looked like a slightly squashed sphere, light-colored but with a close-order pattern of dark spots covering the hull that could have been viewports, vents, or even just decoration. There was no scale on the display that he could see, but if the ships now swarming around it were more of the fighters that had run escort for the Jade Saber, then the intruder was decently sized. Doesn't look like a warship, Mara commented from beside him. They usually have at least one low silhouette, high firepower plane available to present to an approaching enemy. That thing's going to be a perfect target no matter what direction it comes at you from. You forget the Death Star, Luke reminded her. It was shaped more or less like that. And its design stunk too, Mara retorted. It just happened to be big enough and mean enough to get away with it. Mostly. Luke couldn't resist saying. Whatever, Mara gestured. This thing, on the other hand, doesn't seem to be even half the size of a dreadnought. Formby turned to Fisa. Fisa, please go and ask the ambassador to join us, he said. He, too, may find this interesting. I obey, Fisa said, bobbing her head in a quick bow and then hurrying off. The ambassador? Mara asked. Yes, Formby said. Did I understand you to say you knew of a vessel of this type? No, just a battle station of a similar shape, Luke said. It was destroyed a long time ago, Mara added. Now about this ambassador? She was interrupted by another trilling tone, a different combination of notes than the one they'd heard earlier. Signal alert. Formed by identified it. They're trying to communicate. One of the smaller displays to the side cleared to reveal a pair of alien faces with large violet eyes, flattened ears rising high on the skull, and a pair of small mouths set just above the jawline. The skin was light tan, with a hint of exotic gold marbling about the jaw and cheeks. What are they? Luke asked. It's not a species I've seen before, Formby said, leaning forward a little as if trying to see the image better. I thought you were the dominant species out here, Mara said. Don't you know all your neighbors? We have a significant number of stars and star systems, yes, Formby said. There was neither arrogance nor apology in his voice. He was simply stating a fact. But the Nine Families have long discouraged our people from probing or prying into the territories of others. Certainly the Defense Fleet and all official personnel are required to stay within our own borders. He shrugged. Besides which, there are also many small groups in this region of space, remnants of pirate attack or refugees of mass destruction by other aggressors. Plus, of course, there are those same pirates and aggressors. Even if we wish to do so, it would be a great undertaking to try to know them all. There are a hundred different threats out there that would freeze your blood if you knew about them, Mara murmured. Formby frowned at her. I beg your pardon? I was just remembering something a Chiss once told me, Mara explained. A warrior named Stent, back on Nerowin. Yes, Formby said his tone a little odd. Perhaps he didn't like being reminded that Park had a lot of renegade chis working with him. In actual fact, he may have underestimated the number. The galaxy outside chis territory is not a very safe place to be. On the display, one of the aliens opened his mouths, and a flow of melodic sounds suddenly filled the room. Luke stretched out with the force wondering if he could get a sense of the words the way he'd once done with the calm K and calm Ja of Nirwin. But those species' communication had had a force component to it. This one did not, and his efforts were of no use. Ah, Formby said. At least they've been around the region long enough to pick up Manisiat. What's that, a trade language? Mara asked. Exactly. Formby said, glancing at her with an approving look. 
Manisiad is the chief trade language among the various peoples of this area. Most just know at least some of it, particularly those who live on border worlds like Krusty. What's he saying? Luke asked. Formby pursed his lips. Greetings to the noble and compassionate people of the Chiss Ascendancy, he said slowly. I am Bersh, first steward of the Jerun Remnant. From the podium, General Drask was speaking now. It seemed to be the same language, though his voice was considerably less melodic than the Jeruns. I am General Pradrask Leone of the Chiss Expansionary Defense Fleet, formed by translated. What is your business in Chiss territory? To Luke Sears, Drask's question hadn't seemed particularly angry or threatening. The Jerun, though, apparently heard something different than he did. Bersha's voice abruptly took on what seemed to be an alarmed tone, a sense that Formby's translation merely confirmed. We mean no affront. Please do not harm our vessel. We wish merely to honor those who died to free our people. Drask looked up from his podium, his eyes searching briefly before locating Formby on the observation balcony. Aristocra? He called. Are you familiar with the event he refers to? I have no knowledge of any such event, formed by called back. Ask him to explain. The general turned and began speaking again. I thought you didn't go out of your way to help people outside your territory, Mara said. We don't, formed by said. The Jerun spoke again and Formby's glowing eyes narrowed as he listened. I see, he said. Interesting. Listen, we have heard you have located the bones of the Republic vessel known as Outbound Flight. The people who traveled in it sacrificed their lives that we might be freed from our enslavers. Wait a minute, Luke said, turning to Mara. I thought you said Thrawn destroyed Outbound Flight. That's what Park told me, Mara confirmed. Maybe he was wrong. Or maybe this happened before Thrawn got to it. Luke suggested. Drask was speaking again. General Drask is asking who their enslavers were, Formby said, a thoughtful tone in his voice. I wonder. His voice trailed off. You know something? Mara prompted. I have a thought, Formby said. Let's first see what the Jurun says. Bersh answered, stepping back from the holocum and waving his hands in a complicated pattern. What's that behind him? Luke asked, frowning as he tried to see past the two alien faces that were now only partially filling the screen. The area behind them seemed to be a large open room possibly even larger than the reception area he and Mara had come through earlier. The walls and ceiling were colored a white textured blue, and he could just see the tops of some kind of open structures above the aliens' heads. And then, as he watched, two small figures moved into view, climbing hand over hand on the nearest structure. What in the? It's a playground, Mara breathed. It's a children's playground. You're right, Luke said. One of the small Jeruns reached the top of the structure he was climbing, pulling a red headband from around his ears as he did so and waving it in triumph. Looks like a version of Hilltop Emperor. Complete with flag and loud gloating, Mara agreed. What in the world is a playground doing aboard a starship? The Vigari, formed by murmured. What? Luke asked, turning to him. Formby gestured to the display. He has just confirmed my expectations, the Chiss said darkly. He says it was the Vigari who enslaved them. I take it that is a species you've seen before? Mara asked. Not seen, but far too familiar with, Formby said. They were a great race of nomadic conquerors and slavers who once flew freely through this region of space, taking and destroying at will, particularly among the smaller species and worlds. 
Are they still around? Luke asked. They and their deeds have not been seen for many years, Formby said. Not since the battle where the outbound flight was destroyed, in fact. Luke and Mara exchanged startled looks. They were at that battle? Luke asked. And on whose side? Mara added. Outbound flights or the Chissas? There was no Chiss side of the battle, Jedi Skywalker. Formed by countered, his red eyes flashing at her. There was only Syndic Mithra Nurodo and his one very small picket force. They did not represent the Chiss defense fleet, or the nine ruling families, or any other group of the Chiss people. Yes, we understand that, Luke assured him hastily. Mara was simply wondering how exactly the battle lines were drawn up. Formby shook his head. I arrived after the battle was over, after all the destruction had already taken place. He rumbled deep in his throat. Syndic Mithra Nuroda was not very informative on what exactly had taken place. So it's possible that the Jedi aboard outbound flight really did help them against the Vigari? Luke asked. Formed by shrugged. You know the Jedi, he said. You must tell me whether that is possible. Luke looked back at the display and the pleading drones. Faced with both a pirate gang and Thrawn's forces, threatened by both, what would the Jedi have done? I'm sure they would have tried to help, he said slowly. How much they could have done? I don't know. Though the Jeroons clearly think they did something significant, Mara pointed out. You suppose outbound flight and Thrawn could have combined forces long enough to stomp the Vigari before Thrawn turned on them? Luke shrugged. I suppose that's possible, he said. Hard to believe he could have conned six Jedi Masters into wasting their strength against pirates when he knew all along he was going to attack them afterward. Unless they knew that, but decided to risk it anyway in order to save the Jeroons, Mara suggested. You Jedi Masters get all noble and self-sacrificing at the oddest moments. Thank you, Luke said dryly. The question is... Ah, Formby said, turning. Here he is now. Luke turned to see Fisa coming toward them. Striding along behind her was a medium-tall human male with silver hair and a close-cropped silver beard, his face lined and dark with the evidence of too many of his years spent under unforgiving sons. Welcome, Ambassador, Formby greeted him. We seem to have more visitors. I see, the man said, looking past the group toward the command center's displays. His voice was deep and rich full of intelligence and quiet confidence. Up close now, Luke could see that his eyes were an unusual shade of gray. Interesting. Do we know them? They call themselves the Jeruns, Formby said, turning back as someone called his name. Excuse me, but I'm needed below. Come, Fisa. Introductions? Mara murmured, her eyes on the newcomer. I'm sorry, Formby said as he and Fisa paused at the top of the short stairway that linked the balcony to the main floor of the command center. Ambassador, may I present Jedi Master Luke Skywalker and Jedi Knight Mara Jade Skywalker? There was a flicker of something in the man's eyes, but his smile showed nothing but easy friendliness. Pleased to meet you, he said. I've heard many things about you both. And this? Formby continued. Is the person Coruscant and the New Republic have sent as their representative? Ambassador Dean Ginsler. Chapter 4 Formby hurried off down the stairway teal where General Drask was waiting, Fisa following close behind. Leaving the three humans gazing at each other. Ginsler broke the silence first. I see you've been talking to Talon Card, he said. What makes you say that? Luke asked, his voice giving nothing away. 
Your expressions, Jinsler said. He smiled faintly. Or rather, your complete lack of them. You probably want to know what this is all about. Why don't you tell us? Luke suggested. From the calmness in his voice it was clear he was willing to give the man the benefit of the doubt, at least for the moment. Which was a full moment longer than Mara herself was interested in giving him. She threw a quick glance down at the command floor, wondering what Luke would say if she called Formby back up here and denounced Jinsler on the spot. But Formby seemed to be having a quiet, three-way argument with Drask and Talshib on the podium. Interrupting them at this point might not be a smart thing to do. For starters, let me assure you I'm not here for any kind of financial gain, Jinsler said. I'm not looking for power or influence or blackmail, either. Well, that cuts out all the interesting possibilities, Mara said tartly. How about telling us what you are here for? I can also promise you that I won't make any trouble, Jinsler continued. I won't try to influence the Chiss or get in the way of whatever negotiations or other diplomatic plans you have. You're already making trouble, just by being here. Mara told him. You're also stalling, Luke said. What do you want? Jinsler took a deep breath, let it out in a controlled huff. I have to see outbound flight, he said quietly, his gaze drifting to the display and the image of the Jerun ship. I have to. He closed his eyes briefly. I'm sorry, but it's extremely personal. Very touching, Mara said. Also very inadequate. Let's try it from a different direction. Why are you impersonating a new Republic official? Jinsler's throat tightened. Because I'm a nobody, he said, a touch of bitterness edging into his voice. And because the only way to get to outbound flight is aboard an official Chiss ship, at the invitation of the official Chiss government. You really think they'd let me aboard if they knew the truth? I don't know, Luke said. Why don't we try it? Jinsler shook his head. I can't risk it, he said. I have to see that ship, Master Skywalker. I have to. He shook his head again. How did you expect to get away with it? Luke asked. Did you think we wouldn't notice you weren't a properly credentialed ambassador? I thought you might not get the message in time and would miss Formby's deadline, Jinsler said. If you did make it, he shrugged uncomfortably. I hoped you'd understand. Understand what? Mara retorted. You won't even tell us what it is we're supposed to understand. I know, he smiled wanly. Pretty foolish of me, I guess. But it was all I had. Mara looked past him at Luke, a sour taste in her mouth. An accomplished actor she knew could pull off a performance this good. So could most of the good con men she'd known throughout her life. But acting ability and deep size weren't nearly enough to fool a Jedi. Try as she might, she couldn't ignore the fact that her senses were picking up the same earnest emotional struggle in his mind as was coming out in his face and words. The man was rash, not much of a long-range thinker, possibly even an out-and-out -out fool. But he was also completely sincere. But then, she'd been sincere, too, the whole time she'd served Palpatine as the Emperor's hand. She'd done everything he'd ordered her to including assassinations of corrupt officials and rebels alike, with all the sincerity anyone could ever have asked for. No, sincerity alone didn't count for much. In fact, when you came right down to it, it didn't count for anything at all. Mara? Luke invited. No, she said firmly. Unless he's willing to tell us, right now, exactly why he wants a board, I say he gets tossed off. She lifted her eyebrows at Jinsler. Well? The lines around Jinsler's eyes deepened, 
and his shoulders seemed to sag a little. I can't, he said softly. It's just... He broke off, his gaze flicking over Mara's shoulder. Aristocra formed by, he said, the indecision and pain abruptly gone from his voice, though not from his sense. What's the situation with our guests? Mara turned to see form by climbing back up the steps toward them, an odd tightness in his face and tread. They're coming with us, he said. What, all of them? Luke asked. Apparently, that is exactly what you are seeing, form by said soberly. The Jerun remnant, all that remain of their people, packed into that single vessel. What happened? Jinsler asked. Form by shrugged. Apparently, their release from slavery by those aboard outbound flight came too late, he said. The Vigari had already caused too much damage to their world for it to continue to support life. Like the Kamasai, Luke murmured. Or the Nogri. I'm not familiar with those peoples, Formby said. At any rate, in the end, after plagues and starvation, they had no choice but to leave. Even now they search for a new world where they may live again in peace. That's terrible, Jinsler murmured. Can you help them? Perhaps, Formby said. A delegation will come aboard presently to examine some of our star charts. Perhaps we can find an uninhabited world outside Chis territory where they can settle. I take it General Drask isn't too pleased with that? Jinsler asked. He's not pleased at all, Formby agreed with a wry smile. Though to be honest, he's not pleased to have all you humans aboard either. But in the end, my counsel prevailed. What about their request to visit outbound flight? Luke asked. We'll allow their vessel to accompany us to the edge of the cluster where the remains are located, Formby said. At that point, I may need to have another discussion with General Drask. Still, I'm sure at least a small delegation of their people will be continuing on with us. What exactly do they want there? Jinsler asked. Formed by side. To pay their respects to those who saved them, he said. To say their final farewells. It was all Mara could do to keep from jerking backward. The sudden flood of emotion that erupted from Jinsler's mind was like a stunned burst from a blaster rifle. She looked at him sharply. But aside from a twitching muscle in his cheek, his face showed nothing of the sudden anguish and heartache that had been triggered by Formby's comment. To pay their respects. To say their final farewells. At any rate, with all now assembled, we may finally proceed. Formby continued. Fisa will show you to your personal quarters, Master Skywalker. Thank you, Luke said. He looked at Mara, a question in his eyes. Again, there was a sour taste in Mara's mouth. But there'd been something in Jinsler's silent burst of emotion that had touched a part of her she hadn't even known was there. Or perhaps she had. Perhaps it was her own past as the Emperor's hand, and her own reluctance to talk about it, that his presence had brought to mind. She took a deep breath, caught the expectation in Luke and the quiet dread in Jinsler as she did so. Both of them knew exactly what she was about to say. Both of them were wrong. I thank you as well, Aristocra Formby, she said. We'll look forward to spending more time with you. She had the minor satisfaction of catching the surprise from both men at her comment. You're quite welcome, Formby said, oblivious to what was going on beneath the surface. We shall meet again in a few hours. There will be a reception dinner. Fisa will meet you at your quarters shortly beforehand to escort you there. I will then introduce you to the rest of the vessel's officers and diplomatic staff. Thank you, Aristocra, Luke said. We'll look forward to both the dinner and the meetings. Yes, Mara agreed, looking pointedly at Jinsler. 
and I'm sure we'll have a chance there to talk more fully, Ambassador. Because she would find out about this man, she promised herself as Fisa led them back down the curving corridor. She would find out about him, and she would find out the reason he was here. And she would do so before they reached outbound flight. Guaranteed. The quarters Fisa took them to were small but well laid out, with a compact conversation area as well as the usual sleeping room and refresher station. Not bad, Luke commented as he looked around. A lot roomier than some shipboard berths I've been put up in. Yes, Mara said, watching the door slide shut behind her, her thoughts still on Jinsler and his disturbing emotional reaction. You're not even looking at it, Luke said, stepping through an archway into the bedroom and flopping backward onto the bed. Let me guess. Jinsler? Since when does a Jedi Master have to guess? Mara asked dryly trying to shake away the questions long enough for at least a perfunctory glance around the room. Overall, the decor was simple, as one would expect of shipboard accommodations. But at the same time it had the small touches of elegance that showed someone had put thought and care into it. The Chiss, apparently, took their host's responsibilities seriously. Even Jedi Masters sometimes have trouble sorting through a plate of prunchy noodles. Luke countered just as dryly. That's about what you're looking like right now. What an appetizing image, Mara said. And with dinner, she looked at the chrono on the wall. Still almost three hours away. Maybe there's a cantina aboard where I could get a snack. You want to talk about it? Luke asked. She shrugged. I don't think he's a con man, she said. Too emotionally connected to the whole thing. I can't see him acting as an agent for someone else, either, for the same reason. I suppose. I meant you. Luke interrupted her gently. Your reaction. Mara grimaced. One of the minuses of having a Jedi husband was that you were never completely alone. I don't know, she confessed. There was just something in Formby's comment about paying respects that got to me somehow. Any idea why? Not really. She looked around the room, a small shiver running through her. Or maybe it has to do with this place. Going back to Nirwin, and now the Chiss. And Thrawn? Maybe Thrawn, she agreed. Though I don't know why that should bother me so much. Luke didn't reply, but she could sense his invitation. Crossing the room, she lay down on the bed beside him. He slipped his arm around beneath her shoulders, and for a minute they just lay snuggled together, their minds and emotions wrapping around each other in much the same way. Maybe it's the Force, then, Luke suggested. Maybe there's something you need to work through, something you've been putting off or suppressing, and the time has come for you to deal with it. That's happened to me once or twice. I suppose, Mara said. I just wish the Force would pick a time when things are quieter if it's going to push me into something. She sensed his smile. Me too, he said. If you ever figure out how to schedule things that neatly, let me know. You'll be the first, she promised, reaching up to pat the hand around her shoulder. He caught her hand and held it. Until then, he said quietly, stroking her hand with his fingertips. Just remember that I'm here for you. For whatever you need from me. She squeezed his hand. I know, she said, feeling his warmth and strength and commitment flowing into her, flooding into the dark areas that Jinsler's emotions had opened in her. One of the pluses of having a Jedi husband, she thought contentedly was that you were never completely alone. They lay there together for a few minutes. Then, with a sigh, Mara forced her mind back to business. So, she said, what do you think of the rest of this setup? Well, it's definitely not as cheering as we might like, he said. 
Did you notice the way Formby looked when he came up after that talk with General Drask and Captain Talship? Mara thought back. She'd been concentrating mainly on Jinsler at the time, and all she could remember about Formby was his general expression. He looked tired, she said. It was more than that, Luke said. It was as if he just fought a battle and wasn't sure whether he'd won or lost. Hmm, Mara said, slightly annoyed at herself. Usually she was better at catching details like that. You think Drask and Talshib aren't happy about having all these aliens aboard a Chiss ship and are giving form by a hard time about it? They're certainly not happy about something, Luke said. Though it sounds to me like an aristocrat is higher in rank than a general. That's never stopped anyone else from complaining, Mara pointed out. And I've seen a higher-ranking person given just to shut the complainer up. So have I, Luke said. We'll want to keep an eye on things and see how Drask does as we go along. Uh-huh, Mara murmured. Tell me, do you think Drask might be annoyed enough about us to actually do something about it? Such as? Such as that accident with the cable in the reception room, Mara said. The timing there was almost too good to be coincidence. For a few seconds Luke didn't answer. Mara listened to the silence, watching the kaleidoscope of thought and emotion go through his mind as he examined the possibilities. I don't know, he said at last. It probably wouldn't have killed me even if it had hit me dead on. But it could easily have put me out of action for a time while I went into a healing trance. Which would have left me more or less on my own, Mara said. Alternatively, it might have given Drask an excuse to kick us off the mission completely. He would have had a tough job selling it, Luke pointed out. It's pretty clear Formby wants us along. Maybe, but at least it would have given him an added lever, Mara said. Abruptly, she came to a decision. I'll be back, she said, making sure her lightsaber was securely fastened to her belt as she headed for the door. Where are you going? Luke called after her, propping himself up on an elbow. Back to the reception room, Mara said. I want a closer look at that cable. You want me to come with you? Luke asked, starting to stand up. Better not, Mara said, shaking her head. One Jedi poking around is idle curiosity. Two of them is an official investigation. There's no point in adding fuel to Drask's fire. I suppose. Reluctantly, Luke sat back down on the bed. Whistle if you need any help. Of course, Mara said, giving him an innocent look. Don't I always? She managed to get out of the room before he could come up with a suitably sarcastic reply. The corridors back to the reception room were fairly quiet. Mara saw perhaps a dozen black uniformed chis on her way, and most of them pretty much ignored her. A few seemed interested or intrigued by her alien appearance but even that small handful said nothing as they passed by. Either the culture was just naturally polite, or else Formby had given strict instructions as to how his guests were to be treated. It was interesting, though, how much more of their emotional states she was able to pick up this time around. Back on Nirwin, during her first brush with groups of Chis, she'd barely even been able to sense their presence. Experience and practice apparently paid off in this area. Of course, back then she hadn't been a true Jedi either. Maybe that was part of the difference. Not surprisingly, the reception room was deserted when she reached it. Somewhat more surprising was the fact that the loose cable that had nearly hit Luke had already been reattached. She stood just inside the archway for a moment, eyeing the cable. It was nestled into a cable groove between the ceiling and the bulkhead, a good six meters off the deck. That wasn't an impossible jump for a Jedi, but a simple jump wouldn't accomplish very much. She needed to be able to sit there for a minute 
or two in order to examine the end where it had either broken or been cut. And as far as she knew, even Jetta couldn't hover in midair. But there might be another approach. Formby had said that the reception area could be automatically reconfigured and decorated for arriving guests. It took a minute for her to find the control panel, set into the bulkhead just inside the archway and hidden behind a plate colored the same neutral gray as the rest of the paneling. The controls consisted of a dozen buttons, each labeled with an alien mark. Experimentally, she pushed one of them. Smoothly, and in complete silence, the room began to change. A dozen wall sections of various sizes and shapes began to swing outward, exposing intricate symbols or painted patterns on their other sides, then settled back against the bulkheads with the patterns now showing. Parts of the ceiling likewise swung free to hang like flags or else began to lower as rectangular or circular columns to various heights, leaving the room with a sort of stylized stalactite look. The deck itself underwent the most dramatic changes. Instead of large panels flipping or rotating or otherwise changing, tiny lights that had hitherto been invisible came to life, forming intricate spirals and patterns of color. As she watched, the patterns altered, giving a sense of water flowing from the hatchway over to the arch. A minute later, it was finished. Mara looked around at the entirely new room that had appeared impressed in spite of herself, wondering which level of Chiss official could command this particular brand of welcome. She tried two more buttons in turn. Each time, she noted, the room went back to neutral before changing into its new configuration. Unfortunately, none of the changes did anything with the cable she wanted to examine. Through it all, that particular edge of ceiling stayed where it was, with the cable remaining firmly out of reach which meant she was going to have to be clever. She went back to the first button she tried, studying the positions of the swinging wall panels and lowering ceiling columns and counting off the seconds to herself. It would just be possible, she decided. And in her philosophy, anything that was possible might as well be tried. She put the room back into neutral and prepared herself for action. One Jedi poking around is idle curiosity, she told Luke. She wondered if Formby would really take it that way if he caught her. Taking a deep breath, she touched the button and ran. She caught the lowermost of the panels before it had swung more than a few degrees open, leaping up and grabbing its top edge with her fingertips. Her first fear, that it would break off under her weight and dump her ignominiously onto the deck, didn't happen. She didn't give it the chance to change its mind either, but quickly pulled herself partway up and then shoved off it, lunging toward the next panel a meter to her right. She caught the top of this one about a quarter of the way open, again pulled herself up, and again shoved off for the next in the climbing pattern she'd worked out. By the time her last stepping stone panel was about to swing closed, she was where she needed to be. Pushing off one final time, she leapt across a meter and a half of empty space and wrapped her arms around the side of the nearest of the lowered ceiling columns. For a moment she just hung there, catching her breath and stretching out to the force to draw renewed strength into her muscles. The column's texture was rough enough for a good grip and, like the wall panels, seemed perfectly capable of handling her weight. Getting a grip on the lower part of the column with her knees, she started up. The going wasn't particularly easy, but the thought of some chiss wandering in and catching her hanging up here like an oversized minic added motivation to the climb. Halfway up, she reached another column and switched to a back and feet chimney style ascent. Reaching the top, she grabbed on to one of the flag like ceiling sections that was now hanging straight down. Using it as a pivot point, she swung over to a column hanging down in the corner. And with that, she finally had a close-up view of the rogue cable. She squinted at it, wishing she'd thought to bring a light. The room itself was well lit, but the end where the cable had been reattached to its connector was inconveniently lying in shadow from the ceiling column she was hanging on to. Still, a Jedi was never entirely without resources. 
Looking awkwardly over her shoulder toward her waist, she reached out through the force and unhooked her lightsaber from her belt. Levitating it carefully, she maneuvered it over to the corner, turning the handle over so that the blade would be pointing safely downward. Then, eyeing the stud, she ignited it. The snap hiss somehow sounded louder than usual in the corner of a quiet room. The lightsaber didn't put out all that much light, but it was enough. The cable had not, in fact, been cut, which had been her first suspicion. On the other hand, the connection appeared to be a double screw type linkage, which was almost impossible for vibration or tension to work loose. So how had it come apart? Moving the lightsaber as close to the connection as she could without risking damage, she peered at it. On the side of the cable, just above the connector, was a slight indentation. Lifting her gaze to the ceiling itself, she spotted a small round opening above and to the right of the groove. Adjusting her grip on the column, she freed one hand and gingerly extended a finger into the opening. Nothing. She moved the finger around in a circle inside the opening, searching for the machinery or electronic connectors or heat radiator vanes that should naturally be behind any opening on a ship. Or rather, the equipment that should be behind any opening that was part of a ship's actual design. The lack of anything up there strongly implied that this particular hole had been put in as an afterthought. She was still working through the possibilities when a flicker of sensation touched her mind. Instantly, she closed down the lightsaber, shutting off its gentle hum. In the sudden silence, she could hear footsteps coming her way. Several sets, by the sound, but in too close a step to be Chiss on a casual stroll around the ship. This group was definitely military. And here she was, trapped in a compromising position six meters in midair. She looked around her biting back an old curse from her days with the Empire. The column she was hanging on to was the only cover anywhere within reach. Problem was, she was hanging on the wrong side of it, in full view of the room below. She would have to work her way around to the wall side if she was going to have any chance of concealment, and from the speed those footsteps were approaching, she wasn't likely to have enough time. Reaching out her free hand, she grabbed her lightsaber and re-established a firm two-armed, two-need grip on the column. Then, moving as quickly as she could, she started maneuvering herself around toward the far side. She was almost halfway around when the intruders marched in beneath the archway. She froze in place, shifting her gaze downward to look. As she did so, her heart seemed to turn to stone. Those weren't Chiss soldiers sent by General Drass to hunt her down. They weren't even Chiss soldiers on routine patrol, searching for suspicious activities. There were five figures below her, standing just inside the reception room in a loose box formation. The one in the center was a human male, young-looking, wearing a gray imperial uniform modified with rings of red and black trim on the collar and cuffs. The other four were Imperial Stormtroopers. Chapter 5 Mara stared down at the Stormtroopers, a sudden flood of memories whipping around her like stones and debris in a hurricane-strength wind. She'd worked with Stormtroopers many times through the years she served Palpatine as his Emperor's hand. She'd ordered them to do her bidding. Occasionally, she'd led small groups of them on special missions. She'd stood by and watched as they killed. It was impossible. It had to be. The elite cadre of stormtroopers was all but extinct, wiped out in the long war against the Empire. Most of the cloning tanks used to create them so many years ago were gone, too, tracked down and destroyed so that no one else would ever again unleash such a terrible wave of death and destruction upon the galaxy. And yet there they were. It wasn't an illusion, or a fraud, or a twisting of her own memories. They stood like stormtroopers, they held their Blastechi 11 blaster rifles like stormtroopers, they wore stormtrooper armor. The stormtroopers were back. The young Imperial was looking around the room, 
his hand resting on the belted DH-17 blaster pistol riding his hip. One of the stormtroopers murmured something, and he looked up. Ah, he called. His voice sounded young, too. There you are, Jedi Skywalker. Are you all right? With a supreme effort, Mara found her voice. Sure, she called back. No problem. Why? He seemed a bit taken aback. We heard the sound of a lightsaber being activated, he said. With a Jedi, that usually means there's trouble. Trouble for whom? Mara asked pointedly. Just trouble in general. The Imperials seem better on balance now. Do you need any help getting down from there? Who said I wanted to come down? Mara countered. He snorted under his breath, and Mara caught a hint of annoyance. Fine, he said. Have it your way. I just thought you might be interested in talking, that's all. About? About what you're doing up there, for starters, the young man said. Maybe we could discuss this whole crazy mission, too. She frowned, stretching out with the force. It was hard to read a stranger, especially at this distance. But as near as she could tell he seemed sincere. Though she'd concluded the same thing about Jinsler, and had already decided how much simple sincerity was worth. Still, if these Imperials were out to kill her, the simplest time to try it had already passed. And if she and they were on the same side, comparing cards might not be a bad idea. Fine she said. I was mostly done anyway. You need any help? No, thanks, Mara said, setting her teeth as it occurred to her that there was perhaps one more tactical advantage he was waiting for before ordering his stormtroopers to open fire. Time for a small calculated risk. On second thought, you can hold my lightsaber for me. Here, catch. She tossed it toward him. The young man stepped forward and deftly caught it. There was no shout of triumph as he held her only defensive weapon in his hand. More importantly, none of the stormtroopers raised his Blostek and started shooting. She started breathing again. So they really didn't mean any mischief. At least, not yet. Okay, she called. Stand clear. She shifted her gaze to the control panel in the corridor behind them and stretched out with the force, activating one of the buttons. Once again, the room began to reconfigure. Mara swung herself over to one of the other columns as hers retracted toward the ceiling, then pushed off and down to grab hold of a swinging wall panel. A brief pause to catch her balance, and she jumped down to the next one in line. Three panels later, she landed on the deck. Thanks, she said, stretching out her hand to the Imperial, her senses alert for a last-second betrayal. But he merely handed over her lightsaber, most of his attention on the room itself. Impressive, he commented as the room hit neutral and then began shifting into the mode Mara had keyed it for. Instant redecoration, whenever the mood strikes you. It's a little more functional than that, Mara said. Up close, he looked even younger than he had from the ceiling, no older than his mid-twenties. Like a kid playing soldier, the irreverent thought struck her. Didn't Formby explain it to you? Or didn't you get one of these rooms when you came in? We haven't talked to Formby much, the young man said. Or any of the other chiss. We've been trying to keep a low profile since we came aboard. He smiled tightly. I don't think General Drask is exactly thrilled by our presence here. General Drask doesn't seem very easy to thrill, Mara said. Stepping past the group to the control panel, she keyed the room back to its original neutral mode. So, she said, turning back to face them. You going to tell me who you are? Or do I have to guess? Oh, I'm sorry. He stiffened to full attention. 
I'm Commander Chuck Fell, Warrior of the Hand. You may remember meeting my father a couple of years ago. Very well, Mara said, smiling tightly at the memory. I'm sure General Baron Fell remembers me, as well. With the greatest respect and admiration, Fell assured her. He asked me to send you his greetings, and to tell you he still has hopes that you'll bring your talents to the Empire of the Hand someday. Thanks, but I've had my fill of Imperial service, Mara told him. Any Imperial service? So you knew I was going to be here? I hoped you would be, Fell said. Admiral Park told me you and Master Skywalker had been invited, though he wasn't sure you'd be willing or able to come. He didn't let you know we'd contacted him a few days ago? No, Fell said. Of course, we were already on our way. Maybe he didn't think it was worth recalling us at that point. Which brings us to the rest of your party, Mara said, looking at the silent stormtroopers. Oh, yes. Fell waved a hand to encompass his escort. This is Unit Oryx-7 of the Imperial 501st Stormtrooper Legion. Mara felt her stomach tightening. The Imperial 501st, Vader's personal stormtrooper unit during the rebellion. Dubbed Vader's Fist, its very arrival in a star system had often caused rebel forces and corrupt Imperial officials alike to run for cover. Non-humans of every sort, even innocent bystanders, quickly learned to tremble at the sight of those white armored face masks. The Emperor's bias against aliens had impressed itself indelibly onto the combat psychology of all his stormtrooper legions, but even more so on the soldiers of the 501st. And so, of course, that was the specific unit Park had revived for his Empire of the Hand. That said a lot right there as to how the Admiral was running things. I guess the old saying is right, she said stiffly. The one about old units never really dying. Fell shrugged noncommittally. So what exactly were you doing up there? Mara glanced around. Still no chis in sight, but that wouldn't last forever. Not here, she told Fell. Follow me. Turning her back on them, she headed down the corridor. A moment later, without complaint or question, they had formed up behind her. The force connection between her and Luke wasn't nearly as clear and precise as most people in the New Republic thought, as if it were a mental calm link conversation. He became aware of her approach as she neared their quarters, and she could tell he was also aware that she was bringing company. But it wasn't until he opened the door for her that he realized just what kind of company it was. As usual, he recovered quickly. Hello, he said calmly, nodding and greeting. I'm Luke Skywalker. Commander Chuck Fell, Fell said, nodding in return. This is my escort guard, Unit Oryx-7 of the 501st. Mara caught Luke's flicker of recognition at the name and the unit designation. But he merely nodded again. Honored commander, he said. Won't you come in?
There's no room for everybody. And I'd just as soon not have drafts people see stormtroopers hanging around outside our quarters. Good point. Fell agreed, giving the stormtroopers a hand signal. Return to the ship. Acknowledged, one of them said in that flat, mechanically filtered voice that was one of the marks of a stormtrooper. Turning in perfect unison, they marched away. No, Mara said, waving fell toward the conversation area as the door slid shut behind him. Let's start with you, Commander. What are you doing here? I thought I'd explain that, Fell said, lowering himself into one of the chairs. Admiral Park wasn't sure you'd be coming, so he sent me to act as his representative. And Formby went along with it. Mara asked, sitting down beside Luke across from the young Imperial. Fell shrugged. Actually, Formby didn't seem to have a problem. As I said, it was mostly General Drask who objected. He doesn't seem too happy with our presence either, Luke told him. Or Ambassador Ginsler's, Mara added, watching Fell closely. But there was no bump of reaction at the mention of Ginsler's name. Yes, I've noticed, Fell said. Frankly, I don't think Drass likes anyone. Certainly not aliens. Possibly not even formed by. So why did Park send you and a bunch of stormtroopers instead of coming himself? Mara asked. The way Formby talks about it, you think outbound flight was the diplomatic high point of the year? Or does Park just like irritating Chiss generals? Not a hobby I'd like, Fell said. There was a flicker of something. Actually, I really don't know why we're here. Liar. Mara didn't have to look at Luke to know he'd caught it, too. All right. Luke said, not giving any hint that they'd caught Fell's prevarication. Let's try this, then. Why didn't Park mention you when he talked to us? Fell shook his head. I don't know that, either. I more or less assumed he had. That one, at least, did seem to be the truth. But then, Mara began. Just a moment. Fell said, cutting her off with a lifted finger. I've answered a whole batch of questions. It's your turn now. What were you doing climbing around the ceiling of the entry chamber that way? Mara had already decided there was no point in playing coy with this one. If Fell was involved in the cable incident, he already knew what had happened. If not, there was no reason for him not to know. There was a small accident when we first arrived, she said. A heavy cable attached to the ceiling came loose and nearly knocked my husband across the room. Fell's eyes shifted to Luke, gave him a quick once-over. No, it missed me, Luke assured him. But as Mara said, it was close. I wanted to see if the cable might have been deliberately cut, Mara continued. It had already been put back up, so that's where I had to go to look at it. What did you find? Fell asked. No evidence that it had been cut, but it also shouldn't have come loose by itself, Mara said. Still, I did find indentations on the end like you might get if it had been held in a spring clip for a while. Um, Fell murmured thoughtfully as if someone had had it already disconnected and held in a clip, so that they could release it at just the right time. Unless they swapped out the entire cable? Mara shook her head. I marked the original with my lightsaber before we left the area, she told him. Just a nick in the insulation, but visible enough if you know where to look. No, it was the same cable. So you suspect it was a deliberate attack framed to look like an accident, Fell said. Just as well, he broke off. Just as well what? Mara demanded. Fell reddened. I'm sorry, he said. I wasn't supposed to tell you. 
Admiral Park sent us along because he thought you might be in danger on this trip. He smiled self-consciously. We're sort of your escort. Mara looked at Luke, saw her same surprise mirrored there. Unlike hers, though, his surprise had a touch of amusement to it. Very kind of Admiral Park, Mara said tartly. You can tell him thanks on your way out. Now, Jedi Skywalker. Don't Jedi Skywalker me, Mara retorted. We don't want a bunch of stormtroopers clattering along behind us everywhere we go. Drask is already glowering more than I like. So climb aboard whatever shuttle you came in on and get out. Fell looked pained. I'm afraid it's not as easy as that, he said. Yes, we're here to protect you. Which we don't need. No, I agree completely, Fell said. The idea of us protecting Jedi, but at the same time, I'm under Imperial orders, not yours. Besides, Formby has already given them permission to come along, Luke pointed out. So what? Mara demanded. Luke shrugged. You and I were wondering if Formby was using this mission as a pretext for opening full diplomatic relations with the New Republic, he reminded her. Maybe he's looking to do the same thing with the Empire of the Hand. What makes you think Park even wants diplomatic relations with the Chiss? Mara countered. We do, Fell said quietly. Very much. Mara glared at him. There are a hundred different threats out there that would freeze your blood if you knew about them. All right, fine, she said between clenched teeth. This isn't my ship. You want to hang around, fine. Just don't get in our way. Understood, Fell said. Do you want me to start any inquiries as to who aboard might have wanted Master Skywalker injured? Absolutely not, Mara said. We'll handle that. You just stay in the background and keep quiet. Fell smiled slightly. As you wish, he said, getting to his feet. If you'll excuse me, then I'll return to our transport and prepare for dinner. We'll see you there, Luke said. Good talking with you. Fell crossed to the door, opened it, and left. Great, Mara growled. Just what we needed. Our own private entourage. Oh, I don't know, Luke said soothingly. It's no worse than a group of nobri following us around. Of course it's worse, Mara retorted. Nobri at least know how to be invisible. You ever see a stormtrooper who wasn't as obvious as a Wookiee at a formal dinner? Well, they're here, and we might as well get used to it, Luke said. Now, what about this cable? She wasn't really finished ranting about Fell yet, but she was practical enough to realize there were higher priority matters that needed to be dealt with. There was also a hole bored in the ceiling where the spring clip would have come through to hold the cable. So it could have been handled by remote control? Easily, Mara said. Which means Drask himself might have been the one to trigger it. Or Fisa, Luke pointed out. She was in the best position to handle the timing. I thought she was Formby's assistant, though, Mara pointed out. Formby's the one who wants us aboard. Does he? Luke asked. Or is he under orders from above that he himself doesn't necessarily agree with? Point, Mara conceded, frowning as she thought back to their encounters with the Aristocra. I don't know, though. He seemed genuinely pleased to have us here. Yes, but there's something else going on below the surface, Luke said. Some extra tension he's trying to hide. Of course, that could be nothing more than the fact he's having to deal with so many aliens. 
possibly with the future of the whole Chis diplomatic structure hanging on how well he does. That could be part of it, Luke agreed. So if we leave Formby off the list, who's left? Drask? Who's left is basically everyone except the Jeruns, Mara said. And only because they weren't here at the time. It could have been Drask, Jinsler, or Fell and his group. She snorted. The 501st. Can you imagine Park reviving that one? I guess old units die hard. Luke shrugged, a little too casually. Old units aren't the only thing, he murmured. What was that? Mara asked suspiciously. I was just noticing how easily you slipped into the role of Imperial Commander a few minutes ago, Luke said. You led them here, you ordered the stormtroopers away, and you basically told Fel what you wanted him to do. So? Mara said with a shrug of her own. Since when have I been shy about telling anyone what I wanted them to do? I'm just pointing out how comfortably you took back that role, that's all. I'm not saying anything else. You'd better not be, Mara said darkly. But whether he said it or not, she could sense there was something else behind his words. Something not entirely comfortable with the way she'd behaved. Her first impulse was to have it out right now, to insist that he bring his thoughts on the subject out into the open where she would have the chance to knock them down one by one. But something held her back. Perhaps she sensed it wasn't the proper time or place for that kind of discussion. Or perhaps she wasn't so sure she could knock them all down. He was right in a way. She had found it disturbingly easy to slip back into that role. It had been refreshing to deal with soldiers who took orders without question, instead of a mixed group of humans and Bahans and Deveronians and Mon Calis, all of whom had their own prejudices and perspectives and who sometimes heard or obeyed orders in entirely different ways. I've had my fill of imperial service, she told Fell. But had she? Really? Anyway, we should probably go back to the Jade Saber and see if we've got anything that'll pass as formal wear, Luke went on. Apparently, he didn't want to have it out yet either. Dinner's going to be served soon, and we'll want to be ready when Fisa comes to get us. Chapter 6 after the size of the reception room, Luke had expected the Chaff Envoy's main dining salon to be equally grand and expansive. To his surprise, it was in fact built more along the lines of a standard ship's wardroom, though decorated with the same sort of elegant touches he'd already noted in their quarters. Apparently, once the high-level dignitaries had been ushered aboard in proper style, the pomp and ceremony diminished considerably. Perhaps the dignitaries' wardrobes were supposed to make up for it. Formby and Drask were dressed even more elaborately than they had been at the Jade Saber's landing, though each maintained the same color scheme he'd been wearing then. Fell had switched to a dress uniform that bordered on the regal, with much of the tunic's upper left covered with rows of colored bits of metal that apparently denoted specific campaigns or victories. Jinsler had done equally well, with a layered robe tunic that would have fit right in with a diplomatic reception on Coruscant. Mara wasn't too far behind him, with her flowing wraparound gown and embroidered bolero jacket. It made Luke feel decidedly out of place in his plain dark jumpsuit and sleeveless, knee-length duster. Next trip, he made a mental note, he was going to have to make sure to bring a couple of fancier outfits along. Still, he was far from being the worst-dressed guest at the party. The two druids on the far side of the wide circular table looked positively shabby in comparison with the Chiss staffers seated on either side of them. Both aliens wore simple but heavy-looking brown robes of some kind of thick material over long tan tunics. One of them. The Jeroen who had spoken to Formby from the refugee ship 
also had what appeared to be a complete dead animal thrown over his shoulders, its long snout head and clawed forepaws hanging down across his chest nearly to his waist, while most of the torso and hind legs hung down behind his back. An elaborate blue and gold collar glittered around the animal's neck, about the only real decoration anywhere in the Jerun's outfit. I trust the food is pleasing? Fisa asked from her seat at Luke's left. It's excellent, thank you, he assured her. In actual fact, it was a little too spice-heavy for his taste, and the combination fork-knife he'd been given to use left an oddly metallic aftertaste after each bite. But it was so clearly an attempt to create a new republic, style banquet that he certainly wasn't going to quibble over minor details. More than once, he wondered if Park had supplied the recipes. Interesting trophy Stuart Bearish is wearing, Jinsler commented from Fisa's other side. That dead animal thing? The wolf kill, yes, Fisa said, nodding. I heard Stuart Bearish say they were a feral variant of a predator creature the Jeruns once domesticated as pets. The one he wears is a mark of honor that has been in his family for four generations. Pets, huh? Jinsler shook his head. Frankly, I don't think I'd even like to meet it in the woods, let alone have it curled up by my bed. I doubt that will happen soon, Fisa said, a note of sadness in her voice. All remaining wolf kills died with the Jurin world. I see, Jinsler murmured, and again Luke caught a flicker of emotion from him. For all his surface calm, he was clearly a man who felt things deeply. A terrible tragedy, that. Was Aristocra formed by able to help them find a new world? Our knowledge of the regions outside our borders is very limited, Fisa said. I don't believe anything suitable was found. I hope the Aristocra isn't giving up this quickly, Jinsler said, a note of challenge in his voice. They couldn't have had more than a couple of hours to study your star charts. Perhaps more study will be scheduled, Fisa said diplomatically. Aristocra Chafo Arambintrano has not told me his plans. Across the table Bear stirred and looked over at Luke, linking his fingers and dipping both hands and head in a sort of unified bow. Luke nodded in reply, and as he did, the Jeroen picked up his fluted drink glass and got up from his seat. Circling the table, he came up behind Luke. Good evening, he said, the words coming out from both his mouths. Am I correct in the belief that you are Jedi Master Luke Skywalker? Luke blinked in surprise. Back in the command center, he'd only heard the Jeroen speak in the Chiss trade language. Yes, I am, he managed. Please forgive my surprise. I didn't realize you spoke basic. The Jeroen opened his mouth slightly, showing a double row of small teeth in each. A smile? Should we not know at least a portion of the language of our liberators? He countered. It was we who were surprised to learn that the Chiss aboard this vessel could understand it. Yes, they do, Luke agreed, feeling suddenly like a hopeless bumpkin who'd just been dropped off the band of cart at the edge of town. He understood probably a dozen languages, but all were anchored solidly to the cultures that dominated the core worlds and inner rim. It had never even occurred to him to try to add an outer rim trade language to his repertoire. Which now meant that everyone else out here was having to go out of their way to accommodate his shortcomings. But then, to be fair, this was hardly a situation he would normally have expected to find himself in. At least not without C-3PO or some other protocol droid along to assist with language duties. It is their way of honoring those of outbound flight, no doubt, Bersh said, a note of reverence in his voice. If I may intrude, I overheard you and Fisa speaking of our search for a world for our people. Yes, Luke confirmed. I hope you will succeed. As do I and all the Jurun remnant. Bersh said, a note of sadness replacing the reverence. 
That is indeed why I came across to see you. I hoped you might be willing to help. In what way? Bersh waved his hand, nearly spilling his drink in the process. I am told your new republic has great resources and vast territories within its borders. Perhaps when you are finished with your meal you would be kind enough to search your records to see if any of your worlds near this region of space might be available for our use. He ducked his head. We would of course pay for any world you might find to offer us. Our resources are small, but all Jerun stand ready to serve with their hands and minds and bodies until any such debt is repaid. If we find a suitable world, I'm sure something can be worked out. Luke assured him. Actually, I'm finished now if you'd like to accompany me to my ship. The Jerun started back. You would take me aboard your vessel? He breathed. Would that be a problem? Luke asked cautiously, wondering if he'd made some terrible mistake in etiquette. Were the Jeruns afraid of strangers and strange ships? And yet they were here, aboard a chis ship. Because if it would make you uncomfortable. Ah, uh, no. Bersh said, dropping suddenly onto one knee and bowing his head low to the deck. This time some of his drink did slosh up over the rim and dribbled down over his fingers. It is too much. There is too much honor for one Jiren. I cannot accept. Maybe I should just give you the data cards then, Luke suggested. Though you might not be able to read them he added as that thought belatedly struck him. I'd have to bring a data pad along, too. You would be willing to allow us to honor you? Bersh asked eagerly. You would come aboard our humble vessel? Certainly, Luke said, touching his mouth with his napkin and standing up. Shall we go? The honor is great, Bersh said, bowing repeatedly as he stepped back. The honor is great. You're welcome, Luke said, feeling decidedly awkward. The sooner he got himself and his groveling Jerun out of here, the better. He turned to Mara, who was practically radiating her amusement at his fumbling. I'll see you back at our quarters, he told her, sending her a silent warning with his eyes that she ignored completely. If you need me, I'll be in the Jerun's shuttle. Understood, Mara said blandly. At least her voice was polite enough. I'll see you later. Have fun. Thanks, Luke growled, turning back to the still bobbing Jurun. And Leia made this diplomatic stuff look so easy. Lead the way, Steward Bersh. The Jurun shuttle, as it turned out, was docked on the starboard side of the chaff envoy about twenty meters aft of the jade saber. Luke ducked into the saber as they passed and grabbed a set of astrogation data cards and a data pad, then followed Bersh back to their ship. Twenty-two years before, back at the Mose Isley spaceport, he could remember gazing at the Millennium Falcon and wondering how a ship that looked like that could even be permitted to fly the Imperial space lanes. Now his first reaction to the Jerun shuttle was that such thoughts had done the Falcon a disservice. Not only should this thing not be flying, he couldn't see how it even could be flying. The entire interior was a patchwork of repaired, reworked, or readapted equipment, patched pipes and conduits, and power cables that would have had a new Republic safety inspector scrambling for emergency cutoff switches. Two of the bunk rooms and a storage compartment had been sealed off with vacuum leak warnings on the doors, and half the displays on the control deck seemed to have been permanently shut down. Overlaying it all was a faint odor that seemed to be a mixture of lubricating compound, battery solution, maneuvering fuel, and hydraulic fluid. It was, Luke thought more than once, astonishing that the thing had managed to make it here from the main Jurand ship. Or perhaps the chaff envoy had a really good set of tractor beams. There were three other Jeruns in the ship when he and Bersh arrived, 
and it was quickly evident that the steward's adulation in the dining salon had actually been greatly restrained. The other Jeruns clustered around him practically from the moment he ducked through the rusty hatchway, blathering excitedly, and repeating over and over again how much of an honor it was to have him aboard, until he was about as embarrassed as he'd ever been in his life. Several times he tried gently to explain that he wasn't really someone who deserved such adulation. But all it did was inspire fresh salvos of praise even more insistent and pathetic than what had gone before. Eventually, he gave up. Whatever those aboard outbound flight had done for these people, it was so deeply ingrained that even after fifty years there was no holding it back. All he could do was endure it, try not to let it go to his head, and hope they would eventually run out of adjectives. All right, he said when they had finally quieted down enough to sit around a small table together. I've pulled all the information I have on outer rim systems. Just bear in mind that a lot of these systems aren't members of the New Republic, and a lot more give only token allegiance. But if we can help you, we will. Now, what sort of world exactly are you looking for? One with air like this, Bersh said, waving a hand around him. Less full and flavorful than the Chiss air. Probably meant a lower oxygen content, Luke decided. Okay, he said, keying that parameter into the data pad. I presume you need water too. What about climate and terrain? We need places for the children to play, one of the other Jurons put in eagerly. Many places for many children to play. Peace, young one, Bersh soothed his mouth opening in another toothy Jerun smile. On an entire world, there will be plenty of places for the children. He turned back to Luke. You must excuse us, Dash, he said quietly. He has never known life anywhere but within our vessel. I understand, Luke said. I can tell your people put great store in your children, too. How do you know that? Bersh asked, his face puckering oddly. Then it cleared. Ah, of course. The great and renowned powers of the Jedi. Actually, there was nothing special needed on this one, Luke said. We saw your earlier conversation with the Chiss. Any people who would put a playground right in their command center must certainly care a lot for their children. Ah, Bersh said. Yes. Our vessel was originally built for scientific surveys. That space was designed to contain the Center for Instrument Responses. His face puckered again. It was the only place large enough for a proper play and exercise area. All the rest of the vessel is composed of small rooms for the singles and families. We had no need for the instruments, so we took them out and gave the space to the children. He straightened his head and shoulders, his eyes unfocusing as if gazing into the future. But one day, he said firmly, one day we will have a real place for the children. And then you will see, Jedi Master Skywalker, what the Jerun people can become. I'll look forward to it, Luke promised. Now about terrain? Bersh seemed to come back from his dreams. We will live in whatever grounds you find for us, he said. Mountains or lakes, woodlands or plains, it does not matter. All right, Luke said. They certainly weren't a picky lot. What about temperature ranges? Again, Bersh waved his hand. The temperature in this vessel is somewhat warm for us, he said. But we will adapt and adjust to whatever. He broke off as the deck beneath them gave a sudden gentle jolt. What was that? Estash asked fearfully, looking quickly around. A second later they had their answer as a distant thunderclap echoed faintly through the open hatchway. An explosion, Luke told him, jumping to his feet and sprinting toward the entry tunnel, stretching out to the force as he pulled out his comlink. The opposite side of the ship, 
he estimated from the sudden surge of consternation in that direction, somewhere in the aft quarter. Mara? We've got an explosion and fire on the aft port side. Her voice came back. I'm heading back to see if I can help. I'll join you, Luke said, clearing the end of the entry tunnel and heading for the nearest cross-ship corridor. Any idea what's back there? Fell's transport, for one thing, Mara told him. No idea what else, but from the way Drass took off I'd guess something serious. Vital equipment, or possibly fuel storage. Luke winced. Right. See you there. The air began to smell of smoke before he was halfway down the main port side corridor. He kept going, and then, suddenly, he was there, breaking to a halt behind a dozen chis with handheld extinguishers running into a half-open door through which smoke was pouring. He spotted Mara off to one side with Fell and eased his way past the chis in military dress uniform shouting orders in a sharp, staccato language. Situation? He called to Mara. The fire's right by a nexus of maneuvering jets and their fuel supply, she told him grimly. She'd stripped off her fancy jacket and gown, and was dressed now only in the gray combat leotard and soft boots she'd been wearing underneath the formal wear. The stormtroopers are already inside with extinguishers, trying to keep it away from the tanks. Luke looked over at Fell. The young Imperial was wearing a stormtrooper's headset comm link, an intense expression on his face as he stared through the open door. Don't they have automatic extinguisher systems? He asked. They used to, Mara said. Apparently, a malfunction in the system was what caused the explosion in the first place. That's useful, Luke said, blinking back tears as the acrid smoke stung his eyes. Some of the Chiss who had gone into the fire zone were starting to come out now, most of them staggering slightly as they trailed plumes of smoke. How come the stormtroopers are in there? They were the first ones on the scene with self-contained breathing equipment, Fell said before Mara could answer. Speaking of breathing, how are Jedi in oxygen-poor atmospheres? We can handle a few minutes, Luke said. Less if there's a lot of physical or mental exertion involved. What do you need? Some delicate lightsaber work. Fell pointed to the doorway through which the smoke was pouring. They've got the fuel tanks isolated for the moment, but the fire's got too much of a head start, and it's pushing in on them. They think they've located the extinguisher system. They think? That's why the work needs to be delicate. Fell said. Otherwise, they'd just blast the lines open and be done with it. What we need is for you to lightly scratch the conduits, just enough to let out a few drops so we can see exactly what kind of liquid's inside. The last thing we want is to dump more fuel or something else flammable. No kidding, Mara said. Assuming they're right, then what? Then you cut them all the way open. Fell said. It looks like the explosion only warped the area around the main spray valves, so if you can open the lines behind them we should be able to flood the compartment and put it out in short order. Luke looked over at the dress uniform Chiss, now huddled with a pair of crewers strapping on air tanks and breather masks. Protocol, he knew, probably dictated that they clear this with one of the ship's officers before going in but the officer looked too busy to listen to passengers. And if the fire was already getting close to the fuel tanks. All right, he said, coming to a decision. How do I find the conduit? How do we find it? Mara corrected, her lightsaber already in hand. Mara. Don't even think it, she warned. Besides, I'm better with delicate work than you are. Unfortunately, she was right. With an effort, Luke forced back his instinctive reaction to shield her from danger wherever possible. Fine, he said. 
How do we find the conduit? They'll guide you in, Fell told him. Watch for a bright light. Right. Unhooking his lightsaber from his belt, Luke took a deep breath and stretched out to the force. He lifted his eyebrows at Mara, got her confirming nod, and ducked through the doorway. The smoke was considerably thicker inside the room than Luke had expected, swirling madly around as the compartment's venting system tried its best to clear it away. Ahead through another half-open door, he could see the blaze of the fire, the crackling of flames punctuated by the hiss from fire extinguishers. Squinting against the smoke, he slipped through the second doorway, dodging around staggering crewers and trying to stay clear of the flames as he looked around for the stormtroopers. There was no sign of them. But there was another doorway angling off to the right where the fire was burning even more intensely. Even as he sent a questioning thought toward Mara, a dim light suddenly shone out from the room, the narrow beam fighting its way through the smoke. Mara had seen it too. Luke caught her wordless signal, sent back an equally wordless confirmation, and started picking his way through gaps in the flames. He managed it with only a few minor burns, and a minute later eased into the room. The four stormtroopers were standing in the far corner, arranged in a combat semicircle with their backs to an extensive array of fuel tanks, sending short bursts of spray from their extinguishers at any tendril of flame that threaded its way too close. The one shining his light through the doorway looked over as the two Jedi came in and flipped the light upward, centering the beam on one of a set of five conduits, snaking their way across the ceiling. Luke nodded acknowledgement and looked for a way through the flames. Unfortunately, there wasn't one. He peered into the smoke, listening to his heartbeat counting out the seconds. Even Jedi breath control had its limits, and he and Mara were getting dangerously close to them. He could use the force to lift his lightsaber to the conduit, of course, but he wasn't at all sure he would have enough control at that range for the delicate scratch Fell wanted. The only other option he could see would be to lift Mara there directly and let her do the job. It would be risky. That much activity would put a severe strain on his system in his current oxygen-deprived state, quickly running him to the limit of his breath control and leaving him at the mercy of the smoke still filling the room. If the smoke also contained toxic gases, he could be in serious trouble. He would have to chance it. Turning to Mara, he replaced his lightsaber on his belt and gestured toward the conduit. He could sense her own doubts, but she knew better than to waste time arguing. She nodded her readiness, and he stretched out to the force to lift her gently off the deck. Keeping her as high over the flames as he could without banging her head against the various pieces of equipment jutting down from the ceiling, he moved her into position. She had her lightsaber ignited before he eased her to a stop, giving the conduit a quick and almost casual-looking slash with the tip of the blade. For a long moment nothing happened. Then, through the haze of smoke, Luke saw a few drops of liquid collect on the underside of the conduit. They coalesced into a single large drop and fell onto the deck below. With a sizzle audible even over the crackle of the flames, the particular tongue of flame directly below flickered and went out. Mara didn't wait for further instructions. Her lightsaber slashed again, slicing the conduit lengthwise, and suddenly the room was filled with a noisy spray of liquid, splattering against the ceiling and walls and showering down onto the fire. It was almost too late. Luke's vision was starting to waver now as his body ran out of air and it was all he could do to keep from dropping Mara onto the dying flames and fire-heated deck below her. Clenching his teeth, he hung on. A few more seconds, he told himself sternly. A few more seconds and the fire would be out, or near enough. Then he could set Mara down, and they could both start breathing again. 
unless between the lingering smoke and the extinguisher spray the room contained nothing but those toxic gases he'd wondered about earlier. In that case, he would just have to hope that the fire would be mostly gone before he blacked out, or at least that the stormtroopers would notice and pull him out of anything before he burned to death. A few more seconds. He jerked as something suddenly came down over his head. He blinked, but even as his eyes registered the vision-enhancing eyepieces in front of them, his skin registered something far more important, the feel of clean, cool air being blown at his face. He reached a hand up to his head, the fingertips bumping against something hot and hard. But the reaction had been pure reflex anyway, because he'd already figured out what was happening. One of the stormtroopers, recognizing his desperate need for air, had come to his side and put his own helmet over Luke's head. He took a deep, careful breath. The air smelled as good as it felt. He took another breath, and another, filling his lungs and replenishing the oxygen in his bloodstream. His thoughts flicked to Mara, but before he could ask he sensed that she, too, was being given the same care by a stormtrooper standing on the hot but no longer burning deck beneath her. He eased his force hold on her, lowering her down into the Imperial's waiting arms. There were a pair of hands on his shoulders now, half guiding, half pushing him back the way he'd come. A moment later they reached the doorway and stepped through. I'm all right, he called, taking one final breath and pushing the helmet away. Its owner caught it on its way up, and Luke got just a glimpse of an intense, dark-skinned face before the other slid the helmet back down over his own head again. He glanced back over his shoulder to make sure Mara was all right, and froze, feeling his mouth drop open in astonishment. Like him, Mara had taken a few breaths of clean air and was in the process of returning the borrowed stormtrooper helmet to its owner. Only the head sticking up out of the white armor wasn't human. It was green with touches of orange, dominated by large eyes and a narrow highlighting of glistening black scales that curved over the top and sides of the head almost to the nose. He caught sight of Luke staring at him, and his mouth gaped open in what had to be a grin. Luke could only stare back. The 501st Stormtrooper Legion, Vader's Fist the absolute epitome of Emperor Palpatine's hatred of non-humans and his determination to bring them under human domination. And one of its own members was an alien. Under the circumstances, Luke had Teo privately admit General Drask was surprisingly polite about the whole thing. We appreciate the assistance, he said, standing like a small, immovable pillar in the smoke-stained corridor as a small river of chiss moved past and around him on clean-up duty. His voice was under careful control, but there was no mistaking the smoldering fire in his glowing red eyes. But in the future, you will not take action aboard this vessel without specific authorization from myself, Aristocrat Chafor Mbintrano, Captain Brastal Shibarku, or another command rank officer. Is that understood? Clearly, Fell said before either Luke or Mara could say anything. I apologize for overstepping our bounds. Drast nodded shortly and brushed past them, heading aft toward the damaged area. Come on, Fell said to Luke, lip twitching in an ironic half-smile. Our work here appears to be done. They headed forward. Certainly a gracious bunch, aren't they? Mara commented sourly as more Chiss hurried past them going in the other direction. You have to look at it from his point of view, Fell reminded her. First of all, we're supposed to be honored diplomatic guests, not volunteer firefighters. That's Formby's point of view, not Drask's, Mara countered. At least the honored part is. Doesn't matter how he personally feels. Fell said. He has his orders, and when a Chiss accepts orders he carries them out, period. Still, that said, he smiled suddenly. I suspect he's chewing whole fasteners right now. 
He doesn't like anything about the empire of the hand or humans in general, and it has to gall him no end for us to have saved his ship for him. Which brings up a more serious question, Luke said. Namely, what exactly happened back there? Accident or sabotage? I'm sure they'll be looking into that, Fell said. But if it was sabotage, it was a pretty poor job of it. Even if those tanks had ruptured, it would only have put one relatively minor sector of the ship out of action. It certainly wouldn't have killed everyone aboard or anything so dramatic. Unless that's all the damage the saboteur needed, Mara suggested. Maybe all he wanted to do was scuttle the mission, or delay it while another ship was brought out for us to use. Fine, but why would anyone want to delay the mission? Fell asked reasonably. Everyone aboard seems pretty eager to get on with it. Seems being the operative word, Mara pointed out. Someone could easily be faking. Really, Fell said, frowning. I thought you Jedi could pick up on things like that. Not as well as we'd sometimes like, Luke said. We can pick up on strong emotion, but not necessarily subtle lies. Especially if the liar is good at it. Or maybe our saboteur does want to get to outbound flight, but doesn't want all the rest of us getting there with him. Mara said thoughtfully. If he could manage alternate transport for himself while we were left hanging, that again might be all he needs. But what would getting to outbound flight first gain him? Luke asked. Besides, the Chiss have already been there, haven't they? Actually, all they did was a long-range flyby, Fell said. They got enough readings to figure out what they'd found, then hightailed it out of there and forwarded the data to the nine ruling families with a request for instructions. The families held a quick debate, declared the area off-limits, and put form by in charge of getting in touch with all of us. Then let's try backing up a step, Luke suggested. What is it about outbound flight that anyone might particularly want? Mara shrugged. It's old Republic technology she pointed out. Fifty plus years out of date. That makes it pretty much of historical value only. Only to the three of us here, Fell said. A lot of the cultures in this part of space are pretty primitive, technologically. Any one of them could learn a lot from a set of dreadnoughts in even marginal condition. I dare say even the Chiss military would learn something if they had the time to take everything apart and study it. Or maybe the Jeruns figure they can trade what's left for a new home. Luke shook his head. I wish we had more information. We do, Fell said, sounding puzzled. Or rather, I do. Luke looked at him in surprise. You do? Sure, Fell said. Before we left, Admiral Park went looking in Thrawn's records for anything he might have on outbound flight. Turns out he had a complete copy of the project's official operational manual. The whole thing? Luke asked, frowning. The whole thing, Fell confirmed. Four data cards covering personnel lists, inventory manifests, technical readouts and maintenance guides, flight operations checklists and procedures, schematics. Everything. You want to take a look? I thought you'd never ask, Mara said dryly. Let's go. The Imperial transport was docked in a mirror image of the half port and reception room that the Jade Saber was using on the opposite side of the ship. The stormtroopers were already inside in the ready room, stripping off their armor to check for damage from their battle against the fire and talking quietly together about the incident. You know, I don't think I've ever seen a stormtrooper without his armor before. Luke commented as Fell led the way through the ready room and into a narrow corridor. Not a conscious one anyway. They do come out on occasion, Fell said with a grin. Though never in public, of course. Fine, but why stormtroopers? 
Mara asked. Why didn't you just design and create your own elite force if that's what you wanted? Fell shrugged. Mainly because the psychological advantage was already in place, he said. Thrawn had brought several stormtrooper legions out here and used them very effectively against a whole series of troublemakers. Once potential enemies came to respect and fear men in stormtrooper armor, it paid to keep using it. Even if not all those inside the armor are men anymore? Luke asked. Fell smiled. Yes, Sumil. Also goes by the warrior named Grappler. Your stormtroopers have names? Mara asked. I thought they were just assigned operating numbers. Even some of Palpatine's stormtroopers had names, Fell told her. We all have names here. In case you're interested, Oryx-7 consists of Grappler, Watchman, Shadow, and Cloud. Colorful, Mara commented. I hope you don't expect us to keep track of them in public. Especially since they don't seem to have gotten around to imprinting their names on their helmets, Luke added. And they never will, Fell said. We don't put that kind of identification on Stormtrooper armor. That way, no one can tell whether the Stormtroopers he's facing are the absolute best the Empire of the Hand has to offer or a set of freshly trained recruits facing their first genuine action. It keeps our enemies from playing the odds against us. Were Sumil's people one of those enemies? Mara asked. Not at all, Fel assured her. Sumil is an Ikari, one of the latest peoples to join the Empire of the Hand. They were a fragmented tribal people whom we helped liberate from the domination of a very organized warlord with a relative handful of disciplined troops. Help how? Mara asked. Threw him out, then moved in yourselves? Hardly, Fell said. The Ikaris were actually very good fighters. They'd just gotten used to fighting among themselves over the years, and the warlord took advantage of that to keep them working at cross-purposes. All we did was help organize and arm them. They did all the rest. And once they were free, they simply decided to join up with you. Luke asked. We're not Palpatine's empire, either, Master Skywalker, Fell said. We're more like a confederation than a true empire, in fact, with allies instead of conquered peoples. We keep the name, again, mainly for the historical aspects. And the psychological value, of course, Mara murmured. Of course, Fell agreed. If you've gotten used to the notion of the Empire of the Hand being unbeatable, you're likely to give up that much sooner when a Star Destroyer appears over your planet or a squad of stormtroopers blows a hole through your defensive perimeter. Frankly, our philosophy is that the best battles are those where the enemy gives up before any shots have to be fired at all. You still don't strike me as a stormtrooper officer type, Luke commented. What does your father think of your career choice? Fell shrugged. Actually, I'm in the fleet end of the Imperial military, he said. My usual command is a fleet arm of Clockraft, he grinned again. And my father is very proud of me. They emerged from the corridor onto a deserted command deck. No one on duty? Luke asked, looking around. Is there anyone on duty in your ship? Fell countered reasonably as he crossed to what appeared to be the main sensor station and waved his guests to a pair of chairs at nearby consoles. Actually, we don't have a separate flight crew. This kind of transport is designed for a stormtrooper unit to be able to fly by itself, at least on routine operations. Take some of the strain off our pilot cadre. Does that mean you're low on trained personnel? Mara asked as she and Luke sat down. Everyone's always low on skilled pilots, Fell said, sitting down and swiveling his chair toward a rack of data cards. 
I doubt the new republic's any different. But at the moment we're doing all right. There are at least two alien groups within the Empire that have shown very good aptitude for general flight operations. He trailed off, and Luke caught a sudden dark flicker and fell. What is it? He asked. Slowly, Fell swiveled back to face them. Well, he said, his voice studiously conversational. I think I know now what that fire was all about. Whoever it was figured the Imperial 501st would go charging back to help, nobly oblivious to our own safety. What are you talking about? Mara demanded. Fell gestured to the rack of data cards. The outbound flight operational manual, he said. It's gone. Chapter 7 Mara looked at Luke to find him looking back at her. Really? she said, looking over at Fell. That's handy. Isn't it, though? Fell said. His voice was still quiet, but his face suddenly seemed older and harder. More mature, somehow, than Mara's first impression of him as a kid playing soldier. Yes, that's certainly one way of putting it. I take it you don't have another copy? Luke asked. This was the copy, Fell said. The original records are back on Nerowin. Of course, Luke said. What I meant. I know what you meant. Fell passed a hand across his face, and when he had lowered it, some of the hardness had faded. Sorry. I'm just... I messed up. I hate when I mess up. Welcome to the club, Mara said, an odd feeling flickering through her. In all her time with the Empire, she wondered, had she ever heard an Imperial officer actually admit to having made a mistake? Let's skip the finger-pointing and see if we can figure out who's got it. You have any idea how many people are aboard? Not that many, Fell said, sounding a little more on balance. I think this size ship runs a crew of only 30 to 35. There seems to be an honor guard running around, too. Call it two squads of six warriors each. Typical ambassador staff runs to 20, plus form by, so that's 68 chis, max. Plus five jeruns, you and four stormtroopers, Jinsler, and us, Luke said. Unless there's someone else we don't know about. Right, Fell said. Wait a second, Mara said, frowning in concentration as she searched her memory. You said Formby had a staff of twenty? I said that was typical for an ambassador, Fell corrected. I haven't actually run the numbers myself. And I presume most of them would be from Formby's family, she said. That means they'd all be wearing yellow, right? That's the Chaff family color, yes, Fell confirmed. Why? How do you know that? Bearsh asked, his face puckering oddly. Then it cleared. Ah, uh, of course. The great and renowned powers of the Jedi. Actually, there was nothing special needed on this one, Luke said. We saw your earlier conversation with the Chiss. Any people who would put a playground right in their command center must certainly care a lot for their children. Ah, uh, Berge said. Yes. Our vessel was originally built for scientific surveys. That space was designed to contain the center for instrument responses. His face puckered again. It was the only place large enough for a proper play and exercise area. All the rest of the vessel is composed of small rooms for the singles and families. We had no need for the instruments, so we took them out and gave the space to the children. He straightened his head and shoulders, his eyes unfocusing as if gazing into the future. But one day, he said firmly, one day we will have a real place for the children. 
and then you will see, Jedi Master Skywalker, what the Jerun people can become. I'll look forward to it, Luke promised. Now about terrain? Bersh seemed to come back from his dreams. We will live in whatever grounds you find for us, he said. Mountains or lakes, woodlands or plains, it does not matter. All right, Luke said. They certainly weren't a picky lot. What about temperature ranges? Again, Bersh waved his hand. The temperature in this vessel is somewhat warm for us, he said. But we will adapt and adjust to whatever. He broke off as the deck beneath them gave a sudden gentle jolt. What was that? Estash asked fearfully, looking quickly around. A second later they had their answer as a distant thunderclap echoed faintly through the open hatchway. An explosion, Luke told him, jumping to his feet and sprinting toward the entry tunnel, stretching out to the force as he pulled out his comm link. The opposite side of the ship, he estimated from the sudden surge of consternation in that direction, somewhere in the aft quarter. Mara? We've got an explosion and fire on the aft port side. Her voice came back. I'm heading back to see if I can help. I'll join you, Luke said, clearing the end of the entry tunnel and heading for the nearest cross-ship corridor. Any idea what's back there? Fell's transport, for one thing, Mara told him. No idea what else, but from the way Drask took off I'd guess something serious. Vital equipment, or possibly fuel storage. Luke winced. Right. See you there. The air began to smell of smoke before he was halfway down the main port side corridor. He kept going, and then, suddenly... He was there, breaking to a halt behind a dozen chis with handheld extinguishers running into a half-open door through which smoke was pouring. He spotted Mara off to one side with Fell and eased his way past the chis in military dress uniform shouting orders in a sharp, staccato language. Situation? He called to Mara. The fire's right by a nexus of maneuvering jets and their fuel supply, she told him grimly. She'd stripped off her fancy jacket and gown, and was dressed now only in the grey combat leotard and soft boots she'd been wearing underneath the formal wear. The stormtroopers are already inside with extinguishers, trying to keep it away from the tanks. Luke looked over at Fell. The young Imperial was wearing a stormtrooper's headset comm link, an intense expression on his face as he stared through the open door. Don't they have automatic extinguisher systems? He asked. They used to, Mara said. Apparently, a malfunction in the system was what caused the explosion in the first place. That's useful, Luke said, blinking back tears as the acrid smoke stung his eyes. Some of the Chiss who had gone into the fire zone were starting to come out now, most of them staggering slightly as they trailed plumes of smoke. How come the stormtroopers are in there? They were the first ones on the scene with self-contained breathing equipment, Fell said before Mara could answer. Speaking of breathing, how are Jedi in oxygen-poor atmospheres? We can handle a few minutes, Luke said. Less if there's a lot of physical or mental exertion involved. What do you need? Some delicate lightsaber work, Fell pointed to the doorway through which the smoke was pouring. They've got the fuel tanks isolated for the moment, but the fire's got too much of a head start, and it's pushing in on them. They think they've located the extinguisher system. They think? That's why the work needs to be delicate, Fell said. Otherwise, they'd just blast the lines open and be done with it. What we need is for you to lightly scratch the conduits just enough to let out a few drops so we can see exactly what kind of liquid's inside. The last thing we want is to dump more fuel, or something else flammable. No kidding, Mara said. Assuming they're right, then what? 
Then you cut them all the way open, Fell said. It looks like the explosion only warped the area around the main spray valves, so if you can open the lines behind them we should be able to flood the compartment and put it out in short order. Luke looked over at the dress uniform Chiss, now huddled with a pair of crewers strapping on air tanks and breather masks. Protocol, he knew, probably dictated that they clear this with one of the ship's officers before going in. But the officer looked too busy to listen to passengers. And if the fire was already getting close to the fuel tanks. All right, he said, coming to a decision. How do I find the conduit? How do we find it? Mara corrected, her lightsaber already in hand. Mara. Don't even think it, she warned. Besides, I'm better with delicate work than you are. Unfortunately, she was right. With an effort, Luke forced back his instinctive reaction to shield her from danger wherever possible. Fine, he said. How do we find the conduit? They'll guide you in, Fell told him. Watch for a bright light. Right. Unhooking his lightsaber from his belt, Luke took a deep breath and stretched out to the force. He lifted his eyebrows at Mara, got her confirming nod, and ducked through the doorway. The smoke was considerably thicker inside the room than Luke had expected, swirling madly around as the compartment's venting system tried its best to clear it away. Ahead through another half-open door, he could see the blaze of the fire, the crackling of flames punctuated by the hiss from fire extinguishers. Squinting against the smoke, he slipped through the second doorway, dodging around staggering crewers and trying to stay clear of the flames as he looked around for the stormtroopers. There was no sign of them. But there was another doorway angling off to the right where the fire was burning even more intensely. Even as he sent a questioning thought toward Mara, a dim light suddenly shone out from the room, the narrow beam fighting its way through the smoke. Mara had seen it too. Luke caught her wordless signal, sent back an equally wordless confirmation, and started picking his way through gaps in the flames. He managed it with only a few minor burns, and a minute later eased into the room. The four stormtroopers were standing in the far corner arranged in a combat semicircle with their backs to an extensive array of fuel tanks, sending short bursts of spray from their extinguishers at any tendril of flame that threaded its way too close. The one shining his light through the doorway looked over as the two Jedi came in and flipped the light upward, centering the beam on one of a set of five conduits, snaking their way across the ceiling. Luke nodded acknowledgement and looked for a way through the flames. Unfortunately, there wasn't one. He peered into the smoke, listening to his heartbeat counting out the seconds. Even Jedi breath control had its limits, and he and Mara were getting dangerously close to them. He could use the force to lift his lightsaber to the conduit, of course, but he wasn't at all sure he would have enough control at that range for the delicate scratch Fell wanted. The only other option he could see would be to lift Mara there directly and let her do the job. It would be risky. That much activity would put a severe strain on his system in his current oxygen-deprived state, quickly running him to the limit of his breath control and leaving him at the mercy of the smoke still filling the room. If the smoke also contained toxic gases, he could be in serious trouble. He would have to chance it. Turning to Mara, he replaced his lightsaber on his belt and gestured toward the conduit. He could sense her own doubts, but she knew better than to waste time arguing. She nodded her readiness, and he stretched out to the force to lift her gently off the deck. Keeping her as high over the flames as he could without banging her head against the various pieces of equipment jutting down from the ceiling, he moved her into position. She had her lightsaber ignited before he eased her to a stop, giving the conduit a quick and almost casual-looking slash with the tip of the blade. 
For a long moment nothing happened. Then, through the haze of smoke, Luke saw a few drops of liquid collect on the underside of the conduit. They coalesced into a single large drop and fell onto the deck below. With a sizzle audible even over the crackle of the flames, the particular tongue of flame directly below flickered and went out. Mara didn't wait for further instructions. Her lightsaber slashed again, slicing the conduit lengthwise, and suddenly the room was filled with a noisy spray of liquid, splattering against the ceiling and walls and showering down onto the fire. It was almost too late. Luke's vision was starting to waver now as his body ran out of air, and it was all he could do to keep from dropping Mara onto the dying flames and fire-heated deck below her. Clenching his teeth, he hung on. A few more seconds, he told himself sternly. A few more seconds and the fire would be out, or near enough. Then he could set Mara down, and they could both start breathing again. Unless between the lingering smoke and the extinguisher spray the room contained nothing but those toxic gases he'd wondered about earlier. In that case, he would just have to hope that the fire would be mostly gone before he blacked out, or at least that the stormtroopers would notice and pull him out of anything before he burned to death. A few more seconds. He jerked as something suddenly came down over his head. He blinked. But even as his eyes registered the vision-enhancing eyepieces in front of them, his skin registered something far more important, the feel of clean, cool air being blown at his face. He reached a hand up to his head, the fingertips bumping against something hot and hard. But the reaction had been pure reflex anyway, because he'd already figured out what was happening. One of the stormtroopers, recognizing his desperate need for air, had come to his side and put his own helmet over Luke's head. He took a deep, careful breath. The air smelled as good as it felt. He took another breath, and another, filling his lungs and replenishing the oxygen in his bloodstream. His thoughts flicked to Mara, but before he could ask he sensed that she, too, was being given the same care by a stormtrooper standing on the hot but no longer burning deck beneath her. He eased his force hold on her, lowering her down into the Imperial's waiting arms. There were a pair of hands on his shoulders now, half guiding, half pushing him back the way he'd come. A moment later they reached the doorway and stepped through. I'm all right, he called, taking one final breath and pushing the helmet away. Its owner caught it on its way up, and Luke got just a glimpse of an intense, dark-skinned face before the other slid the helmet back down over his own head again. He glanced back over his shoulder to make sure Mara was all right, and froze, feeling his mouth drop open in astonishment. Like him, Mara had taken a few breaths of clean air and was in the process of returning the borrowed stormtrooper helmet to its owner. Only the head sticking up out of the white armor wasn't human. It was green with touches of orange, dominated by large eyes and a narrow highlighting of glistening black scales that curved over the top and sides of the head almost to the nose. He caught sight of Luke staring at him, and his mouth gaped open in what had to be a grin. Luke could only stare back. The 501st Stormtrooper Legion, Vader's Fist the absolute epitome of Emperor Palpatine's hatred of non-humans and his determination to bring them under human domination. And one of its own members was an alien. Under the circumstances, Luke had T.O. privately admit General Drask was surprisingly polite about the whole thing. We appreciate the assistance, he said, standing like a small, the movable pillar in the smoke-stained corridor as a small river of chiss moved past and around him on clean-up duty. His voice was under careful control, but there was no mistaking the smoldering fire in his glowing red eyes. But in the future, you will not take action aboard this vessel without specific authorization from myself, Aristocra Chafor and Bintrano, Captain Brastal Shibarku, or another command rank officer. Is that understood? Clearly, 
Fell said before either Luke or Mara could say anything. I apologize for overstepping our bounds. Drast nodded shortly and brushed past them, heading aft toward the damaged area. Come on, Fell said to Luke, lip twitching in an ironic half-smile. Our work here appears to be done. They headed forward. Certainly a gracious bunch, aren't they? Mara commented sourly as more Chiss hurried past them going in the other direction. You have to look at it from his point of view, Fell reminded her. First of all, we're supposed to be honored diplomatic guests, not volunteer firefighters. That's Formby's point of view, not Drask's, Mara countered. At least the honored part is. Doesn't matter how he personally feels, Fell said. He has his orders, and when a Chiss accepts orders he carries them out, period. Still, that said, he smiled suddenly. I suspect he's chewing whole fasteners right now. He doesn't like anything about the Empire of the Hand or humans in general, and it has to gall him no end for us to have saved his ship for him. Which brings up a more serious question, Luke said. Namely, what exactly happened back there? Accident or sabotage? I'm sure they'll be looking into that, Fell said. But if it was sabotage, it was a pretty poor job of it. Even if those tanks had ruptured, it would only have put one relatively minor sector of the ship out of action. It certainly wouldn't have killed everyone aboard or anything so dramatic. Unless that's all the damage the saboteur needed, Mara suggested. Maybe all he wanted to do was scuttle the mission, or delay it while another ship was brought out for us to use. Fine, but why would anyone want to delay the mission? Fell asked reasonably. Everyone aboard seems pretty eager to get on with it. Seems being the operative word, Mara pointed out. Someone could easily be faking. Really, Fell said frowning. I thought you Jedi could pick up on things like that. Not as well as we'd sometimes like, Luke said. We can pick up on strong emotion, but not necessarily subtle lies. Especially if the liar is good at it. Or maybe our saboteur does want to get to outbound flight, but doesn't want all the rest of us getting there with him, Mara said thoughtfully. If he could manage alternate transport for himself while we were left hanging, that again might be all he needs. But what would getting to outbound flight first gain him? Luke asked. Besides, the Chiss have already been there, haven't they? Actually, all they did was a long-range flyby, Fell said. They got enough readings to figure out what they'd found, then hightailed it out of there and forwarded the data to the nine ruling families with a request for instructions. The families held a quick debate, declared the area off-limits, and put form by in charge of getting in touch with all of us. Then let's try backing up a step. Luke suggested. What is it about outbound flight that anyone might particularly want? Mara shrugged. It's old Republic technology, she pointed out. Fifty plus years out of date. That makes it pretty much of historical value only. Only to the three of us here, Fell said. A lot of the cultures in this part of space are pretty primitive, technologically. Any one of them could learn a lot from a set of dreadnoughts in even marginal condition. I dare say even the Chiss military would learn something if they had the time to take everything apart and study it. Or maybe the Jeruns figure they can trade what's left for a new home. Luke shook his head. I wish we had more information. We do, Fell said, sounding puzzled. Or rather, I do. Luke looked at him in surprise. You do? Sure, Fell said. Before we left, Admiral Park went looking in Thrawn's records for anything he might have on outbound flight. Turns out he had a complete copy of the project's official operational manual. 
The whole thing? Luke asked, frowning. The whole thing, Fell confirmed. Four data cards covering personnel lists, inventory manifests, technical readouts and maintenance guides, flight operations checklists and procedures, schematics, everything. You want to take a look? I thought you'd never ask, Mara said dryly. Let's go. The Imperial transport was docked in a mirror image of the half-port and reception room that the Jade Saber was using on the opposite side of the ship. The stormtroopers were already inside in the ready room, stripping off their armor to check for damage from their battle against the fire and talking quietly together about the incident. You know, I don't think I've ever seen a stormtrooper without his armor before, Luke commented as Fell led the way through the ready room and into a narrow corridor. Not a conscious one anyway. They do come out on occasion, Fell said with a grin. Though never in public, of course. Fine, but why stormtroopers? Mara asked. Why didn't you just design and create your own elite force if that's what you wanted? Fell shrugged. Mainly because the psychological advantage was already in place, he said. Thrawn had brought several stormtrooper legions out here and used them very effectively against a whole series of troublemakers. Once potential enemies came to respect and fear men in stormtrooper armor, it paid to keep using it. Even if not all those inside the armor are men anymore? Luke asked. Fell smiled. Yes, Sumil. Also goes by the warrior named Grappler. Your stormtroopers have names? Mara asked. I thought they were just assigned operating numbers. Even some of Palpatine's stormtroopers had names, Fell told her. We all have names here. In case you're interested, Oryx 7 consists of Grappler, Watchman, Shadow, and Cloud. Colorful, Mara commented. I hope you don't expect us to keep track of them in public especially since they don't seem to have gotten around to imprinting their names on their helmets, Luke added. And they never will, Fell said. We don't put that kind of identification on stone trooper armor. That way, no one can tell whether the stormtroopers he's facing are the absolute best the Empire of the Hand has to offer or a set of freshly trained recruits facing their first genuine action. It keeps our enemies from playing the odds against us. Were Sumil's people one of those enemies? Mara asked. Not at all, Fel assured her. Sumil is an Ikari, one of the latest peoples to join the Empire of the Hand. They were a fragmented tribal people whom we helped liberate from the domination of a very organized warlord with a relative handful of disciplined troops. Help how? Mara asked. Threw him out, then moved in yourselves? Hardly, Fell said. The Ikaris were actually very good fighters. They'd just gotten used to fighting among themselves over the years, and the warlord took advantage of that to keep them working at cross-purposes. All we did was help organize and arm them. They did all the rest. And once they were free, they simply decided to join up with you. Luke asked. We're not Palpatine's empire, either, Master Skywalker, Fell said. We're more like a confederation than a true empire, in fact, with allies instead of conquered peoples. We keep the name, again, mainly for the historical aspects. And the psychological value, of course, Mara murmured. Of course, Fell agreed. If you've gotten used to the notion of the Empire of the Hand being unbeatable, you're likely to give up that much sooner when a Star Destroyer appears over your planet or a squad of stormtroopers blows a hole through your defensive perimeter. Frankly, our philosophy is that the best battles are those where the enemy gives up before any shots have to be fired at all. You still don't strike me as a stormtrooper officer type. Luke commented. 
What does your father think of your career choice? Fells shrugged. Actually, I'm in the fleet end of the Imperial military, he said. My usual command is a fleet arm of Clocraft, he grinned again. And my father is very proud of me. They emerged from the corridor onto a deserted command deck. No one on duty? Luke asked, looking around. Is there anyone on duty in your ship? Fell countered reasonably as he crossed to what appeared to be the main sensor station and waved his guests to a pair of chairs at nearby consoles. Actually, we don't have a separate flight crew. This kind of transport is designed for a stormtrooper unit to be able to fly by itself, at least on routine operations. Take some of the strain off our pilot cadre. Does that mean you're low on trained personnel? Mara asked as she and Luke sat down. Everyone's always low on skilled pilots, Fell said, sitting down and swiveling his chair toward a rack of data cards. I doubt the New Republic's any different. But at the moment we're doing all right. There are at least two alien groups within the Empire that have shown very good aptitude for general flight operations. He trailed off and Luke caught a sudden dark flicker and fell. What is it? He asked. Slowly, Fell swiveled back to face them. Well, he said, his voice studiously conversational. I think I know now what that fire was all about. Whoever it was figured the Imperial 501st would go charging back to help, nobly oblivious to our own safety. What are you talking about? Mara demanded. Fell gestured to the rack of data cards. The outbound flight operational manual, he said. It's gone. Chapter 7 Mara looked at Luke, to find him looking back at her. Really? she said, looking over at Fell. That's handy. Isn't it, though? Fell said. His voice was still quiet but his face suddenly seemed older and harder. More mature, somehow, than Mara's first impression of him as a kid playing soldier. Yes, that's certainly one way of putting it. I take it you don't have another copy? Luke asked. This was the copy, Fell said. The original records are back on Nerowin. Of course, Luke said. What I meant... I know what you meant. Fell passed a hand across his face, and when he had lowered it, some of the hardness had faded. Sorry. I'm just... I messed up. I hate when I mess up. Welcome to the club, Mara said, an odd feeling flickering through her. In all her time with the Empire, she wondered, had she ever heard an Imperial officer actually admit to having made a mistake? Let's skip the finger-pointing and see if we can figure out who's got it. You have any idea how many people are aboard? Not that many, Fell said, sounding a little more on balance. I think this size ship runs a crew of only 30 to 35. There seems to be an honor guard running around, too. Call it two squads of six warriors each. Typical ambassador staff runs to 20 plus form by, so that's 68 chis, max. Plus five jeruns, you and four stormtroopers, Jinsler, and us, Luke said. Unless there's someone else we don't know about. Right, Fell said. Wait a second, Mara said, frowning in concentration as she searched her memory. You said form by had a staff of 20? I said that was typical for an ambassador. Fell corrected. I haven't actually run the numbers myself. And I presume most of them would be from Formby's family, she said. That means they'd all be wearing yellow, right? That's the Chaff family color, yes, Fell confirmed. Why? Because I didn't see more than four yellow outfits at dinner tonight, Mara said. 
formed by Fisa and two others. Everyone else was wearing black. She's right, Luke agreed. Which family wears black? None of them, Fell said, frowning. That's the Chiss defense fleet. Black's a combination of all colors since the military draws from all the families. What about his honor guard? Mara asked. Would they be from his family? Fell shook his head. All honor guards were military black. Huh. I wonder what he's done with the rest of his entourage. Maybe he had to leave them behind, Luke suggested. With a mission of this sort the nine families might not have wanted any one family too heavily represented. I suppose that would make sense, Fell agreed slowly. There's always been a tricky balance of power among the families. We can do a head count in the morning, Mara said. Let's go on. How many of these assorted people might have known you had those files? Fell grimaced. That's not going to narrow it nearly as much as you think. I was talking about it to Ambassador Ginsler this evening in the reception corridor before we were seated for dinner. You told Ginsler about it. Mara bit out. Yes, Fell said, frowning at her vehemence. I wanted to know if he'd brought any records of his own I could compare against ours. Why shouldn't I have done that? Mara waved a hand in disgust. Of course Fell had no way of knowing the man was a fraud. Skip it, she said. Did he? What, have any records? Fell shook his head. No. He said everything useful the New Republic might once have had had been lost or destroyed. Probably true, Luke murmured. Could anyone have been able to overhear this discussion? Fell exhaled noisily. Could everyone have been able to overhear it, you mean? He said. The whole dinner crowd was milling around the corridor being sociable. Yes, but the whole dinner crowd wasn't paying attention. Mara countered. Tell us who was. Fell frowned into space, searching his memory. For starters, of course, there were several chis, he said slowly. I remember Fisa passing by at one point. I think she just brought you two in. Then there was. Wait a minute, Luke said, straightening in his chair a little. We were there by then. Talking with Formba, I think. That's not the point, Luke said, looking at Mara. What do you think? Worth a try, she agreed. Just hold those thoughts a minute, Fell. We'll be right back to you. Taking a deep breath, she closed her eyes and stretched out to the force. The memory enhancement technique the Emperor had taught her only worked on short-term memories, but the reception corridor ought to be recent enough to be accessible. She let the pictures flow backward through her mind's eye, the fire, the dinner, the flow of conversation before dinner. There it was, formed by stepping forward to greet them as Fisa brought them into the gathering. She and Luke speaking with him, assuring him their quarters were quite satisfactory and that, no, they didn't know very much about outbound flight but were looking forward to the voyage. And in the background, Fell and Ginsler across the corridor by one wall, deep in conversation. She froze the image, studying it. Then, slowly, she let it run forward again, watching everything and everyone around them. All too soon, she had her answer. With a sigh, she slipped out of the trance and looked over at Luke. He was already finished with his own memory enhancement. What do you think? He asked. He's right, she said in disgust. It'd be simpler to figure out who didn't know. I spotted at least two druids close enough to listen in, 
plus a couple of the Chiss crewers and two command rank officers. Including General Drask, Luke agreed. About the only likely suspects who couldn't have known were Formby and us. And of course, Fisa works for Formby, Mara reminded him. She could have clued him in at any time. Luke lifted a hand, let it fall into his lap. Which leaves you and me. Dead end. Not necessarily, Mara said as a sudden thought struck her. Okay, so they got the data cards. But they'd also need a data pad to read them with. That leaves only Jinsler. And the Jurons, Luke said. I was talking to them when the explosion went off, and I left my data pad behind in their shuttle. Sorry, but that's a dead end, too, Fell spoke up, pointing to another rack above the console. Whoever took the data cards also helped himself to a data pad. He brightened suddenly. Which means it's not Jinsler or the Jeruns, he said. Like you said, they wouldn't need to take one. Unless they deliberately took it to throw us off the trail, Luke pointed out gently. Fell's face dropped. Oh. Right. He muttered something under his breath. Sorry. This sort of thing is a little outside my area of expertise. Ours too, Luke assured him. Don't worry, we'll figure it out. If necessary, we can always ask Formby to search the ship. What do you mean, if necessary? Fell asked, frowning. Don't we want him to do that anyway? Luke shrugged. There are any number of places aboard a ship like this where you can hide something as small as four data cards, he pointed out. Or the thief could easily have copied them into a different system, a droid, even, and then gotten rid of the originals. The Chiss don't have droids, Fell said. But I see your point. On the other hand, Luke went on. If we don't make a fuss, the thief won't know whether or not we've even missed them. That might give us a whole different set of advantages. Maybe, Fell said, not sounding entirely convinced. Trust me, Luke assured him. Knowledge of any sort is power as Talon Card always says. As Grand Admiral Thrawn usually proved, Fell rejoined. Don't remind us, Luke said ruefully. Do you know if this ship carries any hyper-capable transports or shuttles? I believe this class usually carries one, Fell said, forehead wrinkling in concentration. The commander's glider, it's called, though on a diplomatic ship like this it would probably be assigned to form by instead of Captain Talship. Why? You might still be right about someone trying to delay us and get a head start, Luke explained. Especially now that he's got an operational manual in hand. If so, he'd need a way to get there once he'd disabled the ship. With your transport, ours, and formize, that means he's got at least three to choose from. Plus the Jerun shuttle and whatever Jinsla used, Mara put in. You can forget the Jerun shuttle, Luke said, shaking his head. I wouldn't trust it to fly to the far side of the chaff envo. That bad, is it? Mara asked. It makes my old T-16 look good by comparison. Luke said wryly. Anyway, I don't think it has a hyperdrive. Okay, so that leaves Jinsler's ship, Mara concluded. Fell, do you know what he's got? Actually, I don't think he has a ship, Fell said. I didn't see him arrive. He got here before we did, but I believe Formby mentioned he'd gotten a ride from someone. He got a ride? Luke asked incredulously. Out here? Fell shrugged. All I know is what Formby said. Maybe he contacted Nirwin and Anmaro Park arranged something. Maybe, Mara said. Personally, she didn't believe that for a minute, but there was no point arguing about it. 
So what's our next move? Our next move is to go back to our quarters, Luke said firmly. I don't know about you, but I've got a few small burns that need to be attended to. Oh, I'm sorry, Fell said, getting up quickly from his chair and starting toward one of the med packs fastened to the wall beside the emergency oxygen tanks. I didn't even think about. No, no, that's all right, Luke hastened to assure him. We don't need medical help. We'll be able to fix ourselves up just fine overnight with a Jedi healing trance. Oh. Fell stopped short, and Mara could sense his embarrassment. I'm sorry. I guess I don't know as much about Jedi as I thought I did. Have you ever even met one before? Mara asked. Well, no, Fell admitted. But I have read up on them. I mean on you. I mean. We know what you mean, Luke said, smiling slightly. Don't worry about it. He stood up. Mara? We'll see you tomorrow, Commander, Mara said, getting to her feet. All right, Fell said. I'll see you out. Don't bother, Luke said. We can find the way. You'd better go see to your men. Maybe discuss some new security arrangements, Mara added. Fell made a face. Point taken. Good night. The stormtroopers had vanished from the ready room as Luke and Mara passed through, their armor hung neatly on the racks lining the walls. That last comment was a little unfair, you know, Luke commented as they walked down the corridor toward their quarters. I'm sure he did have some security set up. That's why I said they needed a new set of arrangements, Mara countered. The old ones obviously weren't good enough. Hmm, Luke said. Maybe. Maybe not. Mara looked sideways at him. You have a thought? He shrugged, glancing casually behind them. I don't know if it occurred to you but we only have Fell's word that there were any data cards here in the first place. Or that he really did talk to Jinsler about them before dinner, Mara agreed. He could just be venting waste gases here, trying to get us to look suspiciously at everyone except him. You think we ought to pay a little visit to Jinsler before we lock down for the night? Luke shook his head. Not worth it. We definitely need to talk with him sometime before we get to outbound flight, but I don't want to do it with these burns distracting us. Besides, even if Fell did talk to him about outbound flight, it doesn't prove anything. By Fell's own admission, he was trying to see what Jinsler knew about the mission. If Jinsler didn't have anything, but said he wanted to see Fell's records. Records Fell didn't have, Mara murmured. Right, records he didn't have, Luke said. Then Fell would still have to fake a robbery. It'd be easier to fake it to us than wait until Jinsler came by. Except that we might catch him at it, Mara pointed out. You're forgetting the sequence of the conversation, Luke reminded her. It wasn't until we told him we couldn't always catch people in lies that he even mentioned he had the data cards. Mara played back the memory. Blasted if he wasn't right. You're really making me look bad tonight, she growled. I thought I was the one who was supposed to have had the investigative training. It's all the time I've spent hanging around Corin Horn, Luke said dryly. Some of it rubs off on a person. Besides, you've got other things on your mind. Mara felt her muscles stiffen. What do you mean? She asked cautiously. He shrugged too casually. I was hoping you'd tell me, he said. All I know is that there's something still churning around behind those beautiful green eyes of yours. Mara snorted under her breath. So it's flattery now, is it? That's a sure sign you've run out of logical arguments and persuasive skill. 
or else it's a sign of my sincerity and commitment to your continued happiness as my wife and companion. Luke countered. Ooh, I like that, Mara said approvingly. Commitment to my continued happiness. Make sure you use that one again sometime. I'll make a note, Luke promised. His smile faded into seriousness. You know that I'm always ready to listen. She caught his hand, squeezed it. I know, she assured him. And it's no big deal, really it isn't. I just have to do some thinking on my own before I can talk about it, that's all. Okay, Luke said, and she could feel his concern fading a little. But only a little. Oh, and there's one more factor here we shouldn't forget. Fell's stormtrooper squad isn't exactly homogeneous. Mara frowned. Are you talking about that alien, Sumil? Yes, Luke said. We don't know anything about him or his people, after all. It's possible he's running with his own agenda. Possible, but unlikely, Mara said, shaking her head. The 501st wasn't exactly your run of the Star Lane Stormtrooper unit. They were an elite among elites, and I can't imagine Park reviving it without holding to those standards. I didn't say it was likely, Luke reminded her mildly. I would hope that Fell hadn't just thrown chance cubes when he picked his people for this mission. I just thought it was something we should keep in mind. They did make one short side trip on the way back, stopping by the Jade Saber to make sure she was properly locked down against intruders. After that admittedly snide comment to Fell, Mara knew she would never live it down if her own ship got broken into. Back in their quarters, they were preparing for bed when Formby's official announcement came over the ship-wide speaker system that the fire damage had been repaired and that the mission would continue without interruption. He made no mention of the assistance the Chiss had received in battling the blaze, nor was there any comment as to the cause of the explosion that had started the fire in the first place. Later, lying beside Luke in the darkness, Mara stared at the ceiling and wondered what exactly was going on inside her. It had come on so quickly, this quiet feeling of guilt that had suddenly taken hold of her like a hand gently gripping her throat. Suddenly, all the things she'd done through the years she was Palpatine's agent were coming back to haunt her. The heavy-handed investigations, the casual brushing aside of even the limited rights that had existed under the Empire, the summary judgments, the summary killings. But she'd put all that behind her. Hadn't she? She'd never truly been on the dark side. After all, Luke himself had pointed that out to her three years ago. She'd served Palpatine and the Empire as best and as honestly as she'd known how, based on the admittedly slanted information he'd given her. Certainly the fact that she was now a Jedi seemed to support the view that her actions were redeemable. So what was it that was bringing all this back? Fell and his stormtroopers, the most visible image of imperial rule and excesses? The mission itself and its constant reminder that the destruction of outbound flight had been one of Palpatine's early atrocities. Or was it something else entirely, something more subtle? After all, Palpatine had paid for his deeds with his life. So had Darth Vader and Tarkin and all the other Grand Moffs. Even Thrawn, whom she now realized had probably been nobler than all the rest of them put together, was gone. Only she, Mara Jade, the Emperor's Hand, had survived. Why? She rolled uncomfortably over onto her side, transferring her stare from the darkness of the ceiling to the darkness on the far side of the room. Survivor's guilt, she remembered hearing someone call at once. Was that what fell and outbound flight had sparked in her? If true, it was pretty stupid, particularly at this late date. Unless it was what Luke had suggested earlier. That there were still things about the Empire that she was reluctant to let go of. She took a deep breath, let it out quietly. 
Luke was still awake, too, she knew, watching her emotions swirl around, ready to join her in her struggle whenever she was ready to invite him in. She reached over and found his hand. We're supposed to be doing Jedi healing trances, right? She murmured. He took the hint. Right, he murmured back. I love you. I love you too, she said. Good night. Good night. She closed her eyes, settling herself more comfortably against the pillow and stretching out to the force. After all, Luke had accepted her, dark past and all. If he could do it, she certainly ought to be able to. Mara's breathing slowed, her mind and emotions quieting as she slipped into the healing trance. Luke watched her lovingly as she went silent, then gently disengaged his hand from hers and rolled over to face the opposite wall. It had been a long and busy day, and he had his own burns to deal with. He'd best get to it. But the calmness and concentration necessary for the healing trance refused to come. Something was going on aboard this ship, something wrapped in a dark and murky purpose. Someone aboard, maybe more than one someone, was going to outbound flight for some other reason besides respect or penance. He shifted his shoulders uncomfortably beneath the weight of the blankets. But then, to be perfectly honest, didn't he have an ulterior reason of his own for being here? Of course he did. Outbound flight was a relic from the last, turbulent days of the Old Republic, its existence, and records offering the chance to fill in some of the gaps in the New Republic's history of that period. But even more importantly, it might offer a detailed look into the ways and organization of that last generation of the full Jedi Order. There might be information aboard that would fill in the gaps in his own knowledge and understanding, showing him what he was doing right and, more importantly, what he was doing wrong. He grimaced in the darkness. Luke Skywalker, Jedi Master The Jedi Master, as far as most of the New Republic was concerned. Founder, teacher, and leader of the resurgent Jedi Order. How in the worlds had he wound up in this position anyway? How was it that he had been loaded with the responsibility for rebuilding something that had taken past generations centuries or more to create? Because he had been all that there was, that was how. When gone am I, Yoda had said in those final moments, the last of the Jedi will you be. Pass on what you have learned. He'd done his best to live up to Yoda's command. But sometimes, too many times, his best hadn't been enough. Yoda's training had helped, but not enough. The holocron had helped, but not enough. Advice and correction from Leia and Mara had helped, but not enough. Was there something that had survived aboard outbound flight that might also help? He didn't know. To be honest, he was almost afraid to find out. He was going to search for it just the same, because he had to. He and Mara had both felt the gentle but unmistakable leading of the Force in accepting Formby's invitation, and he knew too well that ignoring that nudge would bring bitter regret somewhere down the line. For good or evil, they were going to outbound flight. And who could tell? Maybe there was even something aboard that would finally lay to rest his questions about Jedi marriage. Dissenting opinions from other Jedi Masters, perhaps or even an indication that the whole order had been wrong in the prohibition. But he wouldn't know until they arrived. And he might as well arrive healthy. Taking a deep breath, letting the doubts and concerns slide away from him, he stretched out to the force. All the noise and bustle in the corridors outside had died down by the time Dean Ginsler put aside his data pad and started getting ready for bed. It had been a long, strange day, full of odd people and odd events, and he was tired with the kind of weariness that had haunted him for so much of his adult life. And yet, at the same time, there was a fresh excitement underlying the fatigue. An excitement, 
and a darkly simmering dread. Outbound Flight After half a century, he was finally going to see the huge, mysterious project that had taken Lorana away from the Republic. He would stand where she had stood, see what she had seen. Perhaps, if he was very lucky, he would even be able to catch an echo of the idea or goal that had captured her own imagination, and to which she had dedicated her life. And he would see where that all-too-short life had ended. He gazed at his reflection in the refresher station mirror as he cleaned his face and teeth. Behind the lines and wrinkles, he could still see a hint of the much younger face that had sneered at Lorana and resented her for so many years, the face that had sent her off without even a proper farewell. The eyes gazing back at him, had her eyes been that same shade of grey? He couldn't remember. But whatever the color, he knew her eyes hadn't been cold and hard like his, but warm and alive and compassionate. Even toward him, who hadn't deserved any compassion at all. The hard set to his mouth hadn't been there, of course, way back then. Or maybe it had. He'd carried this edge of quiet bitterness with him for a long time. Rather like that young woman he'd met earlier, the stray thought occurred to him, that Mara Jade Skywalker. There was an air of old and bittersweet memory about her, too. For all the evidence of recent smoothing he could see in her face, it was clear that some of those memories would take a long time to fade. Some memories, of course, never faded completely, no matter how much one might wish them to. He was living proof of that. He finished in the refresher and stepped back into the bedchamber. And yet, for all the traces of old hardness and cynicism he could see in her face, he also knew that it had been Mara who had made the final decision not to expose him to form by. That made him nervous all by itself. Compassion was something he'd long ago learned to dislike, and compassion from Jedi was even more ominous. Jedi, if you believe the old stories and New Republic propaganda, were supposed to be able to read people's characters and attitudes with a single glance. Could they also read minds and thoughts and intentions? If so, what exactly had Mara read in him? He snorted. Nonsense. How in the name of Outer Rim Bug Eaters could she possibly read his feelings when he himself couldn't even sort them out? He didn't have an answer. Maybe she would, if he asked her. Or maybe she would just decide that her mercy and second chances would be better spent on someone else, and turn him into form by after all. No. The chance cube had been thrown, and all he could do now was to sit back and see it through to the end. And as for the Jedi, his best bet would be to simply keep his distance from both of them. Turning off the light, he settled himself down into the bed and tried to push back the memories long enough to sleep. Chapter 8 The next two days went by quietly. Luke spent much of the time with the Jurons, poring over New Republic planetary listings and trying hard to be patient with their continual and wearying mixture of hero worship and eagerness to please. Between world searches he tried to draw out some details of their encounter with outbound flight but their stories seemed so confused and half-mythic that he soon gave up the effort. Clearly, none of these particular Jurons had been there, and those who had hadn't done a very good job of reporting the event. He didn't see Mara much during that time except at meals and in the evenings after they had settled in for the night. But a comparison of notes showed she was doing far better at the task of information gathering than he was. With Fisa as her guide, she had begun a methodical study of the Chaff Envoy and its crew. Her first task had been to confirm some numbers. It turned out Fell had been right about the crew complement. Besides General Drass there were four officers, thirty other crew members, and twelve line soldiers, making a total of forty-seven wearing the black defense fleet uniforms. Formed by staff, in contrast, consisted only of Fisa and two other members of the Chaff family. 
She never did get a proper explanation as to why Formby was traveling so light, though Fisa did mention that under normal circumstances the entire ship's crew would have been chaff, with no defense fleet personnel present at all. Eventually, she and Luke concluded that he had been right about the nine families' reluctance to have a single family get too much of the credit for the outbound flight expedition. The credit, or anything else that might come out of it. The Chiss, for the most part, seemed fairly neutral to Mara's presence and the various questions she put to them during her tour. Drask continued to be gruffly polite when she ran into him. Though there was no way of knowing how much of the courtesy was because of Mara's own status, and how much was the fact that Formby's aide was standing right there, ready to report any slippage in proper behavior toward the Aristocrat's guests. Formby was even busier than the general, spending most of his time consulting in private with his other two staffers, Drask, or Talshib and the other ship's officers. Mara saw him a few times, but only at a distance and usually in deep conversation with someone else. After that first formal evening meal together, he also began eating elsewhere, leaving his host duties mainly to Fisa and Talshib's officers. As near as she could tell, Fell and his stormtroopers also kept largely to themselves and mostly out of sight of everyone else. On the handful of occasions outside of mealtimes when she ran into Fell, he was cordial enough, though she reported sensing a certain preoccupation beneath the surface. Neither of them mentioned the stolen data cards. And though she readily admitted she couldn't prove it, she also had the distinct impression that Dean Ginsler was avoiding her. If so, Luke mused, and particularly under the current circumstances, it was probably not the smartest move he could have made. Though Mara didn't actually say so, it wasn't hard for him to read between the lines and see that by the middle of the second day she had set herself the task of deliberately seeking Ginsler out wherever and whenever she could. Even with that, though, the man was mostly successful in not letting himself be found. That irritated Mara all the more, and at one point Luke had to endure a prickly late-night hour in their quarters when he suggested to her that she might want to ease back a bit. Finally, thankfully, Late in the evening of the second day, Formby summoned his passengers to the command center observation deck. But not, as it turned out, for the reason everybody thought. I welcome you to Brass Goteo Command Station, Formby announced, gesturing to the double pyramid-shaped mass of glistening white metal floating in the center of the main viewing display. It is here where you must all pause and consider. There was a multiple buzz from the Jeruns, like a cluster of honey darters hovering over a promising flower bush. Pause and consider what? Bearshast? Are we not arrived at outbound flight? We are not, Formby said. As I said, you are here to consider. But we were told we had arrived, Bersh persisted, sounding as upset as Luke had ever heard him. Small wonder, really, given the extent to which the Jeruns had dressed for the occasion. Not only were they wearing elaborate robes covered with tooled metal filaments that looked to be twice as heavy as their usual garb, but all of them had also come to the meeting outfitted with their own shoulder-slung wolfkill body. Added to the already uncomfortable heat of the Chiss ship, they must have been sweltering under their loads. We have arrived at the point where the difficult part of the journey begins. Formby told him patiently. All must hear of the dangers we will face, then make a final decision whether you wish to proceed. But... Patience, Steward Bersh. Jinsler soothed the Jurun. Even here, Luke noted, Jinsler was standing as far away from the two Jedi as he could without being obvious about it. Let's hear what he has to say, shall we? Thank you, Ambassador. Formby said, inclining his head toward Jinsler. He gestured behind him, and the double pyramid station vanished from the display. Luke inhaled sharply as a murmur of similar astonishment rippled through the assembled dignitaries. Centered on the display was a stunningly beautiful globular cluster, 
hundreds of stars tightly packed into a compact sphere. The redoubt, formed by identified it. Within this group of stars lies the last refuge of the Chis people should our forces ever be overwhelmed in battle. It is impregnable, impossible for even a determined enemy to quickly or easily penetrate, with war vessels and firepoints scattered throughout. There are also other surprises that nature itself has created for the unwary. Starting with some really tricky navigation, Fell commented. Those stars are awfully close together. Correct, Formby said. And that is where the principal danger lies, to us as well as any potential enemy. He gestured again at the display. As you say, the stars lie close together, and the routes between them have not been entirely mapped out. We will need to travel slowly, making many stops along the way for navigational readings. The journey will take approximately four days. I thought your ships had already located the planetoid where outbound flight crashed, Fell reminded him. Can't we just follow their course? We indeed will use their data as our starting point, formed by confirmed. But inside the redoubt, nothing is ever constant or stable. There is a great deal of radiation to which we will be subjected each time we halt for readings. There are also many planetoids and large cometary bodies that travel on unpredictable paths, driven by the constantly changing battle of gravitational forces. These, too, pose a significant hazard. We waste time, Bearish spoke up. The annoyance had passed, and his voice was calm again. Those of outbound flight gave their lives for us. Shall the Jeruns shy away from danger as we seek to honor their memory? Agreed, Fell said firmly. We're going in. As am I, Jinsler added. We're in too, Luke said, making a unanimous. Thank you, Formby said, inclining his head toward them. Thank you all. Luke felt a strange shiver run up his back. Formby's thanks, of course, had been addressed to all of them. But at the same time, he had the oddest feeling that the words had somehow been specifically directed at him and Mara. Formby turned to the Jeruns. And now, Steward Bersh, you and your companions must say farewell to those aboard your vessel. They cannot accompany us farther, but must wait here for our return. I understand, Bersh said. If you will prepare a signal frequency, I will speak with them. Formby nodded and gestured again. For a few seconds the redoubt cluster remained centered on the display. Then the image cleared away to reveal a Jerun standing in front of the children's playground they had seen earlier. You may speak, Formby said. Bearish drew himself up to his full height and began speaking in an alien language whose sing-song tones ran mostly to two-part harmony. The kind of language, Luke decided, that a species with twin mouths might logically be expected to create. Formby had drifted off to one side and was gazing down into the command center. Trying to be unobtrusive, Luke drifted over to join him. Master Skywalker, Formby greeted him softly. I'm pleased you will be accompanying us the rest of the way. That's why we came, Luke reminded him. I was wondering exactly how tricky the navigation is going to be for this trip. Formby smiled, his glowing eyes glittering in the relative dimness of the observation deck. It won't be simple, but it certainly won't be impossible either, he said. Why do you ask? There are some Jedi techniques that can help with hyperspace navigation, Luke told him. Especially with something as complicated and crowded as this redoubt cluster. We can sometimes find easier or safer routes than an NAV computer can come up with. An interesting thought, Formby said. I wish we could have borrowed some of you Jedi when we first set out to study the cluster. Many lives would undoubtedly have been saved. Luke frowned. 
Are you saying you only just started building this haven? I make a small joke. Formby admitted. No, we began studying the cluster more than 200 years ago, before we even knew of your existence. He turned back to gaze at the Jeruns on the display. Though I will also say that it has only been in the past 50 years that the work has been set at the current pace of urgency. He conceded. Fortunately, it now nears completion. I see, Luke said. Fifty years ago, just about the time outbound flight made its appearance in this area. Was the Old Republic the determined enemy that had worried the Chiss so much that they'd started in earnest to build a place to hide? Or could they have foreseen the rise of Palpatine and the Empire? Thrawn might have, certainly, if the other leaders had been willing to listen to him. It would probably have worked, too. Even a man as arrogant as Grand Moff Tarkin might have hesitated before taking his Death Star into a maze like that. I see now why your people don't need to bother with preemptive strikes, he commented. With a refuge like this, you can afford to let any enemy take the first shot. Formed by swiveled sharply to face him. That has nothing to do with the redoubt, he said stiffly. It is completely and purely a matter of honor and morality. The Chiss are never to be the aggressor people. We cannot and will not make war against any until and unless we have been attacked. That has been our law for a thousand years, Master Skywalker, and we will not bend from it. I understand, Luke said hastily, taken aback by the vehemence of Formby's response. No wonder Thrawn and his aggressive military philosophy had rubbed these people backward. I didn't mean to imply anything else. Please forgive me for not making myself clear. Yes, of course, Formby said, the fire in his eyes fading somewhat as he pulled himself back under control. And forgive me in turn for my outburst. The subject... Let's simply say that it's been a matter of strenuous discussion in recent days among the nine ruling families. Luke lifted an eyebrow. Oh? Yes, formed by said in a tone that said, drop the subject. At any rate, I thank you for your offer of assistance, but your Jedi powers of navigation should not be needed. Luke bowed. As you wish, Aristocra. If you choose to reconsider, we stand ready to assist. Turning, he headed back toward where Mara was standing, wondering yet again how Leia could make this diplomacy stuff look so simple. The Jeruns, he noted, seemed to be near the end of their conversation. The alien on the display was humming something that sounded like a cross between a military fanfare and a Hutti's opera excerpt, and Bersh had just started his equally musical reply. What was that all about? Mara asked as Luke came up beside her. I was offering form by our help in navigating the redoubt, Luke said, frowning. There was a new tension in his wife's face that hadn't been there when he'd left a minute ago. He says they can do it themselves. What's wrong? I don't know, Mara said, her eyes narrowed as she swept her gaze slowly around the room. Something just hit me. Something bad? Luke suggested, stretching out to the force as he tried to read the pattern of her thoughts. Something dangerous? Something not right, she said. Something very much not right. Not dangerous, I don't think, at least not in and of itself. Just not right. Across the observation deck, the two-toned music stopped. Thank you, Aristocra Formby, Bersh said, switching back to his stilted basic. After the Jerun language, the words sounded startlingly drab. My people express regret that they cannot all pay homage to the heroes of outbound flight, but we understand your concerns. His mouths made quick chopping motions. At any rate, our vessel would most certainly not survive the voyage. And if the Jeroen people perish, what use then would be outbound flight's sacrifice? What use, indeed, 
formed by agreed. Turning toward the command floor, he lifted his voice. We are ready, Captain Talshib, he called. Take us to outbound flight. Fisa had called this place the Forward Observation Lounge during their inspection tour of the Chaff Anva. Jinsler remembered as he sipped the drink he'd brought with him and gazed out the curved viewport stretching across the entire end of the room in front of him. It had had a spectacular view of the Chis Starscape at the time, as well as a large collection of comfortable-looking chairs and couches, and he'd made a mental note to come back later after things had quieted down. Now, of course, half a standard hour into their trip to outbound flight, the view wasn't nearly so interesting. Hyperspace, after all, looked pretty much the same anywhere you went. But the couch was still comfortable, he had his drink and his solitude, and they were on their way to outbound flight. At the moment, that was all he asked out of life. He lifted his glass to the mottled patterns of hyperspace streaming by. To Lorena, he gave a silent toast. Behind him, the lounge door slid open. Hello? A voice called tentatively. Jinsler sighed. So much for the solitude part. Hello? He called back. This is Dean, Ambassador Jinsler. He corrected himself. Oh? The other said tentatively and as Jinsler turned he could see a shadowy figure move into the darkness. I am Estash. Do I intrude? One of the Jurans. The youngest, in fact, if Jinsler was remembering the introductions correctly. No, of course not, he assured the alien. Come in. Thank you, Estash said, groping his way through the maze of furniture to Jinsler's couch. What do you do here? Nothing, really, Jinsler said. I was just watching the light years fly past and thinking about outbound flight. They were a great people, Estash said softly, sitting gingerly down beside Jinsler. Which of course makes you yourself a great person, he hastened to add. Jinsler grimaced in the dark. Perhaps, he said. You are great, Estash insisted. Even if you do not feel it. Thank you, Jinsler said. Tell me, what do you know about what happened? I was not yet alive at that time, so I know only what I have been told, Estash said. I know that long before your people arrived the Vigari came to our worlds, conquering and destroying and taking everything of value to themselves. They used us as laborers and craftspeople and slaves. They sent us into unsafe mines and dangerous mountains, and forced us to walk before them on warfields that we might die instead of them. He gave a shiver that shook the whole couch. They wore us down until we were almost nothing. And then outbound flight came? Estash sighed deeply, a sound like a whistle in a deep cave. You cannot imagine it, Ambassador Jinsler, he said. Suddenly they were there before us, weapons blazing from all directions, shattering our oppressors' vessels and destroying them. Ahead, the churning hyperspace sky faded abruptly into starlines, and the starlines collapsed into a brilliant mass of stars. Must be one of the navigation stops Aristocra form by mentioned, Jinsler commented, gazing out at the view. Impressive, isn't it? Indeed, Estash said. It is a shame the Chiss have no worlds here they would be willing to give us. To live here among such beauty. Quiet, Jinsler cut him off, listening hard as a quiet warning bell went off in the back of his mind. Something was wrong. Abruptly it clicked. The engines, he said, scrambling to his feet. You feel that? They're sputtering. Yes, Estash breathed. Yes, I do. What does it mean? It means something's wrong with them, Jinsler said. Or with the control lines. Or, he added grimly, 
with the people in the command center. Mara had just pulled off her boots in preparation for bed when the deck seemed to shiver beneath her feet. She paused, stretching out to the force, all her senses alert. Luke? Yes, he murmured, frowning in concentration. Feels like something funny's going on with the engines. They've picked up a wobble, Mara said, flipping her legs up over the edge of the bed and rolling across to Luke's side, the side that had the calm panel. Stretching out, she jabbed the button. Command Center, this is Jedi Skywalker, she called. What's going on? There is nothing to be worried about, Jedi Skywalker, a chiss voice answered. There is a problem with the control lines to the aft end of the vessel. What kind of problem? It is not your concern, the voice said tartly. It is a small problem only, and we will deal with it. Stay in your quarters. There was a click as the connection was cut from the other end. I can hear the soothing tones of General Draft's voice in that order, Luke said, grabbing his shirt and starting to put it back on. Sounds like he's been talking to his people about us. We going to check it out anyway? Mara asked, rolling back to where she'd left her boots. Actually, I was thinking we might try a different approach, Luke said, finishing with his shirt and reaching for his lightsaber. We've already seen one noisy diversion aboard this ship, and there's a lot of the same smell to this one. I agree, Mara said, picking up her own lightsaber. He said the problem is aft. We go forward? You've been studying the ship. What's up there someone might be interested in? All sorts of good stuff, she told him. Forward navigational sensors, meteor defense systems, shield generators, some crew quarters, and bulk storage. Including food? Best of all, not very far back from the bow is the commander's glider. The hyperdrive-capable boat Fell told us about. That's the one, Mara said. Pick your target. Well, you can't expect him to make it easy on us, Luke said philosophically. Here's the plan. You head for the bow along the main starboard corridor, watching for anyone or anything suspicious. I'll backtrack past the Jurun shuttle, see if there's any unusual activity in that area, then cross over to port side and check out the Imperial's transport. If everything looks okay, I'll head forward along the port side corridor and meet you at the bow. Sounds good, Mara said. See you there. And watch yourself. You too. The starboard corridor was largely deserted as Mara made her way forward, her senses alert for trouble. Most of the on-duty crewers were apparently aft, dealing with the engine trouble, while the rest were either snugged comfortably in their beds or engaged in other late-evening relaxations. The fact that the whole crew had obviously not been turned out implied that Drask did indeed consider the problem to be a minor one. Just the sort of Loki not-quite-crisis-level event their mysterious data card thief might use for his next bit of sleight of hand. She just wished she knew which of the possible targets he was after this time. Still, with a little luck, maybe she'd get a chance to ask him. She was nearly to the bow when the corridor lights abruptly went out. She froze in her tracks pressing her back against the side wall in a pocket of shadow thrown by a misaimed emergency light. Wisps of sensation seemed to swirl around her as she stretched out with the force, marking the presence of thoughts and emotions somewhere ahead. Someone was definitely moving around nearby. Maybe two someones. Maybe even three. She scowled to herself, 
peering into the darkness as she fought to push the hazy impressions into something solid. Between the Chis and Jeruns, the presence of so many unfamiliar minds surrounding her was severely limiting her ability to focus. There, ahead and to the right? Was that one of the beings she was sensing? And then, from a side corridor in that direction, came a barely audible clink, as if someone had brushed the bulkhead with something hard. Holding her lightsaber ready, she slipped toward the archway leading into the corridor, keeping to the shadows as much as she could. There was another faint clink as she reached the archway, this one much closer. She pressed her back to the wall and lifted her lightsaber high, thumb ready on the activator. For a second she held the pose. Then, in a sudden smooth surge of motion, she swung around, igniting her lightsaber as she rotated, and planted herself in combat stance squarely in the center of the archway. To find herself facing an Imperial Stormtrooper as he simultaneously swung out from behind a coolant pump into the same stance, his Blastek E-11 pointed squarely back at her. Mara's first impulse, from somewhere deep in the dark corners of her mind, was to lower her weapon and order him to lower his. Her second impulse, from a more recent frame of reference, was to slash the blue lightsaber blade forward and cut him in half. Her final impulse, as her brain finally caught up with the conflicting reflexes, was to simply do nothing. Fortunately, perhaps, the stormtrooper himself seemed to have no such confusion of loyalties or responses. Even as Mara fought back the urge to kill, he snapped the muzzle of his weapon upward away from her. Jedi Skywalker, he said. My apologies. No problem, Mara said, fighting the words out through a momentarily stiff throat as she closed down her lightsaber. That unexpected surge of past patterns had been incredibly disconcerting. What are you doing here? Commander Fell heard of the problem with the ship's engines and ordered me to secure the bow from potential danger, he said. You. Same thing, Mara said, peering down the darkened corridor over his shoulder. You find anything? The area around the glider appears secure, he said. My intention was to continue forward and check the shield generators. Fine, Mara said. We'll go together. Acknowledged, he said. Without asking, he stepped past her and moved into point position, ahead and slightly to Mara's left. In silence, they continued forward. They had gone perhaps ten more meters when Mara caught a glimpse of something ahead. Hold, she murmured running through the Jedi sight enhancement techniques as they stopped. It hadn't been a movement she'd seen, exactly, but something else. The stormtrooper, with his helmet's own vision enhancements, got it first. We're looking through the archway into the shield generator room, he murmured back. That was a reflection from the generator shell. Right, Mara agreed trying to overlay the view ahead onto her mental schematic of this part of the ship. A reflection off the semi-spherical cap of the shield generator meant someone was inside the room, moving port, and possibly aft. Unfortunately, there were three other exits from the compartment in that direction, one heading aft toward the shield monitor room behind it, one heading forward toward a small cluster of crew quarters and the third all the way across the chamber to a mirror image archway into the port side corridor. Three possible ways out, with only her and one stormtrooper available to cover them all. Except that Luke should be on his way toward that far port side exit. Luke? She sent out the mental call. Coming, the reply came, accompanied by a glimpse of the port side corridor. It was apparently as dark over there as it was on this side of the ship, but he seemed to be making good progress, and she had the sense that he was nearby. At any rate, they couldn't afford to wait any longer. All right, she murmured to the stormtrooper. You keep going straight ahead. Make sure he doesn't double back and get out through the starboard archway up there. 
If it looks like you can do it without risking him getting behind you, go ahead and sweep him portside. I'll head back to that last cross corridor and try to cut him off before he can get out through the monitor room. Acknowledged, the stormtrooper said. Lifting his blostek, he moved cautiously forward. Mara didn't wait to see how he fared, but turned and moved as quickly and silently as possible back to the cross corridor. Unlike the main passageway, this one had several jogs in it as it wended its way around and between rooms of various sizes and shapes. That meant more cover for her, of course. Unfortunately, it also meant she wouldn't get a glimpse of the exit she was trying to block until she was practically on top of it. Setting her teeth, stretching out to the force, she headed in. She'd gone maybe five steps when the whole thing fell completely apart. From somewhere ahead came a sharp shout and the sudden scuffle of running feet. Breathing a curse, Mara ducked ahead around the next jog in the corridor, coming into view of the generator room exit just in time to see the reflected blue flash of a Chischarik heat weapon. Someplace in the distance, over the ruckus, she heard the distinctive snap hiss of Luke's lightsaber. Sprinting to the doorway, she ducked through. There was just the briefest flicker of warning, and she barely got her lightsaber ignited in time to block another Charic blast that would have burned her upper right shoulder if it had gotten through. Hold it! She snapped, ducking back into the relative protection of the doorway as another pair of Charic bolts shot past her face. Halt! A harsh chiss voice countered. Identify! Who do you think? Mara shot back. How many people have you got aboard with lightsabers? For a moment there was no reply. But at least the shooting had stopped. Very well, Jedi Skywalker, the Chiss said in a somewhat more polite tone. Come forward. Warily, Mara stepped into the room. Over by the starboard shield generator to her right were two armed Chiss dressed in leisure clothing apparently having come straight from the crew quarters a couple of corridors away. Behind them was the stormtrooper she'd sent in, his Blostek held in ready position across his chest. Possibly the reason they'd stopped shooting at her, the cynical thought crossed her mind. She turned her head to her left. At the far end of the generator room, Luke was coming toward the party from the port side archway his lightsaber blade looking brighter than usual in the gloom. And in the long gap between Luke and the Chiss, standing straight and tall and yet looking strangely vulnerable and forlorn, was Dean Jinsler. Chapter 9 There's really nothing to tell. Jinsler protested as Mara led him to one of the lounge's couches and gave him a not entirely gentle push down onto it. I was sitting right here, watching the stars, when the lights went out. Were you alone? Luke asked, stretching out with the force. The man clearly knew he was in trouble, yet was amazingly calm for all that. It was the sort of calm Luke had seen before, sometimes in a person who no longer had anything to lose. Unfortunately, he'd also seen it in people with hidden tricks up their sleeves or in people who fully believed they could lie their way out of anything. So far, he still couldn't tell which category Jinsler fit into. By then I was, Jinsler said. A little earlier I'd been talking with one of the Jeruns, Astash, the young one, but he left when the engines started acting up. He said he was worried there was going to be another fire. I stayed here until the lights went out, as I said at which point I decided something serious must be happening and started back toward my quarters. In the ceiling above them, the lights abruptly came back on. That part, at least, was apparently fixed. Why did you go through the Chiss quarters? Luke asked. Why didn't you use one of the outer corridors? They're better lit. Yes, I know. Jinsler shrugged. I didn't really think about it, I suppose. At any rate, I heard someone moving around in the darkness and went to investigate. 
like a complete idiot, Mara pointed out, standing behind him. Suppose he'd taken a shot at you? Jinsler's lips compressed briefly. I guess I didn't think about that, either. Mara glowered a look over his head at Luke. Luke shrugged microscopically. He couldn't detect any lie either. Which, unfortunately, wasn't conclusive proof one way or the other. All right, so you heard someone, he said. What did you see? Jinsler shook his head. Nothing, I'm afraid. Whoever it was must have heard me coming, because there was no one in the generator room when I got there. I was looking around, trying to see if I could spot anything out of place, when all of you burst in on me. Luke looked back at the lounge door, where the stormtrooper and the two Chiss were silently observing the interrogation. The Chiss, he noted, had made a point of standing as far away from the armored Imperial as they could without abandoning the doorway entirely. Thank you all for your assistance, he told them. Jedi Skywalker and I will handle it from here. You may return to your other duties. He was found in a restricted area, one of the Chiss said stiffly. He must answer to General Drask. He's an ambassador from the New Republic government. Luke countered. There are certain rights and privileges associated with that title. Furthermore, I don't remember General Drask or Aristaka form by saying anything about any part of the ship being restricted. What about him? The other Chiss demanded, jabbing a contemptuous finger toward the stormtrooper. He cannot claim ambassador's privileges. He was with me, Mara said. Or were you planning to deny ambassador's privileges to me, as well? The Chiss looked at each other, and Luke held his breath. Technically, either he nor Mara had any official standing here, apart from being Formby's guests. He still didn't know what had gone wrong with the chaff envoy's lights and engines, but he suspected Drask would be perfectly justified in declaring a state of emergency and confining all Nanches to their quarters. In which case, Mara's attempt to pull rank might be looked upon very suspiciously, reflecting not only on them but on Formby as well. In the subtle pull war going on between the two Chiss leaders, that might have long-reaching consequences. But for now, at least, the crewers didn't seem inclined to make a challenge out of it. We will wait in the corridor, the first Chiss said. When you are finished here, we will escort you back to the public areas of the vessel. He looked at the stormtrooper. The faceless soldier is invited to return to his proper place right now, he added. The stormtrooper stirred, as if choosing from among the various possible responses. Go ahead, Mara said before he could pick one. Please thank Commander Fell for your assistance. Acknowledged. Swiveling in a crisp military about-face, the stormtrooper disappeared out the door. The two Chiss gave short bows and followed. Quietly, Luke let out the breath he'd been holding. One of the best things about stormtroopers, he reflected, was their willingness to instantly and unquestioningly obey orders. It was, of course, also one of the worst things about them. All right, Jinsler he said, pulling a chair up in front of the older man and sitting down facing him. We've been very patient with you up to now. But game time is over. We want to know who you are and what you're doing here. I know you've been patient, Jinsler said, nodding. And I very much appreciate it. I know you've both stuck your necks out for me. Stalling time is over too, Mara interrupted coming around from behind the couch to face him, remaining on her feet as she leveled the full weight of her stare down at him. Let's hear it. Jinsler sighed, some of the stiffness going out of his shoulders as he dropped his gaze to the deck. My name's Dean Jinsler, just as I told you, he said. I work sort of on the edges of Talon Card's intelligence organization. We know all that, Mara cut him off again. 
What are you doing here? A gentleman came to me a little over eight weeks ago, Jinsler said. A rather old gentleman, flying a spacecraft of a type I'd never seen before. What was his name? Luke asked. Jinsler hesitated. He said he didn't want me spreading it around, but I suppose you two would be all right. He said his name was Cardas. Luke looked at Mara, feeling a ripple of shock from her that echoed his own surprise. That was a name he remembered quite well. Cardas? Mara demanded. George Cardas? He said he'd once been an associate of cards. Do you know him? Never met the man, Mara said, her voice carefully neutral. Though not from lack of trying. How do you know him? I don't really, Jinsler said. I'd never seen him before that day. He came to me and suggested, strongly, that I put in for a transfer to the sector relay post at Kamra. He said there would likely be a message coming through soon that would be of great personal interest to me. And you just went? Luke asked. Not even knowing who he was. I know it sounds crazy, Jinsler admitted. But frankly, I had nowhere else to be just then. Besides, there was something about him. He trailed off. Okay, so you transferred to Kamra, Mara said. I take it this message he mentioned was the transmission address to Luke that you filched? Jinsla winced. Yes, he admitted. It showed up about, oh, I guess it was a little over a week ago now. I, he looked up at Mara, his lip twitching in a slightly shamefaced smile. I filched it, grabbed one of our courier ships, and headed for the rendezvous point Formby had specified. Only the ship didn't make it, Luke commented. Jinsler blinked. How did you know that? We're Jedi, Luke reminded the other pointedly. What happened? The hyperdrive gave out in the Flakaria system, Jinsler said. It would have taken me more than a week to repair it by myself, and I didn't have enough money to hire out the job. Fortunately, at that point Cardas showed up again and offered me a lift. Really? Mara said. What an intriguing coincidence. Jinsla lifted a hand, palm upward. Maybe he was following me to make sure I got here okay. I never saw him on my sensors, but with a courier that doesn't mean a whole lot. He did say. He broke off. He did say what? Luke prompted. It didn't make any sense to me, Jinsler said. All he said was that he was trying to fulfill a promise he'd been neglecting for a very long time. Did he say what that promise was? Mara asked. Or to whom it had been made? Neither, Jinsler said. Actually, the way he said it, I had the odd impression he wasn't talking to me so much as he was talking to himself. Okay, Luke said. Go on. That's all there is, really, Jinsler said. We came into the outer crust eye system and Cardas sent a message in. Formby came out in the chaff endless glider and picked me up. What did he think of Cardas? Mara asked. Or had Cardas left by then? Actually, the two of them had a long talk together while I was transferring across to the glider, Jinsler said. I didn't understand the language, but it sounded a lot like the one the Jeruns were speaking when they first arrived. They finished their conversation, I introduced myself as Ambassador Jinsler from Coruscant, and Formby brought me back to the ship. And that was that. Luke nodded. Straightforward enough and they could presumably confirm some of the details with Formby. Assuming Formby was willing to talk about it, of course. Okay, that's the how, he said. Now let's hear the why. 
There was a Jedi aboard outbound flight, Jinsler said. Well, actually there were several Jedi aboard. This particular one was named Lorana Jinsler. He seemed to brace himself. She was my sister. He stopped. Luke frowned at Mara, caught her own suspicious puzzlement. And? He prompted. What do you mean, and? Jinsler asked. So your sister died with outbound flight, and you wanted to go pay your respects to her memory, Luke said. So what was so dark and personal that you couldn't tell us earlier? Jinsler lowered his eyes, his hands wrapping tightly together in his lap. We didn't part on very good terms, he said at last. I'd rather not say any more if you don't mind. Luke felt his lip twist. More evasion, which seemed to be an integral part of this man. But at the same time there was the sense of truth to his pattern of thought and emotion. He glanced a question at Mara, caught her reluctant agreement. All right, he said. We'll let that part sit for now. But... He let the word hang in the air a moment like a threatening sandstorm in the distance. We may need to hear more before we're done here, he continued. If and when that time comes, you will tell us everything. Clear? Jinsler straightened up. Clear, he agreed. And thank you? Don't thank us yet, Luke warned, nodding toward the door. The chiss are waiting. Go back to your quarters. And the next time you think you hear something suspicious, use one of the corridor comm panels to call it in, Mara added. If you'd done that, we might have caught him. I understand, Jinsler said. I'll see you in the morning. He crossed the lounge and disappeared into the corridor. Well? Luke asked as the door slid shut behind him. What do you think? For starters, I'm getting tired of this piecemeal approach. Mara growled, stalking over to the viewport and leaning against it as she stared out at the stars. I'd like nothing better than to sit him down and drag the whole story out of him. With hydrogrips, if necessary. You really think that's the best way to approach it? Luke asked, crossing to the viewport to stand beside her. No, of course not, she said with a sigh. I just wish we could, that's all. At least we've got a few new puzzle pieces to work with, Luke pointed out. Let's start with George Cardas. You think this is the same man Card asked you and Lando to try to track down ten years ago? Who else could it be? Mara countered. Contacting someone working for Card's organization and flying a ship that wasn't a New Republic design? No, it's got to be him. What makes you think his ship wasn't a New Republic design? Jinsler has a certificate in hyperdrive tech, Mara reminded him. If he didn't recognize the ship, it had to be something pretty exotic. Hmm, Luke said. I don't suppose you ever got Card to open up about who Cardas actually was. Card, no, Mara said. But I was able to coax a bit out of Shada a couple of years ago. Apparently sometime in or around the Clone Wars era Cardas started up a smuggling operation, building it up into something that rivaled even the Hutt's organizations. A few years after that, he suddenly and mysteriously disappeared and one of his lieutenants took over for him. Card? Right, Mara said. No one apparently heard anything of or from Cardas until you found that beckon call on Dagoba after Thrawn's return and Card sent Lando and me out hunting for him. When the commas document crisis hit three years ago and the New Republic started to tear itself apart over what to do about the Bothans, Card and Shada took the wild card and went out hunting for him themselves. Did they find him? Shada was rather evasive on that point, but it seems clear that they did, Mara said. 
Reading between the lines, I'd also guess Cardos had something to do with the dramatic collapse of that Return of Thrawn hysteria that happened while we were out on Nerwin. She also mentioned a huge data card library that she said rivaled the official New Republic archives on Coruscant. Card's former mentor, Luke murmured thoughtfully. And Card with his deep and abiding interest in gathering information. It fits, I suppose. What fits? Mara asked. The bit about Cardos knowing something was in the works and pointing Jinsler to exactly the right place at the right time to intercept an incoming message? Guessing the right place, at least, wouldn't have taken anything special, Luke pointed out. Kamra's the logical spot to pick up a transmission coming from Nirwin or Chiss space. If Cardos knew or guess Formby would be contacting us, that's where the message would come through. That assumes he knew the message was on its way, Mara pointed out. Right, Luke agreed. And that part would have taken something special. Though even there you'll notice he seemed to be a bit off on his timing. Jinsler was at the station a good seven weeks before the message came through. Maybe Formby had to argue with the nine families longer than he expected before he got permission to contact us, Mara suggested. You can't dock Cardas points for someone else's bureaucracy. I suppose not, Luke conceded. There's also the question of how he could have found out about Jinsler and his sister. Yes, Jinsler's sister, Mara growled. I presume you've noticed that up until a couple of days ago there would have been a perfect way to check out that part of his story. Luke nodded. Fell's outbound flight operational manual and its personnel lists. Except that it was stolen, Mara said. And now all of a sudden he comes up with a sister. Convenient timing, wouldn't you say? I might, Luke had to admit. But that's not proof that he took the manual. We're not exactly rolling in proof on any part of this, Mara pointed out. Still, if Jinsler didn't take the cards, who did? And why? I don't know, Luke said, half turning to look back toward the lounge exit. Right now, I'm more intrigued by the question of what someone was doing lurking in the dark up here. Unless you think Jinsler made that part up to try to deflect suspicion from himself. Oddly enough, I don't, Mara said slowly. He strikes me as being too smart to trot out such a lame story without dressing it up a bit. Luke frowned. Dressing it up how? Suppose he wanted to do some mischief in the shield generator room, Mara said. Say, someplace over at the starboard end. The first thing a real professional would do when he got inside would be to go to the port side end and open one of the storage cabinets there. Not too obviously, but enough to see if you were looking for it. Then, if he gets caught, he still spins his story about chasing down an intruder, but adds that he got a glimpse of someone over by the port side cabinets before he took off. The investigators go to look, and they find the open cabinet. Luke said, nodding his understanding. Right, Mara said. Not only does it make his story play better, but it also automatically shifts attention away from his real target. Luke nodded. Simple, but effective. All the best tricks are, Mara agreed. It's basically the same thing we assumed our saboteur was doing right from the start, drawing attention to the engines then going and hitting something in the bow. Right, Luke said. Assuming the engine thing was a diversion. Also true, Mara admitted. It could just as well be that that was a genuine accident, and that Jinsler or someone else simply took advantage of it to do some late-night skulking. Luke shook his head. This is starting to make my head hurt, he said. If Jinsler set the fire to steal Fell's outbound flight data, shouldn't that have been the end of it? What would he have needed to do up here? Who knows? Mara said. 
He may be on some special mission, either for Cardas or someone else, and had to steal the operational manual first so that we couldn't crack his story. And since most of what we know comes solely from him, we wouldn't even be able to guess from that what he's really up to. Actually, everything we know about him comes solely from him, Mara corrected. Card told us about Dean Jinsler's background, but we only have our gray-eyed friend's word for it that he really is Dean Jinsler. Luke hissed between his teeth. That one hadn't even occurred to him. Which means what I said about us having a few more puzzle pieces is meaningless, isn't it? They could be pieces to an entirely imaginary puzzle. Mara agreed. And it gets worse. It could even be we have two different sets of late-night skulkers, each with different agendas, working either parallel or at cross-purposes to each other. Don't forget, we had not only Jinsler up here but at least two Chiss crewers and one of Fell's stormtroopers, as well. And if Jinsler's telling the truth, one of the Jeruns, Luke reminded her. All we're missing is form by and drafts to round out the suspect list. Right, Mara said. On the other hand, Jinsler's the only one who got caught where he wasn't supposed to be. How does that story about just happening to head through the Chiss Quarter strike you? It's actually not as far-fetched as it sounds, Luke said. If there was a Jedi in his family, he could easily be force-sensitive enough to be nudged to the right place at the right time without knowing how or why he'd done it. Not many people know enough about Jedi family patterns to spin that sort of subtlety into a lie either. Cardas might have known, Mara said. And whatever he senses or doesn't sense, Jinsler still needed Cardas's advice to get himself transferred to Kamra in time. She waved a hand. Yes, I know that's not the same thing. Still, we do keep coming back to Cardas, don't we? Luke murmured. I wonder what he and Formby might have had to talk about. No idea, Mara said. As far as I know, Card himself never did any work out in the unknown regions. If Cardas made it out this far, it was before he and Card met. Or after Cardas disappeared, Luke pointed out. We don't know anything about him during that period either. Maybe we should go ask Formby. Mara suggested. Sure, why not? Luke said. We need to warn him to check the shield generators anyway. Mara shook her head. I don't think the generators were the target, she said. I think it was something else. Any idea what? Not really, Mara conceded. But if I had to vote... I'd vote for someone putting a tap on the sensor lines. Remember when we were called into the command center earlier this evening and Formby was listing all the dangers we would be facing inside the cluster? Yes, Luke said, wondering where she was going with this. Among the various natural hazards to life and happiness, he also mentioned something called fire points. She went on. I've been meaning to ask him what exactly those are but I think I may have figured it out. She pointed out the viewport. You see that asteroid over there? The one with all the dark spots? Luke peered out into the brilliant star's cape. A spotted asteroid? Yes, he said as he picked it out of the shadows. Ten to one it's either a missile cluster or a fighter nest, Mara said. Those dark spots are almost certainly the ends of launching tubes. A fire point, Luke murmured, studying the asteroid. There were a lot of dark spots on it, too. Aptly named? Very aptly named, Mara agreed. An unfriendly ship that stops here for a NAV check is going to be in for a world of hurt. She looked at Luke, her expression grim in the reflected starlight. Anyone who might be thinking about taking on the Chiss would have a definite interest in locating as many of those defenses as possible. Luke felt his stomach tighten. Fell? Or the Jeruns might have an interested client with an unused planet to swap them, Mara said. 
Jinza could be fronting for someone, too. Cardas? She shrugged. Could be. We do know that Cardas likes collecting information. This would certainly come under that heading. Point, Luke said, taking one last look around at the stars. The last refuge of the Chiss people, Formby had called it. Who out there would be interested in learning its secrets? I think we've pushed this set of puzzle pieces around as much as we can. Let's go see if we can pick up another piece or two. Mara pushed away from the viewport. Form by? Luke nodded. Form by. They found the Aristocra in a service corridor midway between the control center and the main engines, watching in silence as a pair of Chiss crewers dug into an open conduit access panel with long, tongue-like probes. A third crewer stood expectantly by with a sealed metal container. Ah, uh, our noble Jedi. Formed by said as they maneuvered past the workers in the cramped space and came to his side. I understand you've been busy this evening. I see you have, too, Aristocra, Luke pointed out. Have you found the problem? Formed by nodded. Line creepers, as we suspected. Line creepers? Long, slender creatures that chew their way into power and control systems and live on the electrical power generated within, formed by explained. They're a vermin we've worked very hard to destroy or contain. Sounds like conduit worms, Mara commented. That's a type of vermin we've tried hard to destroy. With no more success than we've had, I suspect, formed by said. True, Luke said. What was this particular batch working on? The engine control lines? Yes, Formby said. That's what caused the flutter you apparently felt earlier. We're clearing them out now. What about the lights in the forward part of the ship? Mara asked. Did they get in there too? No, Formby said. It appears someone merely shut them down. Accidentally? Mara asked. Formby's glowing eyes seemed to blaze a bit brighter as he looked at her. What do you think? He countered. We think the Chaff Envoy has some serious problems, Luke said. We're not sure everyone aboard wants this mission to succeed. He stretched out to the force, hoping for a telling reaction. But Formby merely shook his head. You're wrong, Master Skywalker, he said quietly. Everyone aboard very much wishes the mission to succeed. Maybe so, Mara said. But it may not be the same mission as the one you have scheduled. I presume you've heard of the incident in the bow a few minutes ago? Luke asked. I have, Formby said. Captain Talship is already searching for damage or theft in that part of the vessel. Good, Mara said. What did you and George Cardas talk about? Luke had been trying, without success, to spark a reaction from the elderly Chiss. Mara's attempt was just as futile. George Cardas? Formby asked, lifting his eyebrows politely, his composure not even flickering. The human who brought Ambassador Jinsler to Krustai, Mara said. The ambassador said you two spoke at length. Formby smiled faintly. And you suspect something sinister about it? He shook his head. Not at all. He introduced the ambassador to me and listed his credentials and honors. I greeted him in turn and welcomed him on behalf of the Chiss Ascendancy. And you did all this in that trade language, Manisiat? At the time, I doubt he was aware I could speak your new Republic basic, Formby said. And you never met Cardas before? Mara persisted. How could I possibly know anyone from the new Republic? Formby asked patiently. I've never been farther than a few light years outside Chiss space. Ah. Uh, 
he pointed over Luke's shoulder. Luke turned to see one of the workers pull a long, segmented worm from the conduit with his tongs. The third chiss had his container open, and the first eased the worm carefully into the opening. A lion creeper, formed by identified it as the third crewer sealed the container again. A young one too from its size. If left undisturbed long enough, they can grow to be as long as an adult chiss and thick enough to nearly fill a conduit that size. I can see why you don't want them around, Luke said. Any idea how it got in there? Not yet, the aristocrat said. We'll begin a thorough search of the vessel in the morning. His eyes bored into Luke's. Of our vessel and all others associated with it. Of course. Luke said, sensing Mara's sudden wariness. May I ask exactly what this search will entail? For you, it will most likely be non-invasive, Formai assured them. Line creepers exhale a distinctive mixture of gases that is quite easy to detect. If none of those gases is detected in your vessel's compartments, that will be the end of the procedure. And if you do detect any? Mara asked. Then we will of course need to examine those areas more thoroughly, Formby said. But you should have nothing to be concerned about. If you haven't opened your vessel elsewhere in this region of space, it's highly unlikely you could have picked up any vermin. But we must check nevertheless. We understand, Luke said. Actually, if one of these things is aboard the Sabre, we'd be just as glad for you to get rid of it. Is there anything we can do to help? Thank you, but no, Formby said. We'll alert you before entering your vessel, of course. We thank you in turn, Luke said, sensing the dismissal in his tone. We'll see you in the morning, then. One other thing, Formby said as they turned to go. I'm informed that both you and Jedi Skywalker activated your lightsabers during your search this evening. Yes, we did, Mara said. We were hunting a possible saboteur, if you recall. Not to mention defending ourselves against the Chiss warrior with a twitchy trigger finger. Yes, that, Formby said, sounding embarrassed. An unfortunate occurrence. The warriors have been spoken to, and it will not happen again. Something seemed to flicker through the aristocrat's eyes too fast for Luke to catch. But in return, I must ask you not to activate your weapons again as long as you are aboard a vessel of the Chiss Ascendancy. Luke frowned. Not at all. Not at all, Formby said flatly. What if we're in danger? Mara demanded. Or if you or one of your people is in danger? Then of course you may do whatever you deem necessary, Formby said. But General Drask has insisted that the casual waving of alien weapons aboard the Chaff Envoy will no longer be tolerated. Casual? Mara echoed disbelievingly. Aristocra. We understand. Luke hurriedly cut her off. We'll do our best to comply with the General's order. Thank you. Formby said, dipping his head slightly. Until the morning, then. The corridors were deserted as they made their way back. Just the same, Luke waited until they were in the privacy of their quarters before breaking the silence. It made for better security, and also gave his quietly seething wife time to cool down. What do you think? He asked when the door was solidly sealed behind them. My low opinion of General Drass just dropped a few points, she said darkly. Of all the stupid childish. Take it easy, Luke soothed, sitting down on the bed and pulling off his boots. And don't blame Drask, at least not directly. I don't think he was the one who gave the order. Mara frowned. Then who did? Form by? Luke nodded. That's the feeling I was getting. Interesting, Mara murmured thoughtfully. 
And the reason? No idea, Luke said. But don't forget how annoyed Drask was when we helped the 501st put out the fire. Formby may be playing politics again, trying to give Drask fewer things to complain about. Terrific, Mara muttered as she started again to get ready for bed. It's so nice to spend time with an honorable people like the Chiss. It could be worse, Luke pointed out. We could be doing this with Bahans. What did you think about his story? The one about Kardas? Mara snorted under her breath. He's lying through his teeth on that one, too. There's no reason to let Kardas rattle off Jinsler's list of alleged credentials in an exotic trade language when he understands basic. He could have switched languages anywhere along the way, just as soon as it was his turn to speak. I was thinking that, too. Luke said. The obvious conclusion is that they didn't want Jinsler to know what they were talking about. Exactly, Mara said. You'll also notice Formby never actually answered my question as to whether he knew Kardas from somewhere else. And don't forget that they held their little rendezvous in the outer crust ice system where Drask and the rest of the Chiss couldn't eavesdrop. She shook her head. They're planning something, Luke she said darkly. Something devious. Possibly devious and nasty. I know, Luke said, pulling her down onto the bed beside him and wrapping his arm around her. Do you want to leave? Of course not, she said. I still want to see outbound flight, assuming that part of the story isn't a lie, too. Besides, if there's some trap being spun here, whether for us, Fell, or Drask, we're really the only ones available to stop it. She shifted position to nestle herself more comfortably against his side. Unless, of course, you want to leave that to the Jeruns? She added. Luke smiled at the thought. No, I think we'd better handle it, he agreed. Pleasant dreams, Mara. His last mental image as he drifted off to sleep, was a darkly amusing one of Bersh and Estash and the other Jeruns shaking in terror as they stood huddled in one of the ship's corridors, trying desperately to hold blasters steady. Fell looked up from his desk AS grappler SAT down across from him. Yes? It is in place, the other said, his large eyes reflecting the light from Fell's desk lamp. Tapped into the navigational repeater lines. Fell laid aside the data pad he'd been reading. That was quick, he commented. Any chance of the Chiss spotting it? The orange highlights of Grappler's green skin faded to yellow, the ikri equivalent of a head shake. Not by any casual search, he said. It is in a conduit behind a cabinet, not directly behind an access panel. Fell nodded. Nicely done he said. What about our Jedi? Do they suspect anything? Of course they suspect, Grappler said, the highlights becoming orange again. But they know nothing. His mouth opened in a sardonic grin. Jedi Skywalker asked me to thank you for my assistance to her. Don't underestimate them, Fell warned. I've heard stories about these too both from my father and from Admiral Park. They're sharp, they're quick, and they're very, very deadly. I would have it no other way, Grappler assured his commander, stiffening his shoulders proudly. I look forward to learning their full measure in combat. Fell took a deep breath. So the game had begun. Time to sit back and let it play. You'll get your chance, he promised Grappler softly. I guarantee it. Chapter 10 The vermin search began early the next morning, with four pairs of Chiss armed with atmosphere sniffers starting at the bow and stern and checking every room, storage compartment, conduit, access panel, and supply package aboard the chaff Anvo. They reached the Jade Saber about midday, and Mara watched in polite but stolid silence as they made their methodical way through her ship. 
Fortunately, Formby's prediction proved to be correct. No line creepers were found, and within half a standard hour the search team had departed down the transfer tunnel, leaving nothing behind but a faintly metallic aroma from their equipment. Fell's Imperial Transport was searched with equal speed and efficiency. The Jurun shuttle, in contrast, took nearly three times as long to be cleared. Most of that was due to the fact that so much of the vessel had been repaired, rebuilt, or replaced that there were virtually none of the sealed equipment modules that most ships carried and that would normally not have to be checked. The search would have taken even longer if the bunk rooms and storage compartment Luke had noticed on his first visit hadn't been open to space behind their vacuum-sealed doors. The Chiss confirmed the door's pressure readings, assured Luke that line creepers couldn't survive in vacuum, and moved on. The whole procedure took most of the day. In the end, they found nothing. So we apparently have two options. Luke commented to Mara as they sat together in the forward lounge watching the hyperspace sky roll past. Either a single group of lion creepers got in and ignored everything else while they worked their way nearly to the center of the ship, or else someone brought them in and deliberately let them loose in that spot. Guess which option I'd pick, Mara invited. I know which one you'd pick, Luke said dryly. What bothers me is that our saboteur seems to have had only that one group. What if he hadn't accomplished whatever he'd intended the first time around and had needed to create another diversion? Maybe he had a few spares and spaced them before the search started, Mara suggested. Which means what? Luke asked. That he lost his nerve and dumped the evidence even though he wasn't finished with it. More likely that he did accomplish what he set out to do last night, Mara said. And that one really bothers me. Why? Because I can't figure out what that was. Drask's been over every piece of equipment in the forward third of the ship and hasn't found anything. So what did the diversion gain anyone? Luke stroked thoughtfully at his cheek. Maybe Drask is looking in the wrong place he suggested. Maybe we're looking at a two-stage diversion, line creepers in the control lines and doused lights in the bow, while the actual work went on somewhere else. Fine, Mara said. But where? And what? Don't forget, the Chiss checked every cubic centimeter of the ship today. Looking for line creepers. Looking at everything, Mara corrected. I watched them go through the saber, Luke. Even when they were sampling the air they were looking around. If there'd been any spare weapons or explosives or anything else out of place in there, they'd have spotted it. And I'll bet that goes double for the Imperials and Jurens. Probably triple for the Imperials, Luke conceded. Outside, the motling vanished into starlines and collapsed into stars. Yet another navigational stop, apparently. Idly, he wondered what sort of fire points the Chiss had waiting at this one. So what's our next move? Unfortunately, that's probably up to him, Mara said, not sounding at all happy about it. The initiative always lies with the attacker. About all we can do is be ready. She broke off as a raucous trilling tone suddenly sliced like a vibrablade through the lounge. Alert T7! A chiss voice snapped over the speakers. Arc 12-2. Repeat, Alert T7, Arc 12-2. The nearest comm panel was at the far end of the next couch over. Luke got there first. This is Master Skywalker, he said. What's going on? This does not concern you. This is Aristocra Formby, Master Skywalker. Formby's voice cut into the circuit. Please come to the Jerun vessel as quickly as possible. On our way, Luke promised. What's happened? There was a hint of a sigh from the speaker. One of the Jeruns has been shot. 
There were a dozen chis swarming about the corridor outside the Jurun shuttle when Luke and Mara arrived. Two of them, Fisa and someone in Defense Fleet Black, were kneeling beside the writhing and moaning figure of a Jurun, working on him with one of the ship's medpacks. Formby, looking grim, was standing off to the side where he'd be out of the way. What happened? Luke asked as they were passed through the outer circle of Chiss. He was shot with a charik as he left his vessel, Formby told them. Upper back, left side. We're searching for the weapon now. Luke stepped around Fisa and looked down, his heart sinking inside him as he got a look at the victim's face. It was Estash, the youngest of the Jurons, his features twisted in pain at the charred and blackened skin across his left shoulder. You are a Jedi, Formby went on. I'm told Jedi have healing powers. Some of us do, Luke said, kneeling beside Estash and studying the injured area. Behind him, he could feel Mara's sympathetic pain as she gazed down at the wound. She'd been shot with a Chischarik once herself, and knew exactly how it felt. Unfortunately, either of us has any special skills in that area. Is there nothing you can do? Fisa asked. Luke pursed his lips, trying to think. With himself or another Jedi, a healing trance would be the obvious answer. He might even be willing to risk it with Fel or one of the human stormtroopers, if the victim had been one of them. But with an alien, especially one with unknown physiology and a mental and emotional structure he was unfamiliar with, it would be far too dangerous unless there was no other choice. Can you tell me how bad it is? He asked Fisa. Is it life-threatening or only very painful? I do not know the rest. What does it matter? It matters a great deal, Luke told her looking around the corridor. The rest of the Jeruns, he noted with surprise, were nowhere to be seen. Where are Bersh and the others? Inside their vessel, Formby said. They say they are afraid for their lives. Luke grimaced. But he supposed he couldn't really blame them. Someone go tell them to get out here, he said. Tell them there's nothing to be afraid of. They will not come, one of the Chiss said contemptuously. They fear now that the whole of the Chiss ascendancy stands against them. He made a clicking sound in the back of his throat. They are an easily terrified species. They can be terrified on their own time, Luke told him shortly. Right now, I need someone to tell me how bad this is. I'll go, Mara volunteered, crossing toward the entryway room. If they don't trust the Chiss, maybe they'll trust a human. Whatever it was she said to them, it obviously worked. Two minutes later Bersh and the others emerged hesitantly from the transfer tunnel, looking around like children in a festival fry house. Come here, Bersh, Luke said, beckoning. I need to know how bad this injury is. It is terrible, Bersh moaned as he sidled nervously past the chist to Astasha's side. How could someone do this to him? We hope to learn that soon, Formby said. In the meantime, Master Skywalker needs to know if his injuries are life-threatening. Bersh knelt down gingerly, his fingers probing the edges of the burned skin. Astash tensed, but said nothing. No. Bersh said after a moment. But he is in great pain. I know, Luke said reluctantly. But I'm afraid there's nothing I can do for that. Jedi healing powers can be dangerous to use. I can't risk it if he'll most likely heal by himself. Of course not, Bersh said, his voice sounding bitter. He is only a Jerun, after all. I meant it would be dangerous for him, 
Luke said, trying hard not to be irritated. None of this was his fault, after all. About all I can do is help you get him inside. That would be most kind, Bearish murmured, his flash of bitterness subsiding. Thank you. No problem. Luke stretched out to the force, reaching for a mental grip on Estash. That won't be necessary, Formby said suddenly before he could begin lifting. A medical litter is on its way. My people will take him inside. Bearish stood up. We would prefer the human's help, he said stiffly. We would prefer the Chiss not enter our spacecraft again. You don't have a choice, Formby said flatly. The Chaff Anva is a vessel of the fifth family of the Chiss ascendancy. As travelers within that vessel, you come under Chiss law and custom. If we choose to enter your vessel, we will do so. For a long moment the two aliens stood facing each other in silence, Bearish looking ridiculously small and fragile in front of the tall, regal Chiss. Then, with a sigh, Bearish's shoulders seemed to sag. Of course, he murmured, turning away. As you wish. Luke stirred, starting to take a step forward. Formby was being completely unreasonable. No. He stopped in mid-thought and mid-step as Mara's urgent warning flowed into his mind. He looked back around at her, caught the similarly warning look in her eyes. His intended protest died away unsaid. It was formed by his ship, after all. If the aristocrat wanted to make that point obvious to everyone present, it wasn't Luke's place to argue with him. From down the corridor came two Chiss guiding a floating medical cart between them. Luke looked at Mara again, caught the fractional tilt of her head, and stepped away from the injured Jerun to give them room. A minute later they had Astash on the litter and were moving him inside. The rest of the Jeruns walked beside them in stony silence. That's all then, Formby said, turning his glowing eyes on Luke and Mara as the party disappeared down the transfer tunnel. Thank you for your assistance. With a supreme effort, Luke merely nodded. You're welcome, he said. I don't suppose Estash saw who shot him. Formby shook his head. He told Fisa the shooter fired as he entered the corridor. He wasn't even certain where the shot came from. We're searching for the weapon now. I see, Luke said. Please let us know if you find it. Of course, Formby said. Good night. They won't find anything, he muttered to Mara as they threaded their way through the milling chiss and headed toward their quarters. Ten to one it's back in its rack or holster or wherever it was taken from. You think that's what our friend last night was looking for? Mara asked. A weapon? Maybe only he didn't take it then, Luke said. If he had, the search parties today would have noticed it was missing. No, all he wanted yesterday was to find where a weapon was conveniently located so that he could grab it tonight shoot the first Jeroon who came out of their shuttle, then put it back before it could be missed. But why shoot a Jeroon, of all people? I don't know, Luke said in disgust. Maybe someone wants to drive a wedge between them and the Chiss. Or maybe just between them and Formby. Someone who doesn't want to see them get a world of their own. Or maybe someone looking to stir up trouble between Formby and us. Mara pointed out. You were within half a heartbeat of arguing with him in front of his own people. You think he could have let you get away with that? He was being petty, Luke said with a sigh. But you're right. His ship, his rules. Anyway, good guests don't argue with their hosts. So be a good guest, Mara said, taking his arm soothingly as they walked. And while we do that, we can also see about watching his back. 
he gave her a sideways look. You think Formby is in danger? Someone's trying to scatter chaos around this ship, she reminded him. A major political assassination, or even just an attempt, would pretty well end the whole thing, don't you think? Luke shook his head. I wish I knew what was on outbound flight that's so important. Me too, Mara said. I guess we'll find out soon enough. The searchers found the Cherik half an hour later in a ventilation intake a few meters down the corridor from where Astash had been shot. Further investigation showed it had been stolen from an arms locker in the stern of the ship near the main engines, a locker whose fasteners had been carefully gimmicked for quick opening. Luke's guess, Mara had to admit, had been right on the nose. There was, of course, no indication as to who had actually taken the weapon or fired the shot. For the next two days Mara did some quiet poking around on her own, examining the scene of the attack, learning everything she could about Cheriks and their operation, and holding casual conversations with everyone who would talk to her. The interviews were, unfortunately, less than illuminating. Most of the crewers had stopped being neutral toward her and her questions and gave half-hearted answers or none at all. The non passengers were friendlier but even less helpful. Most had been alone at the time of the shooting, with no way of corroborating their stories. Only the stormtroopers claimed to have been together in Fell's ship, and even their careful questioning established that they weren't in sight of each other during much of the critical period. She also spoke twice with Astash, trying to draw out a more complete description of the incident. But he, too, was of little help. He'd been facing away from the shooter, his thoughts on other matters, and the shock and pain of the injury itself seemed to have thrown an extra layer of haze over his memories. About the only positive thing that came out of those discussions was the fact that he was definitely on the path to recovery. It was frustrating to hit so many blind alleys. And yet, paradoxically, she found the process itself strangely exhilarating. In many ways this kind of investigation was exactly what she'd been trained for, back when Palpatine had been preparing her to be his silent agent. Certainly it had been one of the most stimulating aspects of her service to him. Only now it was even better. Here, there was none of the brooding air of hopelessness that had seemed to be the normal state of affairs under Palpatine's empire, a hopelessness that had hung like a black cloud over every job and every mission. No one aboard Chaff Envoy cringed as she approached, hating and fearing her, or else welcomed her with the false courtesy of someone hoping to twist her authority to his own private ends. True, most of the Chiss crewers still seemed to heartily dislike the Imperials but it was a contemptuous dislike, born of a sense of superiority of culture and purpose, not the terrified, hopeless hatred those under the Empire's heel had displayed toward their masters. Fell, in response, walked about with his head held high, not with the arrogance of a grand moth or imperial general, but with a sense of pride about who he was and what he and the Empire of the Hand had accomplished. It was the same kind of pride that she'd often seen in Han or Leia, or in the pilots of Rogue Squadron, or even in Luke himself. And as she observed and analyzed it all, she couldn't help but compare it to the very different flavor of life she'd left behind in the New Republic. To the squabbling in the Senate that mirrored the hundreds of tensions and clashes between neighboring star systems. Or to the factions and power centers maneuvering for position and supremacy on Coruscant that constantly siphoned off energy, and resources that could be far better spent in other ways. Palpatine had been hateful, vicious, and destructive, especially toward the hundreds of alien species under his domination. But she had to admit that, at least on a purely practical level, the efficiency and order of his empire had been a vast improvement over the bloated bureaucracy and bribe-driven operation of the old republic that had preceded it. What would that empire have been like, she couldn't help wondering, if people like Park and Fell had been in command instead of Palpatine. 
What could that efficiency and order have accomplished, for that matter, in the hands of someone like Thrawn, himself a non-human? And more than once, late at night as she lay in bed beside Luke, she found herself wondering what it would have been like to serve an empire like that. What it would be like to serve an empire like that. It was the late part of ship's night after one of those speculative moments that the room's calm panel buzzed them abruptly awake. Twitching away from her, Luke rolled over to Kiadon. Yes? He called. This is Aristocra Formby, the voice noted. You and Jedi Skywalker may wish to wake and get yourselves dressed. What's wrong? Mara called. Nothing's wrong, Formby said. We've arrived. There, Formby said, pointing at the main command center display. There, just to the right of center. Do you see it? Yes. Luke said, peering at the image. There was a ship there, all right, its once shiny hull blackened and crackled with multiple laser and missile impacts. It lay poised just over the crest of a steep hill on the planetoid's surface, as if it had been somehow frozen in the act of toppling over the edge. And as the chaff envoy continued its inward spiral, he saw how it was the ship managed to stay suspended in midair. From points near the bow and the stern slender tubes could be seen extending from the underside of the hull, stretching downward at a shallow angle and connecting with another vessel mostly buried in the rubble at the foot of the hill. Midway along each of the tubes, he noticed, another pair of curved tubes veered off, stretching down and inward and coming together as they disappeared into the rocky hillside. Is that your outbound flight? Formed by ass quietly. Luke nodded. The ship was a dreadnought, all right, 600 meters long, armed with an awesome array of turbolasers and other weapons, capable of carrying and supporting nearly 20,000 crewers and passengers. Or it had been once. Not anymore. Gazing at the battered hull, he felt a stirring of distant pain for those who had been aboard when this had happened. I think so, he told Formby. It fits the description, anyway. Engines look mostly intact, Mara commented. Her voice was calm, almost clinical, but Luke could feel the pain and turmoil behind the words. The turbolaser blisters and shield bays were pretty well pounded, but the rest doesn't seem too bad. With some work, it might actually be able to fly again. The vessel on the surface appears capable of sustaining life. Formed by agreed. The sensors indicated has air and heat, and is using low levels of power. The other vessel, the one half visible at the foot of the hill, exhibits none of those characteristics. No surprise there, Luke murmured. You can see a dozen places where the connecting tubes between it and the upper ship have been blasted open. What about the rest of it? Jinsler asked. I understood outbound flight was composed of six dreadnoughts. The rest must be underground, Fell said. What's left of them, anyway? Underground? Bersh echoed, sounding odd. This vessel can even travel underground? No, of course not, Formby said. Perhaps it would be more accurate to say the rest of it is beneath it, he hissed thoughtfully. I don't know the right word. The loose, fine stone in the valley between the hills. The scree? Luke suggested. Moraine? At any rate, our instruments indicate the loose stone is very deep in that place and that there is definitely metal beneath it. Do you have any idea what shape it's in? Jinsler asked. The parts that are underground, I mean. Our instruments cannot say, Formby said. We will have to wait until we are aboard to determine that. Assuming the connecting tubes under the rock are in better shape than those others, Luke pointed out. 
If they are, we may be able to follow them around the circle. If not, we'll have to dig. Assuming enough of the circle of ships is there to make it worth the effort, Fell said. How did it get here in the first place, though? Mara asked. That's what I want to know. That remains a mystery, formed by conceited. Obviously, Thrawn must have had it towed here for future examination. Yet there is no evidence he or anyone else ever returned for any such study. I was actually thinking more about the mechanics of the operation, Mara said. You said he was commanding a small picket force at the time. Did every junior Chiss officer know how to get in and out of the redoubt cluster? Absolutely not, Formby said. He would have had to search deep into high-ranking information archives to have gained such information. That certainly sounds like Thrawn, Fell commented. Information was his passion. Yes, Mara said grimly. And killing was his business. A quiet shiver ran up Luke's back. According to Admiral Park, there had been 50,000 people aboard those six dreadnoughts when outbound flight was destroyed. Would the bodies still be aboard, lying where they'd fallen? Certainly he'd seen dead bodies before, but most of those had been the remains of rebel and imperial soldiers killed in battle. Here most of the deaths would have been civilians, possibly including children. With an effort, he shook away the thought. Whatever was there, he would simply have to deal with it. So what's the plan? He asked. The planetoid is too small to hold significant atmosphere, Formby said, nodding toward the display. We will therefore land the chaff envoy on top of the hill beside the upper vessel and run a transfer tunnel to the port side docking port near the aft end. Then all those who will be going aboard will do so. He gazed at the display, where the dreadnought was growing steadily larger as the Chiss ship closed the gap. Once we're aboard, there will be a short ceremony in which I will recount the Chiss part in the vessel's destruction and express the depth of our regret. He went on. I will then ask for forgiveness on behalf of the nine ruling families and the Chiss ascendancy and formally return the vessel's remains to Ambassador Jinsler, representing the New Republic, and Master Skywalker and Jedi Jade Skywalker, representing the Jedi Order. And us? Bersh asked anxiously. Will there be a place in the ceremony for the Jerun people to express our gratitude? Whether or not you are permitted to speak will be a decision for Ambassador Jinsler, Formby said gravely. Of course you may. Jinsler assured the Jurun, smiling encouragingly at him. As will you, Commander Fell, he added, nodding to Fell. Though I'm still not certain what exactly your interest is in outbound flight. Remembrances come in all sizes and shapes, Fell said obliquely. As do acts of repentance and atonement for past failures. Regardless, we'll be honored to participate in the ceremony. Then I suggest all return to your quarters or vessels and prepare, Formby said. In one hour, we shall begin. Landing the chaff envoy beside the exposed DREADN AUGHT was a straightforward enough operation, though there had been some concern that the loose rock wouldn't adequately support its weight, especially given the possibility that a structurally damaged vessel might be buried beneath it. Fortunately, Everything seemed solid enough. Setting up the connecting tunnel was handled with equal efficiency. At that point, they ran into an unexpected problem. The docking bay hatchway Drask had selected, which had looked completely functional, turned out to be warped just enough to be impossible to open, and the Chiss ended up having to use cutting torches to carve out an access. It was a slow process. Even the relatively thin hatchway of an old Republic warship was incredibly tough, and the need to maintain a margin of safety in the enclosed area limited how much power the Chiss could run to their torches. More than once as he watched them work, Luke considered going to form by and offering to do the job with his lightsaber instead. 
It would be easier and cleaner and a lot faster. But each time he suppressed the impulse. The aristocrat's midnight discussion about the casual waving of alien weapons was still fresh in his mind, and he'd already learned enough about Chiss' pride to know that Formby and the others would probably rather do it their way than accept his help. Particularly when that help wasn't really necessary. And so the company waited as the crewers finished the job. Once they'd broken through the hatchway there was another short delay as the ship's medic tested the atmosphere confirming that none of the microorganisms, trace gases, or suspended particulates present would be dangerous to Chiss or human. With only a few days' worth of data on Jerun biochemistry, he was less certain as to whether there would be any adverse effects on them, and there was some talk of rigging protective suits for the four who would be coming aboard. But Bersh declined the offer. The proper ritual clothing would be impossible to wear inside such suits, he stated and assured Formby that he and his people were willing to take whatever risks were necessary. With all the delays, it was actually closer to three hours before the party was finally ready to go. A strange-looking party they were, too, Luke reflected as they lined up on the Chiss side of the transfer tunnel. Drask and Formby were dressed in the same stately outfits they'd worn at the first night's reception dinner while Fisa and a black-uniformed Chiss warrior carrying an elaborate banner on a pole wore much simpler and more functional clothing. Fell was back in his dress uniform, and Luke would swear that the four stormtroopers had put extra effort into making sure their armor was gleaming. Jinsler had discarded his earlier layered robe tunic in favor of something simpler and less constrictive and Luke found himself wondering if the older man was expecting dirt and close quarters aboard the dreadnought, or whether he was just tiring of his ambassadorial play-acting. Each of the four Jeroons who would be attending wore one of the blue and gold-collared wolf-kill bodies over the shoulders of his thick brown robe, making an odd contrast to Astache and the bandages he was wearing on his shoulder. The young Jeroon had argued at length with Bersh in their melodic language about going along and was clearly still not happy that he was merely there to see the others off. He stood off to one side, nursing his shoulder and looking even more lost and pathetic than usual. Luke was back in his dark jumpsuit and duster, but Mara had passed up her formal gown in favor of a jumpsuit similar to Luke's that she could move more freely in if necessary. Still, her natural poise and elegance made him feel as if she were far better dressed than he was. Next trip, Luke murmured to her as the Chiss standard bearer led the way into the tunnel. Remind me to pack a couple of formal outfits. I've always said you and Han are the scruffiest heroes I've ever met, she murmured back. He looked sideways at her. The comment was typical Mara, that sarcastic manner that had proved so useful in distracting and irritating opponents in the past. But this time he could tell that the words were pure reflex. There was something going on behind her eyes, some strange concentration. Shifting his eyes back forward, Luke stretched out to the force. If something was bothering Mara, he'd better get up to speed, too. They emerged from the tunnel into an entryway and storage area that was probably half again the size of even the extravagant equivalents aboard the Chaff Anvil. A few boxes were still stacked along the bulkheads, their markings somewhat faded with age, but most of the room was empty. Everything seemed to be coated with a thin layer of dust. Amazingly clean, Jinsler commented, looking around as the group gathered in the center of the room. His voice echoed strangely from the bare metal walls. Shouldn't there be more dust? Must be some housekeeping droids still functioning, Fell said. Or at least there were. Repair droids, too. See where they've patched the cracks in the hull? These machines can still function after all these years? Bersh asked in wonderment. With no one to supervise or repair them. Everything aboard outbound flight was well automated, Fell said. It was all internal rather than being linked to a lot of other ships. 
Otherwise, they would have needed probably 16,000 people on each dreadnought just to crew it. So few? Bershast, looking around. Our own vessel is less than half this size, yet it carries more than 60,000 jeruns. Sure, but this wasn't just a colony ship with everyone packed tightly inside, Fell pointed out. The dreadnoughts were warships, the biggest the Old Republic had before the Clone Wars, with weaponry and equipment. Formby cleared his throat. Fell took the hint and subsided. On behalf of the nine ruling families of the Chiss Ascendancy, I welcome you all to this solemn and sorrowful occasion. The Aristocra began, his voice deep and resonant. We stand today on the deck of an ancient vessel that lies here as a symbol of human courage and Chiss failing. Luke let his eyes drift around the group as Formby continued his speech. Off to the side, he noticed, Bersh was murmuring into a bulky calm link in the melodic Jerun language. Probably giving Estasha running commentary on the ceremony, he decided, and found himself wondering why the young Jerun had been left aboard the Chaff Anva in the first place. Surely this short a trip wouldn't have strained his injuries that much. About the only thing he could come up with was the fact that the positioning of Estasha's injuries precluded his wearing one of the ceremonial wolf kills. Personally, Luke considered that a rather ridiculous reason to leave him behind. But he'd been with the New Republic long enough to know that not every aspect of an alien culture had to make sense to him. It was enough that such rules and customs were important to the people who lived under them, and that as such they were worthy of his respect if not necessarily his approval. And then, without warning, something touched Luke's mind the last sensation he would ever have expected. He twisted his head to look at Mara. One glance at her widened eyes was all he needed to show she'd caught it, too. Luke? She whispered tightly. What is it? Formby demanded, cutting off his speech in mid-sentence. What's happened? Luke took a deep breath. It's outbound flight, he said, stretching out harder to the force. No mistake. They were there, minds, human minds, not chiss, somewhere deep beneath them. A lot of them. We're not alone, Aristocra formed by. There are survivors aboard. Chapter 11 Someone gasped, a sharp intake of air, just as quickly cut off. What did you say? Bersh demanded, his calm link sagging forgotten in his grip. You say, survivors? Unless the Chiss are running a vacation transport service, Mara said, stretching out harder to the force as she tried to sort out the twisting tapestry of sensations. There are humans down there, at least a hundred of them. Probably more. But that's impossible. Jinsler said, his voice hoarse. This ship died fifty years ago. It died. Mara frowned, drawing some of her concentration away from the distant minds to focus on Jinsler. His lined face was tight, his sense swirling like storm clouds in a crosswind, every mental barrier stripped away in a strange combination of hope and dread and guilt. And in that moment she knew that he hadn't been lying at least not about his sister having been aboard. Or was she possibly still aboard? Was that the thought that was sending this emotional groundquake through him? Maybe the ship died, Ambassador, she told him. But not everyone aboard died with it. Well, Fell said, his voice studiously matter-of-fact. This complicates things. It does indeed. Formby said, his glowing eyes narrowed in concentration. It complicates things tremendously. Mara caught Luke's eye. What do you think? She asked. Shall we leave them here to discuss the diplomatic ramifications while you and I just go find these people? The gambit worked. No, 
Formby insisted, snapping out of whatever deep thoughts he'd been working on. You cannot go alone. Absolutely not, Drask agreed, gesturing to the standard bearer. You, return to the Chaff Anva and instruct Captain Brast al Shibarku to issue a Drace 2 alert. He is to prepare three squads. Wait a minute, Luke interrupted. You can't bring a contingent of soldiers in here. This vessel is still the property of the Chiss Ascendancy, Drask said, glaring warningly at him. We will do whatever we please. I'm not disputing that, Luke said. I'm simply concerned about what the passengers may do if they see a group of armed Chiss coming down the corridors toward them. He raises a fair point, formed by said reluctantly. They may remember that it was a picket unit of the Chiss defense fleet that destroyed their vessel. And so they will be afraid until we can speak with them and assure them of our intentions, Drask said impatiently. I do not think a few minutes of fear is too much to ask of them. I wasn't worried about how they would feel, Luke said. I was thinking about what they might do if they saw a corridor full of armed Chiss. Bearing in mind what happened the last time they saw a group like that. Syndic Mithra Nuroto did not send warriors aboard, Drask said. There is no record in any testimony of his doing so. But they would have seen someone with blue skin and red eyes, Mara pointed out. Either Thrawn himself or some other Anvu. Unless you're suggesting he would have attacked without even offering them the chance to surrender? Drask glared at her. No, he growled. Not even Mithra Nuroda would have done that. Right, Mara said. So they'll have known who the enemy was. And they've had fifty years to prepare for attack. And as Commander Felt pointed out, dreadnoughts were designed as warships, Luke added. There was a moment of silence from the others as the implications of that finally sank in. What do you suggest? Formby asked. What Mara just said, Luke told him. She and I go find them. Alone. No, Bersh pleaded. You must not leave us apart. We wish to pay tribute to the memories of these brave people. How much more should we not pay tribute to the people themselves? We can bring you down afterward, Mara told him. Once we've explained the situation. No, Bersh repeated, starting to become agitated. You must not leave us apart. Your plan is unacceptable to us as well, Drask put in. I accept your reasoning as to why we should not bring a full boarding party. But Aristocra Chafor and Bentrano and I must at least be present at your first contact with these survivors. And the Aristocra must have a guard. He'll have the 501st, General, Fell reminded him. They can handle anything these people can throw at us. Your assurances are welcome but insufficient, Drask said stiffly. We will bring a half-squad of three Chiss warriors. No fewer. He looked a challenge at Luke. Do you argue that, Jedi? No, Luke said, giving up. Three warriors should be all right. I take it you're coming too, Ambassador? Absolutely, Jinsler said firmly. His tension had faded a bit into the background of his mind, but it was definitely still there. My S.I., my superiors on Coruscant would insist on it. Then it's unanimous, Fell commented. Good. Now all we're doing is wasting time. After fifty years, I do not think a few more minutes will make any difference. Drask said acidly. He turned back to the standard bearer, who had stopped when the discussion began and was standing awaiting orders. Return to the Chaff Anva and signal Drace to alert, the general said. 
Then order the number two honor squad to report to this chamber. They must be standing ready in the event we require immediate assistance. His blazing eyes dared anyone to argue with him. No one did. Very well then, Formby said. Let us all return to the Chaff Anva and obtain such equipment as each person wishes to carry on this journey through the past. He glanced down at his elaborate robes. And perhaps a change of clothing would be in order, as well, he added. We will reassemble here in thirty standard minutes and begin our search. The first stretch of the trip went smoothly enough. The place felt like an extended tomb, with the bare metal decks and bulkheads dully reflecting the dim glow of the permalite emergency panels set into the ceilings and the brighter light from the party's own glow rods. But at least the passageways were open and relatively uncluttered by debris. Various rooms opened off the main corridor, some of them large enough for the glow rod beams to fade into the darkness, and the distant walls and ceilings of those larger rooms echoed their footsteps eerily as they stepped briefly inside for a look. Most of the rooms were loaded with silent equipment or dusty storage boxes. Occasionally they came across a sleeping area with rows of empty bunks and personal items scattered on the deck around them. Mara walked up front with Luke, trying to read beyond the reach of her glow rod beam and wondering a little how this particular marching order had been set up. She and Luke were the most reasonable ones to take point, of course, and she had no particular problem with Formby, Drask, and Jinsler following directly behind them. But then came Fel, Fisa, and one of the stormtroopers, with the Jeruns behind them. At the very back, walking silently despite their armor, came the other three stormtroopers. The more she thought about it, the more the arrangement bothered her. Her own training would have put Fel and all four stormtroopers at the back, where they could act as a rear guard in case of trouble from that direction. If Fell still insisted on detaching one of his men, that spare stormtrooper ought to be closer to the front, probably directly behind her and Luke, where his firepower would be available without him having to worry about shooting around Jinsler and both of the senior Chiss. Twice in that first stretch she thought about halting the party and calling for a rearrangement. But both times something stopped her, and eventually she gave up on the idea. Fell's military training was certainly more recent than hers, and it was possible the Empire of the Hand's tacticians had come up with a more efficient military doctrine than she'd been taught. After the first fifty meters, travel abruptly became more difficult. Shattered slabs of insulation material, buckled bulkheads, and twisted support beams seemed to be everywhere, littering the corridors and sometimes blocking doorways and the smaller side corridors completely. What happened here? Fisa murmured as Luke carefully pushed aside a set of dangling power cables covered with splintered armor sheaths. We've reached the part of the ship where the main turbolasers were located, Fell told her. You remember Mara pointing out that the weapon's blisters had been severely damaged? They would have been Thrawn's primary target. He did a thorough job, too, I see, Formby said. Why haven't the maintenance machines fixed this? The survivors must have decided it wasn't worth the trouble to clear it away themselves. Or were unable to work in safety, Drask added. With so many stars in such close proximity to each other, the radiation levels are higher inside the redoubt cluster than most humans are accustomed to. Are we therefore in danger? Bersh asked nervously. We won't be here long enough for that, Luke assured him. The outer hull is thick enough to stop most of the radiation. You'd have to live here months or years before you started having problems. Which probably explains why they decided to live in one of the lower dreadnoughts, Mara put in. Whatever the hull doesn't block, all that rock out there should be able to handle. Or else the other dreadnoughts aren't damaged this badly. Fell said. Luke shrugged. We'll find out. Is that where we're going? Jinsler asked. 
To the lower ships? That seems to be where the survivors are, Luke said. Before we try to find the way down though, I'd like to see if we can work our way up a few levels to the command deck. If it's in decent shape, there may be records left that'll tell us exactly what happened. Bersh made a subdued whistling sound in the back of his throats. And what truly is the chance of that? He asked darkly. We see here how thoroughly this Thrawn was committed to its destruction. Thrawn never destroyed more than was absolutely necessary, Fell said. There would have been no reason to wreck the command deck if taking out the shield generators and turbo lasers was all he needed. Jinsler turned his head. What in the worlds are you talking about? He demanded. All he needed? What did he need to destroy outbound flight for in the first place? He had his reasons, Fell insisted. He had reasons for killing civilians? Jinsler shot back. Men, women, and children who never did him any harm? What, he just needed some target practice that day and they conveniently happened along? And you? He turned his glare on Formby and Drask. You chiss. What did you do to stop him? That's enough, Ambassador, Mara put in, flashing a warning at him with her eyes. Formby had already said the chiss were carrying their own load of guilt over this thing. There was no need to hammer it into the ground. The past is over and done with. Is it? Jinsler asked her pointedly. Is it really? Yes, Luke put in firmly. And bringing up anyone's failures, anyone's, isn't going to accomplish anything. Let's concentrate on finding these people and seeing what we can do for them, all right? Of course, Jinsler muttered. I'm sorry. I'm just. Something's coming. The stormtrooper beside fell cut in, swinging his Blostech toward a half-crushed equipment crawl space branching off the corridor to their right. The other three stormtroopers were at his side in an instant, spreading themselves into a defensive semicircle between the crawl space and the rest of the party, their weapons leveled at the opening. Steady, fell warned. If there's going to be shooting, we don't want to be the ones to start it. Soft but steady footsteps could be heard now. Mara drew her lightsaber but didn't ignite it, stretching out to the force. There didn't seem to be any presence that direction that she could detect. Probably a droid, she said. What kind of walking droid could fit through that opening? Fell objected. A few seconds later he got his answer as a low slung badly dented box about half a meter long and a few centimeters high rolled into view on battered treads. A walking droid with a bad limp? Luke suggested as one of the treads gave a soft thunk that sounded exactly like a footstep. What is that, a floor cleaner? Probably does floors and small object retrieval, Fell said, stepping back as the droid rolled past his feet toward a pile of shattered plastic insulation leaving faint tread marks in the dust as it went. Part of the main cleaning system, I'd guess. I see, Luke said, looking over at Mara. She nodded back. Given the layer of dust on everything, it seemed unlikely that their group had shown up just as the cleaner was starting its monthly or yearly run. It was far more likely that the droid had been equipped with a holocom and comm link and sent to check out the intruders either as an observer or as a decoy. She shifted her attention away from the droid, searching the corridor ahead. There was too much debris to see very far, but it looked like the passageway widened a short way ahead. A perfect place for an ambush. She caught Luke's eye and nodded toward it. He nodded back and slipped past her into the corridor. It is truly amazing. Bersh said, shaking his head in wonderment as they watched the cleaner droid extend a pair of slender arms and begin sorting through pieces of the insulation. So that is a droid. And it runs all by itself?
One of the stormtroopers looked over at Luke as he disappeared behind a section of hanging ceiling material, the armored chest lifting slightly as he took a breath to speak. Mara shook her head in warning. His helmet dipped slightly in acknowledgement, and he remained silent. This one's probably connected to a central housekeeping computer, Jinsler told the Juran. Small units like this don't have the logic capacity to run completely on their own. I see, Berj said. But there are those that do, correct? Hello there. Everything from protocol droids to astromech droids to medical droids. And battle droids and droidikas? One of the other Jurans asked. Did they also run independently? Some of the later versions could, Jinsler said. But again, most of them were run off a central computer system. A terrifying weapon, Bersh murmured. Not really, Fell said. The whole droid army concept is pretty well outmoded these days, at least in the Empire of the Hand. How about in the New Republic, Ambassador? A few systems still use droidikas. Jinsler said. Mostly smaller colonies on undeveloped worlds in wild space where people need perimeter guards at night to protect against native predators. Bears shivered. Such awesome power in your hands. Yet you make no use of it? We're not in the conquering business anymore, steward. Jinsler reminded him. Besides, power is only one part of the equation for good soldiers. Fell said. The problem with battle droids was that they were really pretty stupid. Mara felt the urgent touch of her husband's mind. Leaving Fell to his lecture, she slipped quietly down the corridor. Luke was standing just inside the wide area she'd spotted earlier. What V we got? She murmured. He pointed at a stack of flat gray boxes along the left-hand bulkhead. Looks a little too neat for random debris, he murmured back. Booby trap. Mara ran through the Jedi sensory enhancement techniques and took a slow, careful breath. The subtle background smells of the ship suddenly jumped into full focus. Dust, plastic, metal, rust, a general odor of age. She took another breath, sorting through them all and this time she caught the faint but unmistakable tang of explosives. If it's not, it's a terrific imitation of one, she confirmed, letting the odors fade into the background again. Remote triggered, you think? You're the demolitions expert in the family, he reminded her. They can have it on timer, though, and I can't see anyone wasting a droid to come in and set them off. Me either, Mara agreed. I presume we're not stupid enough to just rush the stack. I don't even think we're stupid enough to get anywhere near it, Luke said. Let's back up a bit and see if we can find another route. I don't know, Mara said doubtfully, looking around at the devastation. There's enough damage here in the central corridor. The other, smaller passageways are likely to be even worse. Only until we get through the weapon and shield sections, Luke said. The rest of the ship may be in better shape. Actually, this is one of four central corridors through this part of the ship. They run parallel to each other on opposite sides of the centerline, collapsing down to two main corridors as you get closer to the bow. Really? Mara said, frowning. Since when do you know so much about dreadnoughts? Since Han and I had a running battle with a bunch of Imperials aboard the Katana, Luke told her dryly. You learn a lot about a ship's architecture when you're dodging blaster bolts. Come on, let's go tell the others. Fell had finished his lecture by the time they rejoined the group. There you are, Drask said, his eyes flashing. Where did you go? Just scouting ahead, Luke assured him. 
Looks like we're going to have to cross to one of the other corridors. Drask's eyes narrowed. Why? Luke looked over at the housekeeper droid, still picking through the rubble. There's a booby trap in there, he said. I'd just as soon not have to take the time to disarm it. There's another cross corridor we can use about ten meters ahead that'll get us back to this one. There is a trap? Bearish gasped. But why would anyone wish to hurt us? We have come to honor them. Yes, but they don't know that, Luke said. All we can do is try to avoid trouble until we can explain it to them. Until then, we must make certain such a meeting does in fact take place, Drask said grimly, pulling out a comm link. Wait a minute, Fell said. What are you doing? Summoning an escort, Drask said. This is no longer a matter for diplomats. We have an escort, Fell countered. Trust me, the 501st can handle things. That is not sufficient, Drask insisted. Even if they are as good as you claim, they cannot adequately protect us all. We require a stronger force. That might not be a good idea, General, Luke warned. If the inhabitants are monitoring our progress, a show of that much force might be taken as a threat. He's right, Formby said, not sounding particularly happy about it. Leave the warriors in reserve for now, General Drask. We'll retreat and use the route Master Skywalker suggests. I disagree completely, Drask growled. But he put the calm link away without further argument. Very well, Master Skywalker. Lead the way. The side corridors Luke had chosen weren't any easier to navigate than the main corridor had been. There was less actual debris lying around underfoot, but the state of the bulkheads and ceiling more than made up for it. Many of the bulkheads had buckled, twisting wall plates out at crazy angles into the corridor, many of them broken and sharp-edged. Something in here must have exploded during the battle, Mara decided as the group eased gingerly past the rubble. It took them more than an hour to pick their way through that first 150 meters. They saw two more droids in that time, both of them housekeeping types, both of them eliciting words of amazement from the Jurens. It was clear, at least to Mara, that someone was indeed watching their progress. But there were no other booby traps, at least none that they were able to detect. Certainly nothing went off in the confining spaces. Perhaps, as Luke had hoped, Whoever was monitoring the droids had gotten the message that their visitors had no ill intentions toward them. Or else they were simply preparing a more memorable reception farther in. As expected, once they were past the main turbo laser batteries the damage began to drop off considerably. Fifty meters after that, it became no worse than a sort of dusty clutter. What is this place? Bersh asked as they passed through a large room lined with consoles and monitor displays. This is the fleet tactical room, Fell said. In a battle, this is where this ship would coordinate combat with the rest of its companion ships. The Vigari must have had rooms like this aboard their vessels, one of the other Jurans said. Larger even than this, perhaps. They had huge fleets. Yes. Bearish agreed, a shiver running through him. They darkened the sky when they passed through the air of our world. This appears to be in a workable state, Drask commented, stepping over to one of the consoles for a closer look. Would this be a place Mithran Urodo might have deliberately spared? It's possible, Fell said. The six dreadnoughts were presumably coordinated directly from the primary command ship without any need for this room to even be crewed. Unless this is the command ship, Jinsler reminded him. And of course, we don't know whether any of these consoles actually works, Mara added, frowning as she stretched out to the force. 
there seemed to be a flicker of a presence lurking somewhere ahead of them. But the sensation came and went, as if the person was appearing and then disappearing. Someone only half-conscious, perhaps? Might be worth trying to start them up, Luke suggested, throwing a glance at Mara. So he'd caught the tentative contact, too. What do you think, Commander? Fell's forehead furrowed briefly, then cleared as he caught on. Sure, why not? He agreed with false enthusiasm. In fact, it might be easier to find records back here than it would on the command deck. That console you're looking at, General, let's see if we can get it started. Drask stepped back and gestured toward the board. Go ahead. Right, Fell said, pulling out the chair and sitting down. Let's see now. Tentatively, he keyed a few switches. The console beeped twice, and a few of its indicators came reluctantly to life. Okay. Let's try this. Luke, Mara noted, was already gone. She waited until the entire group was watching Fell, then slipped out after him. He was waiting for her just outside the tactical room. You felt her too? He asked quietly. Her? Mara's mind flashed back to Jinsler's story about his sister. I felt something, but it kept coming and going, she said. You think it's a woman? A girl, actually, he said. Too young to be Lorena. Sorry. Well, it was a long shot, Mara conceded, trying not to feel too disappointed. Let's see if we can find her before we're missed. Too late, a voice murmured darkly from behind her. She glanced at Luke, caught his grimace. Hello, General, she said as she turned around. Drask was standing alone in the corridor, his posture stiff. You must think we are fools, he bit out. You and Commander fell both. Do you really think the Chiss can be so easily deceived in the same way twice? Forgive us, Luke said, bowing to him. We were merely concerned for your safety. I do not need my safety guarded, Drass countered. I do not know how you humans do such things, but Chiss leaders do not merely sit behind the young warriors and watch them fight. I understand. Luke said. Perhaps I misspoke. I meant we were concerned for the aristocrat's safety. Better, Drask rumbled. But be advised, this is still a Chiss vessel, and you will not again move ahead of me. Understood, Luke said. Again, our apologies. Very well. Drask glanced back over his shoulder. Then let us continue before the others notice our absence. They had gone perhaps ten meters when the wisp of sensation again touched Mara's mind. Luke had been right. It was definitely female. She's just ahead. She warned Luke, peering at the equipment and occasional piles of debris as she tried to pin down the girl's location. Five meters ahead, the corridor opened into a large room with its door frozen partially open, and she could see more of the same type of consoles as they'd found in the tactical room. She must be in the sensor room, Luke said, pointing toward the frozen door. You want to hang back while General Drask and I check it out? Mara bit back a retort. Obviously, Luke was being diplomatic. Sounds good, she said. Stepping to the side, she planted her back against the corridor wall. Luke and Drask continued forward, the general's hand resting on the charik belted at his waist. They stepped to the sensor room door and Luke ducked down and started to ease his way beneath it. Are you Jedi? A soft voice asked from behind Mara. Mara spun around old combat reflexes flaring as her hand automatically went to her lightsaber. The girl standing quietly in the corridor was no older than ten, plainly but neatly dressed, her dark auburn hair glistening in the light. 
She was looking at Mara with bright, unblinking blue eyes. Standing in the corridor behind Mara. How in blazes had she managed that? Mara found her voice. Yes, we are, she told the girl. We're here to help you. Oh, the girl said. For a moment she seemed to study Mara, an uncertain look on her face. Then she shifted her gaze to Drask and Luke, eyeing her in turn as they stood together by the sensor room door. And a blue one. She went on. Are you here to hurt us? No one will hurt you, Drask assured her. As the Jedi said, we are here to help. Oh, the girl said, her voice completely matter-of-fact. Well, you can tell him that. She gestured to an alcove just behind her. He's waiting for you. We'll look forward to seeing him, Luke said, wondering who she was talking about. The survivor's leader, perhaps? What's your name? I'm Evelyn, she said. Will you follow me, please? We must first alert the others of our group, Drask added, pulling out his calm link. They'll be all right, Evelyn assured him as she stepped into the alcove. They'll be brought through right behind us. She touched a control. The wall blocking the far end of the alcove slid smoothly up into the ceiling, revealing a short corridor with another door at the far end. Come on, she invited, stepping inside and heading for the door in the opposite wall. Mara frowned. Aside from the door at the far end and another one midway along the left-hand wall, the corridor was completely bare. A security transit, perhaps, with hidden sensors that would allow whoever was beyond to get a close look at prospective visitors. Possibly. It could also be another booby trap. Still, unless the rest of the survivors were prepared to sacrifice the girl, it ought to be safe enough. Provided, of course, she and the others got inside with the girl before she disappeared through the far door. Again, Luke's thoughts were mirroring hers. Mara, you and the general had better stay here, he said as he stepped into the corridor behind Evelyn, taking long strides as he tried to catch up without looking too obvious about it. He can call back and alert the rest of the party. No, Drask insisted, brushing past Luke in turn and striding into the corridor ahead of him. You do not go ahead alone. Evelyn had reached the far end and was reaching for a small control panel set into the wall beside the door. Mara hesitated, stretching out to the force, trying to reach back to form Bai's group behind them. There was no fear or sudden surprise back there that she could detect. Abruptly, she made up her mind. If this whole thing was legitimate, it wouldn't hurt to be separated from the others for a few minutes especially with Fell and the 501st there to guard them. If it was a trap, two Jedi always had a better chance than one. We can call them on the way, she decided, stepping in behind Drask. She was just in time. Even as she ducked beneath the door, it slid down behind her. Hurry, Evelyn said, beckoning them forward. Mara took a long step to catch up to Luke. She caught the warning flicker an instant before it happened. But it was too late. Even as she and Luke grabbed for their lightsabers, two doors abruptly slammed down from the ceiling, one in front of Drask, the other behind Mara, cutting the corridor into thirds and trapping them in the center section. With a lurch, the floor dropped out from under them. Chapter 12 Jedi Drask bellowed, making the word a curse. Do something! But for that first terrifying second there was nothing either of them could do. Luke fought for balance, feeling Mara's chagrin mixing with his own. The room kept falling, far faster than the planetoid's own weak gravity could possibly have pulled it. Too late, now, he realized they'd been decoyed into a disguised turbolift car. Then so unexpectedly and abruptly that he nearly fell over, the car braked to a halt. 
Good day, Jedi. The disembodied voice came from the control panel beside the side door. Good day, Blue One. We are called Shis, Dras corrected the voice tartly. Ah, the voice said. Good day, then, Chis. I'm Jorid Presser, guardian of the people. Interesting way you have of greeting peaceful visitors, Mara commented. You at least going to come out where we can talk face to face? Whom I deal with is my decision, not yours, Presser said. For the moment, that's not going to be you. For a very short moment, Mara countered. Or do you really expect this box to hold us for long? Long enough, Presser assured her. Let me explain. The reason you've stopped moving is that your turbolift car is currently sitting at a gravity eddy point being balanced by two equal and opposite focused repulsor beams. If either of them is cut off, you'll be instantly shot through the tube to smash into either the dreadnought you just left or the dreadnought you were intending to travel to. Either way, it will be very messy. For your vessel as well as for us, Drask warned. Such an impact may do serious damage to your structural integrity. I don't think so, Presser said. Of course, none of you would ever know for certain. True, Luke conceded. I presume there's more? I know about Jedi lightsabers, Presser said. I know you could normally cut your way out of the car with ease. In this case, however, I'd strongly advise against trying it. The power and control cables for both repulsor beams are wrapped in random patterns around the car. Cut any of the wires, upsetting the balance of forces, and it will be the last thing you ever do. Luke looked at Mara. You've spent a lot of time thinking this out, he said. Have you had a lot of Jedi visitors in the past 50 years? We haven't had any visitors at all. Presser said, his voice suddenly cold and bitter. But I've always known that someday the Republic would send someone to hunt us down. It seemed only prudent to take precautions. Luke shook his head. You've got it all wrong, he said, putting all the persuasion he could into his voice. We're not here for revenge or retribution or whatever. We're... Don't bother trying to communicate with the rest of your people either, Presser interrupted him. All comlink frequencies are being jammed. Make yourselves comfortable and cultivate that renowned Jedi patience. There was a click and the voice was gone. Interesting, Drask commented, turning to face Luke. Aristocrat Chafor and Bintrano has often stated that the Jedi are honored and admired by all. Apparently, he was mistaken. Very much mistaken, Luke agreed, looking slowly around the car. Up close, the walls appeared to be solid metal, with no signs of tampering. If their captors were monitoring them, the holocams and voice pickups had to either be hidden in the control board or else buried in the line where the walls and ceiling met, where numerous age cracks had opened up in the metal. There are any number of people who don't like Jedi, he continued lifting his eyebrows at Mara. She nodded to the control panel, then put her hands together in a right angle. So she'd come to the same conclusion he had. Nodding back, Luke slipped off his emergency kit backpack and popped it open. Mara picked up the explanation. Of course, most of them are criminals or warmongers. She had her own backpack off now, her fingers sorting through the contents. Jedi are supposed to keep the peace, so of course those groups hate us. Corrupt politicians don't like us much either, Luke added, digging beneath the ration bars and water tubes and pulling out his liquid cable dispenser. Mara was already ready with her contribution, her medpack's tube of synth flesh wound healer. I wonder which category Presser falls into. Maybe none of them, Mara said. Stepping to a corner of the room, 
she began laying a thin bead of the synth flesh into the line between ceiling and wall. Maybe he just doesn't think talking to us would get him anywhere. Maybe, Luke said, coming up beside his wife and playing out an equally thin line of liquid cable on top of the synth flesh before it could solidify. Not here in Chiss space, anyway. If they even know where they are, Mara said. Maybe once we've persuaded them we're here to help we can all sit down together and hear the whole story. An uncomfortable silence descended on the car. Mara reached the corner and continued on along the next wall, Luke right beside her. Liquid cable, which solidified instantly on contact with the air, was designed specifically not to be sticky so that it wouldn't hang up on anything as it was being extruded. The synth flesh, on the other hand, was designed just as specifically to stick solidly to wounds, protecting them from the air and further injury. Together, they made a perfect barrier against the aged cracks and anything that might be hidden behind them. Once they finished with the walls, it would be a simple matter to block the view from the control panel with one of their all-temperature cloaks. If Presser didn't interfere, they should be finished in a few minutes. Presser didn't, and they were. There, Luke said at last, stepping back to admire their handiwork. That should at least keep them from watching us. A useful start, Drask said, his tone neutral. Clearly, he wasn't all that impressed. Yet we are still inside. What now? No, Luke said, smiling tightly at Mara. You'll get to see how Jedi do things. From somewhere ahead came a distant clunk. What was that? Fisa asked, looking up. Machinery, Grappler said, lifting his Blostek and taking a step toward the passageway Luke and Mara had disappeared down a few minutes earlier. Possibly a door ceiling. The Skywalkers! Jinsler said sharply, looking around. They're gone! It's all right, Ambassador, Formby said calmly. They went with General Drass to scout ahead. He peered in that direction. It's time we joined them. Fell suppressed a grimace. He'd assumed the two Jedi would be back before they were missed, or at least before it was time to move on. This was going to play havoc with his marching order. Stormtroopers, form up, he ordered. Two and two, front and rear. I'd prefer they hold rearguard position, commander, formed by said. You. He gestured to the three Chiss warriors. Come with me. Without waiting for comment or argument, he strode off down the corridor, one of the Chiss warriors taking point two steps ahead of him as the other two moved into position on either side of him. Fell hissed between his teeth as Jinsler, Fisa, and the Jeruns moved off behind the procession. He hated being stuck all the way in the back this way. Rearguard formation he ordered the stone troopers. He was striding along behind Bersh when a young, auburn-haired girl stepped out of concealment in front of the lead warrior, bringing the whole group to an abrupt halt. Hello, she said calmly, as if visitors dropped by outbound flight every day. Are you here to see the Guardian? Formby glanced at Jinsler, then back to the girl. We're here to see the survivors of outbound flight and to help them, he said. Is the Guardian the one we need to see? Yes, the girl confirmed. Come, I'll take you to him. She turned and headed down the corridor toward the forward sensor room. Who are all of you? She asked over her shoulder. I am Aristocra Chafor Rembentrano of the fifth ruling family of the Chiss Ascendancy. Formby identified himself. This is my aide, Chaffee Esacleo. This, he gestured to Jinsler, is Ambassador Dean Jinsler of the New Republic. Our expedition also includes representatives of the Jerun Remnant and the Empire of the Hand. So many people here to see us, the girl commented, turning into an alcove to her left. Yes, Formby said. 
May I ask your name? This way, please. She touched a control on the wall, and a door slid open in front of her. Gesturing the others to follow, she stepped inside. Fell stepped close beside Cloud as formed by, and the others filed through the doorway. Are you picking up Drask or the Jedi anywhere? He murmured. I have no sense of contact, the stormtrooper murmured back. But there's a lot of metal and electronic equipment in here. It may be shielding them. Maybe, Fell said, pulling out his comm link as he and the stormtroopers reached the doorway. The opening led into a short corridor, he saw, with another door at the far end and a third door midway down the wall on the right. Formed by, the Chiss warriors, and two of the Jurons were right behind the girl, while Jinsler, Fisa, Bersh, and the fourth Jurun had fallen a couple of paces behind the leaders as they looked around the empty corridor. Cloud Grappler, go catch up to form by, he ordered quietly. At the far end of the corridor, Evelyn touched a control, and the door slid up in front of her. We'll stay back here in. He never finished the sentence. Evelyn stepped through the door, but instead of staying open, the panel slammed violently down right in Formby's face. Even as Fell drew his blaster, another door dropped out of a groove in the ceiling in front of Cloud, cutting the Imperials off from the rest of the party. He spun around in time to see the door they'd come though slammed down in turn, isolating them from the rest of the ship. An instant later, the floor seemed to drop out from under him as their newly created prison began to fall. It broke to a stop before he had time for more than a single curse. Good day, a voice said from a speaker in the control panel. My name is Guardian Presser. You're in a turbolift car that is being held in suspension between two opposing repulsor beams. Do you understand this? I'm Commander Chuck Fell of the Empire of the Hand. Interesting trap you've got here. Merely making use of limited resources, Presser said. The six turbolift cars running through this pylon were designed to operate independently, but could also be connected together for large cargoes. Ah, Fell said. I take it this pylon you mentioned is the connecting tube between these particular two dreadnoughts? The wiring that feeds power to the repulsor beams also wraps randomly around the outside of the car, Presser said, ignoring the question. I therefore advise against trying to shoot or cut your way out. Understood, Fell said. Clearly, Presser wasn't interested in a long conversation. What is it you want from us? From you, nothing, Presser said. I'll speak with you again when I've come to a decision concerning your group. Very well, Fell said, looking casually around the car. There would be at least one hidden monitor in here, he knew. Would it help to tell you we come in peace, and in the hope of helping you and your people? Not really, no, Presser said. The speaker clicked off. Anyone? Fell invited sourly. They're jamming our comm links, Shadow offered. I can't raise any of the others. Big surprise there, Fell said. What about monitors? One, Grappler said, pointing his Blastech toward the control panel. I marked the monitor system feed in there. Concur, Watchman agreed. Fell nodded. All right then, he said, digging into his emergency pack. The others are off by themselves, out of our reach and protection. That is unacceptable. His fingers located the insulator blanket, an emergency food paste he'd been looking for. So Presser was proud that he could make use of limited resources? Fine. 
As far as Fell was concerned, the Empire of the Hand had invented that particular operational philosophy. So let's make ourselves a little privacy. He continued crossing toward the hidden monitor. And then see what exactly we can do about this. So I'd advise against trying to shoot your way out, Presser said, wiping the sweat from his forehead in the hot room as he once again ran through the warning message he'd prepared. Is that understood? Clearly, the blue one, Chiss, who had identified himself as Aristocrat something or other said calmly. He'd ended up in the number four turbo lift car, along with three more Chiss and two of the other, unknown aliens. We'll await your decision, the aristocrat continued. I would simply say that we've come here to help you, not to harm you. I understand, Presser said. I'll speak with you soon. He cut off the speaker, scowling blackly at the fuzzy image that was the best the turbolift monitors could handle anymore. Of course they weren't here to harm anyone. Just like those strange soldiers with their white armor, and hidden faces weren't here to harm anyone, or the Jedi weren't here to harm anyone. Jedi. For a long minute Presser stared at the image of the two Jedi on the number two display. It was hard to tell on the ancient and failing equipment, but they looked young, probably younger than he himself was. But of course, age didn't mean anything. According to Director Yulier, the Jedi culture and methods were centuries old, passed down from one generation to the next with all the passion and rigidity of a system kept alive through sheer inertia. If these two were following in that same tradition, they would be exactly like the Jedi who had set out with outbound flight all those years ago. He shifted uncomfortably in his seat. Of course, he'd only been four when outbound flight died, and admittedly nowhere near the center of the action. But still, he remembered those Jedi. Or at least, he remembered one of them. The control room door slid open, letting in a blast of even hotter air, and Evelyn stepped inside. Do we have all of them? She asked. Everyone, Presser assured her, gazing back at his niece's bright blue eyes. They might look innocent, Evelyn herself might look innocent, but Presser wasn't fooled. There was something odd about the girl, something he'd been aware of since she was three years old. Something the others would eventually notice, too. Good, Evelyn said, taking another step toward Presser to allow the door to slide shut behind her. It's a lot cooler in here. A little cooler, anyway, Presser said. The repulsor lift generators are running pretty hot. That's not good, is it? Evelyn asked, peering over his shoulder at the monitors. Not if one of them gets hot enough to fail, no, he conceded, swiveling back around in his creaky chair. At least it would be a fast way to die. He glanced over the bank of monitors, frowning. One of the displays was suddenly showing nothing except black, the one in the number six car. Muttering a curse at the antiquated equipment, he reached for the controls. That's not going to help, Evelyn said. The man in the gray uniform put a piece of cloth over the monitor. I saw him do it as I was coming in. Presser glared over his shoulder at her. And you didn't say anything? What could you have done about it if I had? Disgustedly, he turned back around. She was right, of course. But that wasn't the point. Next time you see something important, tell me, he growled. The low conversation coming from the number six speaker had vanished along with the video image, he noted, disappearing into a faint hum. Cranking up the volume did nothing but increase the intensity of the hum. Did they do something to the voice pickup too? He asked Evelyn. I didn't see anything she said, sounding puzzled. That sounds a lot like the hum from the repulsor generators, though. Of course it does, Presser growled as the explanation hit him. 
The cloth they were using to block the camera was heavy enough to pick up the vibration from the wall and amplify it over the voice pickup, deafening him as well as blinding him with a single move. So much for keeping tabs on the armored soldiers and their officer. And from the looks of things, the two Jedi were trying to shut him down, too. Blast them all, anyway. You could, Evelyn reminded him. Presser grimaced. Yes, he could blast them, all right. He could blast all of them. A flick of a switch, and they would be slammed down the turbolift pylon hard enough to turn them into jelly. We'll let them be for now, he told the girl. Anyway, whether we can see them or not, they're still trapped. He shifted his attention to the number five car's monitor. The man the aristocrat had identified as Ambassador Ginsler was in there, plus a young-looking Chiss and two of the aliens with the twin mouths, one of whom was currently pounding on the control panel as if trying to break it open. Talking with them would be a risk, he knew, especially if this new republic they'd mentioned was anything like the republic outbound flight had left all those years ago. But he had to talk to someone. And of all those in the boarding party, at least none of this particular group was carrying any weapons. Go ahead and release number five, he told Evelyn. Actually, give me a couple of minutes to talk to them, and then release it. You remember how to deactivate the trap and put the car back on normal? Sure, she said, reaching into a pocket and pulling out the command stick he'd given her. 7336. Right he said. Bring them back up here and take them to the pilot ready room. I'll be waiting for them there. Okay, she said, taking a step backward. The door behind her slid open, letting in another blast of hot air, and she was gone. Presser reached for the calm control, checking over the readings one last time. Ambassador Ginsler, he repeated the name in his mind, making sure he had it right. Ginsler. Ginsler. His fingers froze a centimeter from the comm switch. Ginsler? He sucked in a lumpful of hot air, staring at the man on the display. Ambassador Ginsler, here aboard his ship. Jedi Lorana was how he'd known her, but her full name had been Jedi Lorana Ginsler. With an effort, he forced his fingers to travel that last centimeter. Hello, Ambassador Ginsler. Without warning, two huge panels slammed down I in front of and behind them, the resonating thud as they hit the floor cutting across Visa's sudden scream of fright. It's all right, Ginsler said reflexively, reaching out an arm to catch her around her shoulders as she half fell, half lunged against his side. She jerked at his touch but didn't pull away. It's all right, he repeated as soothingly as he could. It wasn't soothing enough, evidently. Her body was trembling as she pressed against him, her glowing eyes narrowed. Ginsler tightened his grip around her shoulders, looking helplessly at Bersh and the other Jerun who'd wound up trapped in here with them. But neither alien was in any shape to give him any assistance. Bersh's companion had pulled his heavy wolf kill drapery half over his head, gripping it by its blue and gold collar, as if instinctively preparing to throw off the extra weight and make a run for it, or else just as irrationally hoping that he could hide underneath it. Bersh himself was half crouched beside the door, his twin mouths repeating the same agitated tones over and over as he clutched the other Jiren's arm with one hand and pounded uselessly on the small control board beside the door with the other. Jinsla looked around, searching for some clue as to what he should do. But with the exception of the door and the control panel Bersh was still pounding on, the room was completely devoid of decoration or instrumentation. The control panel itself didn't offer much, either. There were only five options for stops, Mark D4-1, D4-2, D5-1, D5-2, and SC plus the usual emergency buttons and a droid socket that would do them no good without a droid. 
Jinsler himself was unarmed, though what he would have done with a blaster even if he'd had one he couldn't guess. He did have a calm link connected to the chaff envoy, but whoever had sprung this trap would surely have thought to jam their communications. Still, it was worth a try. Slowly, carefully, he dug into the proper pocket of his survival pack. There was a loud click from the control panel. Bears jumped back, twitching as if he'd been stung. Hello, Ambassador Jinsler, a man's voice said. My name is Presser, guardian of this colony. Hello, guardian, Jinsler said, trying to keep his voice calm. This has been something of a surprise. I'm sure it has, Presser said. And I apologize for that. But I'm sure you understand that we have to take precautions. Of course, Jinsler said, though he didn't, entirely. May I ask what's happened to the rest of my party? They're perfectly safe, Presser assured him. At least for now. What ultimately happens to all of you, of course, is still undecided. I'd like to bring you out for a discussion, if I may. An unpleasant thrill tingled across Jinsler's skin. Ambassador Jinsler. He'd started this whole charade purely to get himself aboard Formby's expedition. Quite unintentionally, he'd apparently sold these people on that story, as well. And unless he was misreading the tone of Presser's voice, he was about to be dropped into negotiations regarding the fate of everyone aboard the expedition. For a long second panic bubbled in his throat. He wasn't a diplomat, trained in mediation or negotiation. He was only an electronics tech. Mostly a failed one, too, like he'd been a failure at everything else he'd tried. Luke and Mara should be handling any talks with Guardian Presser. Them, or Aristocra Formby. After all, this territory belonged to the Chiss, not the New Republic. Even Commander Fell probably had more experience with foreign cultures than he did. But he was the one Presser had chosen. Arguing the point would probably be a bad idea, and admitting his deception would be even worse. Whether he liked it or not, it was up to him. Certainly, he told the disembodied voice. Just tell me what you want me to do. When the door opens you will step outside, Presser said. The girl who met you earlier will take you to a nearby room. I'll be waiting for you there. I understand, Jinsler said, glancing down at the top of Fisa's head. What about those in here with me? They'll have to wait there until we're finished. Fisa gave a soft whimper. Please, she whispered. Please. No. You cannot leave us here alone, Bearish agreed softly. Please, Ambassador Jinsler. Jinsler grimaced. This could get very awkward. I understand your concerns, Guardian, he said. But my companions, they're not exactly what you'd call heroic. We have no need of heroes here, Ambassador, Presser said, his voice dark. We don't need them, and we don't like them. Of course, Jinsler said hastily. My point is that it's going to be a severe hardship for them to stay here alone. Besides which, he added as inspiration finally struck, first Steward Bersh and the other Jeruns came a long way to pay you honor for saving them from slavery to the Vigari all those years ago. I know they would very much like to be present at our discussions. There was no answer. Jinsler remained motionless, holding on to Fisa and mentally crossing his fingers. Very well, Presser said at last. They may all accompany you, provided they remain silent. I trust you are willing to guarantee their behavior? I am, Jinsler said firmly. No one wants to hurt any of you. We're only here to help. Presser snorted. Of course you are. 